Okay. In five, four, three. You're live. We are live. I'm not seeing anything on my screen except for the chat scrolling, but just in case, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Um, can anyone confirm we are additionally streaming or actually streaming if anyone in the chat on YouTube? There's going to be a 60 second delay, remember. Okay. Uh, also, people on the YouTube stream, please uh, try uh, turning on closed captions, a little CC button, or they'll uh, just type C on your keyboard. Uh, Nearby Night is captioning this, and uh, hopefully, you will see what we are talking. Um, there is also a link at the top of the video uh, to the stream text URL where you can get uh, near live uh, uh, near live captions uh, if you want to hear what we say before you can hear it or read it uh, or for Q&A or in case uh, YouTube doesn't like us for some reason, which has happened and may still happen. Uh, and please like type something in case you can in fact see captions on YouTube. Okay. Um, the delay is going to mess with my head, but that's okay. I am watching the chat on YouTube. So um, good morning or time zone appropriate greeting to everyone. Welcome to the 10th Language Creation Conference. Um, I'm going to try and ignore my screen with YouTube on it because there's a 60 second delay. Uh, because as Sai just said, we are joined by Mirabai Knight, I believe is the correct pronunciation, uh, who is our closed captioner and will be doing their absolute best to capture video. all of the uh, very not plain... URL where you can get uh, near live. Uh, Lo Logan, can you mute, please? Uh, Thank you. Um, sorry, that was a little bit of feedback from YouTube broadcasting back to Zoom. Uh, yes, uh, Mirabai is our closed captioner for this conference. Mirabai will be doing their absolute best to caption all of our jargon. Um, Mirabai, I, I forgot to ask your pronouns. Um, if somebody can tell me if they know. She, uh, thank you. Um, Mirabai will uh, be attempting to caption all of our jargon and conlang terminology. I will be not at all surprised if, um, if she has to write reads text on screen, but that's okay. Um, It looks like uh, many people are joining us both on the YouTube and here on Zoom, so we'll see some presentations very shortly. Uh, a little bit of background about what's going on here. Uh, this is our 10th language creation conference. Um, there, there have been annual conferences in the past, but uh, several years ago before my time in the LCS, we moved to biannual conferences. Um, I joined around the time of the Language Creation Conference 7 in Calgary, uh, which I was the host for. Two years later, we went over to Cambridge, UK. And two years later, we were in a pandemic. So we figured out how to uh, have our conference here on Zoom. Um, I like to believe that it was very successful despite our you know, technological problems and our remote meeting and a bit of the lack of our um, ability to socialize. But um, other than that, it, it went very well. I, I very much enjoyed listening to all of the presentations, learning a lot. Um, we were hoping to meet in person this year, but uh, for a myriad of conflicting reasons, we actually got absolutely no proposals for a uh, local host to meet in person. Uh, so we're back on Zoom hosting this conference digitally, which worked two years ago. I imagine it's going to work again this year. Uh, we have 
an incredible lineup um, in the four conferences I have helped host for the for the language creation society so far this is the most abstracts we have ever gotten for presentations um and i hated doing this because i i did enjoy reading all of the abstracts uh we actually had to reject almost a quarter of the abstracts um i know uh dominique is is here on the the screen um i believe he will be one of the first presenters i'll, I'll check my uh, schedule again in a moment. Um, but I know, Dominique, you you submitted two abstracts with both looks awesome, but we had to choose one <laughs> because there are just so many. Uh, also, during Language Creation Conference 7 in Calgary, we started hosting panels. So uh, inviting a few experts to talk about a, a topic uh, of interest to the brighter community uh, at LCC7, that was conlangs in academia, and is there or what is the place for conlangs in academia? Um, at LCC8, our panel was on uh, conlangs in fiction. Um, so Bettina Betnoff, uh, who is the local host, organized a panel uh, with Tolkien experts. Um, I believe Jackson Bradley was there, uh, who does original Klingon poetry and does translations of existing work into Klingon. Um, I can't remember who else was there because it was uh, four years ago now. Um, but we did have um, a panel on that. I actually don't remember if we had a panel during the, the last Digital Language Creation Conference, but uh, this year we're going to have a couple. Uh, Jamin, who is uh, here as well, uh, Margaret, who will join us eventually because it is even earlier than it is for me for her at the moment, uh, will be talking about getting jobs on the LCS hashtag jobs channel. Um, as the president, I see all of the job requests that come into the LCS. I negotiate with the people wanting to post the job to try and uh, set their expectations for what they should pay, or if they only want to pay $200, what they can reasonably expect for a $200 conlang. Um, there has been some recent chat on our Slack channel about um, possible AI-generated conlangs uh, making it into media lately, and I can't remember the name of the program. It's a $9.99 subscription. You type in a couple phonological and syntactic rules, and voila, you have a $9.99 conlang, and it is valued at exactly $9.99. It's terrible, <laughs> uh, because we all know that uh, the personal touch, the artistry, the being able to link semantic forms or phono aesthetics or or whatever your personal shtick is, is, is going to produce something that AI is just not up to snuff for, uh, which is probably why all of you are here because you already understand that and I'm preaching to the choir. Um, a couple of notes about our conference. As I've already said, it's being closed captioned. So we do have about a 60 second delay from what's happening here live on the Zoom stream versus what's going to show on the YouTube stream. Um, in order to capture questions from our audience who aren't joining us on the Zoom stream, I'm going to try and monitor the YouTube comment section. Um, I do hope other participants in the Zoom, if they happen to notice a question, might put it in the chat box for me. And then one of us will uh, ask that question, if possible, at the end of a presentation. Uh, I also invite anyone joining us on the Zoom stream, so the other presenters for the meeting, if you have a question, you are welcome to unmute and ask that question at the end of the presentation. We do have a couple styles of presentations that will be happening. We have lightning talks. Uh, they're scheduled for a 10 minute presentation, followed by five minutes for questions. We have our full talks, which are scheduled for 20 minutes of presentation, 
followed by 10 minutes of questions. Uh, and then we have our, our panels, which are roughly an hour total. And those will be live questions as, as best as we can handle that. We do have some prepared questions to start it off. And our relay presentation, um, which is much longer because, like I said, we had many more abstracts this time around. We had many more participants in our Conlang relay. Um, so much so that we actually had three separate rings this time. It's it's usually been two. Um, and of course, Kelvin will talk about that later, but I, I think we have some specialty rings. I think there was a um, non-typed script and a song relay, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so we should see some pretty interesting things this time around. One note to our presenters, and I will try to remind presenters of this as, as often as I can, uh, a note from Mirabai. When we talk about things we enjoy, our speech rate tends to accelerate. Uh, Mirabai said that she can caption roughly 230 words a minute, uh, which is probably well more than three times my typing speed. Uh, when it's general English, this conference is not going to be general English, so please try to moderate your speech rate so that Mirabai can close caption a little bit easier. Um, if anyone on the Zoom chat would like to add something or if anyone has any questions for me, um, please ask. Uh, otherwise, I will remind presenters uh, when you are sharing your slides, please go to your full screen mode in um, in your slide deck. Um, whatever program you're using, we do want the full experience of your slides. Uh, and I do recommend to presenters, once you've finished your talk, you don't have to leave the Zoom, but hop over to the YouTube chat introduce yourself, um, provide any links to your sites that you would like people to have or be able to access. And if there's more questions that we didn't have time to get to in the, the live portion of the question comment period, you'll be able to answer via chat in the YouTube chat. Um, I think that's just about everything. Uh, I know YouTube is on a one minute delay and we're two minutes early for the beginning of the conference. So I think we should probably just start now. So with that, I'm very happy to pass the floor over to Dominique Bobek. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, Dominique is a still, I believe, a student in Germany. Um, OK, maybe maybe Dominique has already graduated. Uh, he, a few days ago. A few days. Congratulations. Dominique was the recipient of our president's scholarship for his work on Con Lang's uh, in his master's thesis and has uh, worked on a professional Con Lang for Netflix already. I don't know if we're going to hear about that, but I will pass the floor to you. Thank you so much. Well, let's stand. <laughs> And presenter mode. Yeah, this seems to work. Do you see my slides? Yes. Wonderful. So first of all, thank you, especially Joseph and the Language Creation Society for supporting my master thesis. Actually, my second master thesis, the first one was in Semitics, this one in general ling linguistics. And this was the topic of this master thesis, the Semitic influence on conlangs. Well, if you have any questions later, you can just email me under this email address, or this is also my Twitter handle. Further questions can also be posed there. Um, so hello, everyone. And yeah, a quick start. Um, what are Semitic languages? Uh, a lot of you might know, yeah, big proponent, proponents such as, such as Arabic, Hebrew, or Aramaic, also Akkadian, that language in Black, Sebaic in ancient Yemen, or also Old Ethiopic or Amharic, the biggest Ethiopic language of today, 
Um, these are all similar languages of Mehri, of course, and um, of course provide with special features. Um, to give you um, a short look, how I came up with this question, um, how, well, how much, if there's any influence of natural languages on constructed languages, um, I began with examining uh, yeah, screenplays with conlang. So I will present you three short examples uh, by um, David Peterson. Here, Lishepos, Nuithmi, Janos, and so on. You can see that the E ending for my is actually very similar to the same ending in Afroasiatic and also Semitic. So my brother in Arabic would be something like Achi, depending on the dialect, or Na here in green is the usual marker for the first person plural. And Ak really is close to Ka in the masculine form or Ki in the singular. In Arabic, you can say in dialects also Ak for yeah, uh, the masculine form. Or another calling here uh, from uh, Penny Dreadful, I think it is, my child, my bride, Kharadi, Hamadani. It's the same E ending. I don't know. It could be the case that the E in as me is the same, but the causative function could be something to totally different. And the ak is close to Arab, um, yeah, to Akkadian, is it shabtu or shiptu? Um, lib the same, and ak again is very, very similar to Semitic. A third example from yeah, from Bium, from Fremen, we can see the ho ending, dasa ho, uzulu ho, and so on. It is quite close to Arabic who or depending on the dialect just or in the same meaning the ash ending your blade could be related to ak or ik in Arabic in Arabic dialects you have a masculine form ak and the feminine form ik but in the Bedouin type Arabic this ik form um, is uh, itch so itch might be the, the ancestor of dimash so the ash ending here yeah that this, uh, these examples show that Semitic structure and vocabulary is quite popular and calling, at least for David Peterson. So coming back to history, Tolkien already um, stated that he was inspired by Semitic languages, especially Hebrew and also Arabic. We can find these structures in Kuzlu, the Dwarvish, and Adonai, the language of ancient Numenor. Um, I will yeah, recommend the analysis by Zielenbach for the Tolkien languages. And looking back to the 90s, in times before language creation society was formed, there were a couple of essays by, uh, I don't know how to pronounce them, Rick Morneau. And one of these essays is about Semitic type morphology. So this was an impact on the early language. Yeah, um, yeah not society, you know. And also Peterson, of course devoted parts of his chapter on morphology to Semitic morphology. So I examined seven features in my master thesis to analyze a couple of conlangs. These features are just devoted to phonology and morphology. We will not talk about everything here, um, especially about the morphological ones. And the goal was that I wanted to separate, to distinguish between influence and resemblance that we know its influence this we cannot really know but to be sure or more sure um, the feature should be really rare and not length if it's a rare feature in natural languages but present in semitic languages then it's likely that this might be some influence on con lengths especially if you find more than one some length feature in a con length I coined this term sampling for my master thesis, just to be a little bit shorter, a little bit in analogy to Romlang. Romlang is actually a pseudo derived language from yeah, vulgar Latin. Sampling is not this in the genetic sense, but more on a typological one, but you know what I mean. The conlangs I looked on were, yeah, these languages. Um, these languages should be from your yeah, popular media culture, but also um, two languages for personal calling. So Echithume and Kans were these languages. And I more or less picked all these languages quite, uh, quite blindly, except for Echithume and Kans. But the popular languages 
were just chosen blindly. So I distinguish between two, uh, three types of Summerland features. So a feature can be rare in natural languages. That means it occurs in less than 10% of natural languages, 5%. Or if we see it's actually just Semitic, maybe some other, other Afro-Asiatic languages and maybe one non-related language at all, this is our best Semlin feature. So to give you one example here, um, the presence of pharyngeal fricatives or approximates difficult to um, draw the line. Here you can see um, Foibelit, it's a really big database but um, including here more than 106, uh, no, sorry, sorry, 1,600 languages. So actually more docolects, but these are the languages. And this is just the presence of the pharyngeal fugitive or approximate uh, And here the voiceless counterpart, uh, so the first one as an Aisha or this one as an Ahmad and Hummus. So having at least one, depending on the database, is, yeah, belongs to our um, quite good features. Not this one, but this one. And the Foible database even less. And if it's not just having or but both of them, um, the chance of having these is quite low. You see the probability or the frequency here. So the features I looked on were these one, uh, these ones, uh, short talk about them. The morphological ones on the top we'll look at uh, later. The pharyngeal fricatives, yeah, you saw now. Um, one word about yeah, obstruent systems. Typically, language have a languages have structures of obstruents. So German or Latin have two series of obstruents, a voiceless one and a voiced one. Um, in Semitic language, we have tried. So there's typically a voiceless series, voice series, and then in the literature, it's called emphatic. This means as an etiosemitic, ejective as an t or amharic tilic, big. All this uh, yeah, emphatic series can be pharyngealized as an t, as an baham in Arabic or darab to hit. Then we have several Semitic and afro acid languages lacking p. Um, if we say there's a B, so two series, and the B should um, yeah, have the impl implication the P is present, but it's not present. It can also be P and no P. Um, then with our P gap and having more than nine fricatives is really seldom. As far as now, English has eight fricatives, but uh, I'm not a Germanicist or yeah, Anglicist. So according to Madison, it's really infrequent to have so many fricatives, but they're present in Arabic, Aramaic, many uh, South Arabian, modern South Arabian languages, this number. So the morphological uh, features, I want to discuss a little bit more deeply. In, let's say, Palestinian Arabic, the, uh, uh, the good idea of the author would be something like Fikrat Lim Alif Al Halwe. So we can see it's more or less like English in the sense that with the idea of the author in this order. But we can see in contrast to English that only Alif, the author, has yeah, a definite article. So the definite article holds true for the whole phrase. And this also the reason why the Halwe, good or sweet, um, has also a definite article because there's agreement among the members of this nominal phrase. This is called definiteness spreading. And you can further see that Helwe is quite left out. So in English, we would say that good is quite close to idea, but the connection between Fikrat and Lim Alif is so close that adjectives are left out. And you can further see that the T ending, actually feminine ending, appears here to demonstrate that the idea is possessed by something, yeah, like the author. Uh, this can uh, be contrasted with Buma Fijin, Aligana Agone Yalewa Yai. It's similar in the case that we have marking the possessor at the possessi. So the na um, has a cross reference for the young girl. But in contrast to this example, Ligai, the E just means there's there's a possessor, but there's no information about the identity. Is it yeah? This is the one possessor, two gender, and so on. 
um, this is no cross-referencing, asymptomatic. But there's a further difference. You can see that Levu, big, is quite usually posed in this clause, so not as in Helwe, as in Arabic. So if you want to define this feature, this would mean, yeah, the um, definition by Bora that we have definite in spreading, no direct modification of the head. This uh, yeah, leads us to nest order of adjectives. And we can leave this out, word properties that the connection between these uh, two forms, the possessor and the possessor is so close that this is likely to become one word. Now let's look on conlangs. It's very difficult to say if there's just a pertensive or a concert set. Pertensive is what we saw in Fijian that the possessi has some marking that there is a possessor, but yeah, the other quirks are not included here. So Zoda Yabor or Bora Yazod have information that there is a possessor, but also no cross-referencing. But unfortunately, Peterson do not provide any information about definiteness or maybe nested order of adjectives. So we don't know. This language here, Echithimme, is more precisely what we know. Um, you can see that I will uh, yeah, say the third example is quite informative here, that the la, the, the definite article, is not permitted here. As in Arabic, you could not say il fikra lim alif. This would not be possible. So the de definite article here holds true for the whole phrase. If there is one definite article, as in the first example, the whole phrase is definite. If there is no one, so the whole phrase is yeah, indefinite. So echithimme. Um, has a concert state, but maybe uh, zondif, zondif. Now let's turn to another feature, um, templatic morphology or more precise roots and patterns. It's actually more difficult, but roots and patterns means that we have a prosodic structure of words that is um, connected to morphological information. So that plurals uh, shall be yeah, defined as a yambic trochee, for instance, or what you want to. And this means that we have yeah, very hard uh, apophonic systems. And it's really hard to see what are the vowels, um, only that the consonants remain. These are examples here from are from classical Ethiopic that the two uh, th three consonants are quite stable. Nebera, he sat. Yenebber, he um, sits. Yinber, um, this yeah, subjunctive and so on. So this root is quite present and the pattern defines the morphological function. So let's turn to conlangs. This is sondiv again. So um, again, a Peterson language as in kitur, ktor, biktodon, ektira, and so on. You see that these three consonants are quite stable, kterem, for bektudon, I suppose there's um, either an underspecified consonant or a floating feature turning r into d. But as you know from, let's say, uh, American English, r and d are really close to each other. These three consonants are quite prominent, but the structure depends on the morphological uh, function. Now let's turn to, oh, five minutes left. I hope this is enough. Let's turn to Tolkien again. This is, yeah, I think the most inspiration he took from Semitic languages. This is a very prominent example, Kuzd Dwarf and the plural Kazad, with also the name for the Dwarvish language, Kuzdul, or some names such as Nargothrond, Nuluk Kizdin. Nuluk is probably the river Narok in um, the Silmarillion. And we see these three consonants are stable, but the vocalic patterns and the prosodic patterns are not stable. We can see also clear morphological structures as in the singular plurimating for nouns with kuz kazad, ruk rakaz, rakaz, I should say, and bark baruk. Baruk could be another yeah, morphological class, but this yambic system that we have a not stress, an unstressed syllable and a long stressed syllable could be the case here for the plural. Maybe it's even Baruch. We don't know so precisely. Tolkien did not provide any information going beyond this, or we don't know about this. 
Tolkien was also concerned with Adonai um, in case of Semitic languages. Here also a um, characteristic vowel is included in the root. So Gimil stars, oh yes, collective as these three consonants, Gimel, Lung, and a quite stable vowel E with some yeah, peculiar, peculiarities concerning monophthongations. So I is not mapped on I, but on, on E. The same with Au in Golub is derived from Gaulub. These are just possible patterns. He does not say the, the, yeah, the whole meaning of every derivational outcome here. And for now, we don't know the meaning at all, unfortunately. So there are three radical and biradical roots. Also in the morphological system, going beyond derivation, there are these yeah, templatic characters as yeah, moronic lengthening, as in Zadan, actually it's more A insertion R, um, or also yeah, deletion. So in, let's say, Zadnat, the, uh, the second vowel disappears. In the yeah, personal conlang here, you see, there are also quite interesting patterns that are inspired by Semitic languages. Actually, Swanson wrote once in an email of the Language Creation Society that he explicitly took inspiration from uh, Semitic languages. So uh, it was easy for me um, to yeah, derive the Semitic character here. And he also provides yeah, templates for specific morphological functions, as you can see here. Unfortunately, I did not get any more information but I think this is really interesting and I would uh, like to know more about it. In uh, Fremen, it's especially of interest because what we saw before mostly was derivational morphology, so kind of word building and yeah, special parts of inflection morphology, which are not so defined by syntactical context, but more, more, more um, with uh, meaning. So plural is less grammatical than, let's say, case endings. And Peterson included templatic or root and pattern morphology for Fremen even in case endings, with the three stable segments, U, K, R, um, maybe also E, but the positions are not so clear with prefixes, suffixes, and so on. I would like to spend more time with you on that, but there is no time, unfortunately. There are also some other phonological processes such as devoicing here and the ablative. Yeah. And in the end, oh, I'm good in time, finally. <laughs> um, in the end, this is the be better one. This is the better one. In the end, I yeah, examined all these languages and checked every feature um, if it is present or not. You can see that the upstream system is only present in many shades. So it looks like Ethiopic or Georgian and Sardaukar, also in June. The found last obstruents like to, to, uh, bo, are not found at all, unfortunately. So if you are going to uh, make a conlang, you could in, uh, consider to include an emphatic obstruent series, or so not just obstruents. Then pharyngeal obstruents are only present in Lishepus. Um, as far as I remember, Lishepus was inspired by, uh, was it Afro-Asiatic or also Akkadian other language? I, I don't remember so, um, so precisely, but this could explain the presence of uh, sounds. For Netflix, um, actually, I taught just the uh, pharyngeal approximant in a voiced manner uh, um, to some actors, and it was quite hard for them to learn it, really hard. But they, they did, did a good job, I would say. Um, the P gap is at least found in uh, two languages, Fremen and Kuzdul. And I think this could really be the, the Semitic influence. It's uh, uh, a slide later in the notes, but it's a very prominent feature in Northern Africa and also the Horn of Africa. And Kuzdul has three series of obstruents and only one series. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, only one series, I think it's B. Um, has this sound. There's no um, aspirated per as far as I know, but yeah, I don't know so correctly anymore. <laughs> the fricative number is just cliche, but could be by chance um, if you also consider that English um, has also many, many fricatives. 
Um, the roots and patterns um, um, feature and the construct state are more interesting here because we find it in more languages. So the roots and patterns we discussed already in Adenoic, Fremen, Kuzdul, Sondiv, and Hans. And the construct state is ah, it's so difficult to determine. In Echithimu, I'm sure, while well, the um, essay is even called the construct state in Echithimu. Uh, <clears throat> but in Meniche, um, there are some examining the uh, the screenplay, some signs they can be they could be construct state, but because the data was not were not so uh, clear, it could also be plural as far as I found out. Um, it's difficult to determine. Um, the same with Sondiv and Kuzl. Where is Kuzl? Ah, there, that's close. So it was not so clear there. In all these cases, um, you, you can say that there's kind of hat marking, so like a pertensive or cross-referencing, but anymore we don't know, unfortunately. So my conclusion is that phonological features might only be a marginal inspiration for Conlangers here, but Semitic morphology seems to be quite prominent in Conlang. So I want to say thank you. And in terms of references, um, you can check out my Twitter account there once I posted my master thesis, and you can see all the references there. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Dominique. Um, definitely encourage you to hop over to the YouTube chat. There's a uh, a, a good conversation happening right now. A lot of people are are saying, yes, I use this in, in several of my conlangs or, wow, I didn't know that was a Semitic feature. I used it accidentally. Um, I'm not sure if this was a question for the chat that's going on in YouTube, but uh, Aiden did ask, what were those criteria for calling something a construct state again? Um, so the basic criterion was that there's hat marking in the noun phrase, so that the possessi um, has some kind of marking, not the possessor, but the possessor can, but uh, this is not uh, not not the uh, yeah the crucial point here. At least the possessi has some marking, and then in opposition to other kinds of yeah hat marking in nominal phrases, there had to be either. Uh, definitely spreading or something like nested order of adjectives that the connection between these two components is so close that we can speak of concert state. That this was my uh, yeah criterion, and it's only found actually in Afroasiatic, especially for Semitic. There are some, um, I think, Cushitic languages, um, and also Chadic languages like. Uh, Glavda, I think there is a construct state, and outside Afroasic, it's just wall off with this type of yeah nominal structure here. I know, and this is only because my um, co-supervisor, my syntax co-supervisor for my PhD, did a lot of work on the Semitic construct state. We always said, you know, Irish is that language that forgot it was Semitic. But uh, I, I guess there are some nuances that what looks like a construct state in Irish isn't technically a construct state. I, did you go like super formal on your definition or just kind of, it looks close to a construct state? Um, middle, I would say. So um, these, well, three of these features should be fulfilled, but if I... If I'm too formal, then I will find no conlang at all. This was my problem also with the um, pharyngealized um, obstruent series that no conlang I was looking on at this feature. Awesome. I noticed a, a lot of the chat on YouTube was saying, oh, yes, I, I, I didn't realize I was using that feature. Uh, maybe you can give us an idea. Do you think... Semitic has actually influenced these um, these conlangs. Obviously, for David Peterson, who's a, a major fan of Arabic and Semitic languages, yeah. that that's probably true. But for others, do you think it was accidental, or do you think maybe popular media hearing various Arabic or Semitic languages um, influenced what people might think is Semitic without actually doing the research and, and consciously adding these features? Mm, I think, well, of course, 
it can be just coincidence. Um, but I think if there are more uh, more than one feature, then I, I, I would not say it's just an accident. Um, it really depends. It can, it can be in, well, the, the term did not, uh, was mentioned, an NADU, so an Adelang did it uh, worse, is it the term? Yeah, of course, this this can happen. In my first really structured conlang, I well, want to do something templatic, but also including metathesis. Um, I just knew it from a phonological point of view, but not as a morphological one. And later, um, I yeah, learned more about, for instance, Amarasi. I think it's uh, in the area of Papua New, New Guinea and so on, and other languages in this area, which have productive metathesis for yeah, for special uh, grammatical functions. I, I did I did not know I did not know it, but uh, in the end I figured it. Oh, I did like Amarasi. Uh, Benjamin Fox is asking in YouTube, uh, in English, there's a stereotype that a lot of Semitic languages sound, quote, scary. Do you have any opinions about using it as a source for, quote, scary languages like Dothraki or Klingon? Actually, um, well, I posed this question to me when I decided to take um, the th uh, Dothraki and Klingon also in my sample. And I think Dothraki and Klingon had no sampling features at all. So Dothraki have no P, but also no B. So this is no gap in the uh, yeah, technical sense. Oh, there are some marginal features like uh, Barbo, I think is uh, Drogo's father, but um, this is no Semitic language in, uh, so pseudo-Semitic language in this case. And for about, yeah, the sound of, scare, uh, yeah, to, to sound scary, I don't know. For, from a German point of view, I'm German. Um, I would say that Arabic definitely is some kind of role model for sounding yeah, harsh. I love Arabic, so uh, I would not uh, support this uh, uh, this point. Ah, it's, it's difficult. I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. It's Semitic is kind of stereotype for sounding harsh or scary. Maybe if we take the adjectives from Ethiopic, but there are many, many more languages with adjectives, kind of with Georgian or Yucatec Maya. Um, these sound stony. Uh, I made a uh, language for Amazon also with the yeah, stony language. Um, and this uh, will be uh, yeah, released in end of May, actually, the, the Griffin. And there are some adjectives with this uh, yeah, uh, purpose to sound harsh. But I, from my point of view, I would not say that Semitic languages are meant to be yeah, yeah, harsh or scary. I'm trying to remember an anecdote here. Uh, I, I want to say it was Jason Momoa when he he first heard what Dothraki was supposed to sound like. He he said it sounded like Arabic, um, but that was you know a non list uh, non linguist or a non Arabic speaker, as far as I know, saying, "Hey, this kind of reminds me of blank." Uh, this fits um, one finding uh, we figured. We is actually studied by uh, Tina Mooshammer, um, some others, and also me, and there we uh, checked how yeah some speakers of several languages think uh, conlang sound and if they can, can, can say uh, what kind of language is this and Arabic was named so many times and it was always wrong of course and with so many languages so Arabic seems to be the natural language associated with some yeah foreignness some harshness but no knowledge at all. Now, thank you very much, Dominique. Um, there is one additional question from George Corley that you can see in the chat and perhaps you can respond to via text in, in the YouTube chat. Um, we are gonna move on to the next speaker. Um, so Roman, if you're there, please unmute and, and start your camera if you would like. I'm gonna give just a second pause here to allow Sai to uh, bookmark so we can segment out the various talks for YouTube um as, as they come in but uh roman please please join us if you're there okay i am here Sai, please uh, let me uh, turn on my video oh um you should be able to there now excellent okay uh I'm able so now. yeah uh you can you can should be able to start screen sharing 
Our second talk is by uh, Roman Tarasov, uh, who is also a past recipient of actually, I believe, two LCS president scholarships uh, for his work on uh, the typology of Khan Langs as, as part of his uh, bachelor's and subsequent master's studies in Russia. So I will hand the floor over to you. Okay, hello, dear colleagues. And my re report is is dedicated uh, to. It's based on two projects I performed before, and uh, I received uh, present scholarship for for them. Oops. Most of them were part of my studies. Uh, the first project was called Lexical Derivations in Different Types of Constructed Languages, Typological Approach. And it resulted in a report. It was dedicated to tropative, apparative, and causative in 20 langues. The second project uh, was called Single Negation and Negative Concord in Different types of conlangs, a typological approach. And it also resulted in a report. It was dedicated to negation, participant negation in context with and without verbal ellipsis in 21 conlangs. The first project about tropative, apparative, and causative was performed using two main methods. The first one was the cross-sectional method, a short online survey involving translation of six sentences from English or Russian, performed by advanced users of conlangs. It was used for studying tropative and apparative because uh, these meanings are rarely mentioned in grammar descriptions. Probably they are quite uh, rare terms. The second one was grammar descriptions analysis or studying causatives. It was applicable because uh, this meaning is usually well described. And it was preferable since uh, studying causatives requires taking much wider range of contexts. The second project was also performed using the same methods. For, for this, study this research grammar descriptions analysis was uh, used for non-elliptic context without verbal ellipsis and the cross-sectional method was used for elliptic context because the uh, combination of negation plus ellipsis is rarely discussed in grammar descriptions i'm going to introduce some uh, terms from my first project there I introduced the notion of negative tropative. X does not consider Y to be Z. By analogy, the notion of negative apparative was introduced. X does not seem to be Y. If a negative tropative or apparative in a language is a grammatical negation of a positive one, we call such a model positive negative symmetric. It also introduced a reverse tropative. Y is considered to be Z. If a reverse tropative is a grammatical passivization or detransitivization of a direct one, we call such a model direct reverse symmetry. There can be no reverse apparative because this is an intransitive predicate. But I must admit that apparative is quite close semantically to reverse tropative. If tropative is uh, both positive negative and direct reverse symmetric, we call it absolutely symmetric. Well, now let's discuss the classes. Class one tropative and separative is, is a level of grammatical expression with an affix or a copula. For example, Arabic has class one tropative. Akala to be intelligent is akula to consider to be intelligent. While Klingon, a conlang, has class one apparative, val 
to be intelligent or allow to seem intelligent. Class one dropative and imperative have two additional parameters. They can be strong or weak. Strong class one dropative or imperative is applicable to all stems of a particular class, while weak one is irregular. And it can also be polysemic or monosemic. Class two drop dropative uh, is expressed analytically with a triadic or dyadic predicate by one finite clause. Like in English, I consider him to be intelligent. He seems to be intelligent. It can also be polysemic or monosemic. Class three dropative and imperative are polypredicative constructions, which have all their arguments expressed explicitly. Like, I think he's intelligent, it seems that he is smart, etc. Class four dropative is descriptional. Derivative and dropative are not distinguished if the class is four. Like, he's probably smart. There, are, there is no class four apparative. And here are the results of tropative studies. Maybe one conlang has class one tropative, 10 or 11 conlangs use class two tropative, six conlangs have class three, and two conlangs use only the fourth class tropative. The results are a bit different for apparative. Two or three conlangs use the apparative of the highest class, or 13 conlangs use class two apparative, and four conlangs use class three apparative. Well, let's discuss all slangs. You can see the results. The most unusual is the operative model of Sol Sol by Jean Francois Suder. It has a negation marked both on the characteristics Z and uh, on a predicate like you see on the screen. For the first for the positive construction, the verb melado to praise is used, while for the second one is it's dolami to scold. Now we can see results for apparative studies in old flanks. And here are the results from zone lungs. International sign tropative system is the only one that is direct reverse asymmetric. Different predicates are used to see and to have reputation. And here are the results from comparative studies. Dothraki uses class four tropative, which is quite unusual. Like it is known that he's the danger that his brain is strong. And here we approach the first class gone. Voila, as I have already mentioned. And here is the last category, which is Angelangs. Well, two unusual models here. If Quill utilizes class one strong apparative, Rude to a Lord Demar, he seems to be intelligent. While Lodgeboard has class one or two apparative, <coughs> as a special predicate symbol, sim. To conclude, a wide variety of tropative and imperative models is used, as well as the natural languages. And a choice of a model depends on an aim of a language. And let's look at the results from causative studies. 13 conlangs in a sample utilize strongly grammaticalized causative. It means uh, the causative that's applicable to all stems or particular class. Two conlangs use weakly grammaticalized, 
irregular causative, and uh, cervical lungs light dramaticalized causative. Well, let's look at ox lungs. We can see that all ox lungs, starting from Esperanto, use strong universal causative. While the first two lungs uh, use either lack causative or use weak verbal causative. So we can see the evolution, starting from sol to sol and ending by Esperanto. Now let's look into zone lungs, and we will see that none of uh, zone lungs possesses universal causative. Interslavic uh, uses weak verbal causative, while Fox Prague and Elephant use strong verbal causative. It's probably because Slavonic languages or German or Romance languages. Uh, do not uh, use such a feature. And zone lungs are expected to correspond to natural languages of particular area or family. The next category is art lungs. And we can see that all of the art lungs in the sample possess strong universal causatives, which is quite an unexpected. And now we move on to the last category, which is end lungs. What do we see here? Three of five end lungs possess strong universal causatives, and they have been constructed with uh, completely different aims, Lodban, Lardan, and AUI. Two end lungs lack dramaticalized causative, and these are Tokipona and Ithquil. It's unusual that they have been constructed with completely different opposite aims. What conclusion can we make? Causative systems of conlangs are much more unified, but languages with opposite aims often use the same model. How can we explain it? By different levels of grammaticalization, uh, by different levels of coverage, maybe by different methods. Maybe the second project will clarify this. Well, let's look into the terminology for the second project. The, classifica the classification of negation patterns is as follows. Negative concord is negation marked both on a verb and on a polarity item, like in Russian, ничего не знаю. I know nothing. Nothing? Not no. Single negation is negation marked only on a verb or on a polarity item, like in Hindi. Negation opposition principle, what is known as duplex negatio affirmative, is negation marked either on a polarity item or on a verb, and if both, it is affirmation, like in Latin. Everybody will hear. Nobody won't hear. And the last type is negation cooperation principle, NCP, what known as duplex negatio negat. If language utilizes NCP, negation can be marked both on a verb and a constituent, which does not need to be polarized. You know these examples from uh, African American vernacular English from popular songs like In Got No Cash, In Got No Style, From Don't Worry, Be Happy, Don't Take No Photos, etc. And here are the results from Oxlangs. Sol Resol, Volapük, Esperanto, Sambaxa, and Globasa utilize strictly single negation and disallow negative concords in any context. In the uh, Lidepla, both options are correct if there is no verbal ellipsis. Otherwise, 
negation is also strictly single. Now allows both single negation and negative concords. If there is no verbal ellipsis, and there is no information about elliptic context. What about in lines? Volksprag, Panjoman Konlang, Elephant, Panjoman Konlang, and Gosa Panigeren Konlang use strictly single negation. Inter-Slavic and Inter-Slavic, which is Pan-Slavonic, and international sign require and see in non-elliptic contexts, but require single negation in elliptic contexts. Why so? It is because Inter-Slavic as a Slavonic conlang is uh, subject to absolute Slavonic universality, which prescribes that any Slavonic language and dialect should use and see in non-elliptic context. The same goes for international sign. It also complies with sign language principles. What about at langs? Ringon and Delthraki require single negation. There is no info about Sindarin. And Navi unexpectedly requires and C in all contexts, whether elliptic or non elliptic. Here are the examples. Show it at the book many times, but never up to the end. Here, an adjunct is polarized. Some of them are 15 years old, some are 30, but none is 20. An argument is polarized. What's about in the lungs? Tokipona, Ithquil, Lodgeban, Ladan, AUI, disallow negative concord. They all use single negation. We can conclude that constructed language consistency principle exists. Conlang tends to minimize the number of double negation applications in so much as it does not contradict the aim of a language. You can see the scale. NCP uses uh, the largest number of uh, negations. NC uses uh, less negations. NC in non elliptic context is the next, and single negation uses the minimal number of negations. Thus, most of conlangs use single negation. Inter-Slavic and uh, international signs use NC in elliptic contexts because they are required to do so by their natural principles. While they use single negation in elliptic contexts because uh, absolute Slavonic universality and sign language increase the principle, <coughs> do not describe uh, such co elliptic contexts. While Navi, as for Navi, I find that, uh, I believe that uh, their intentional uh, violation of natural principles took place. But it's interesting that this language still does not use NCP, probably because due to the correct language principles. So let's try to explain why these two projects uh, brought uh, different results, maybe due to the difference in methods. However, elliptic and C, tropative and deparative, uh, were studied using the same methods, but the results were completely different. So that doesn't work. Maybe different levels of grammaticalization. That might work because uh, negation uh, is the most grammaticalized, dropative and imperative are the least grammaticalized, and causative is in between. Maybe different levels of coverage. That also works. However, uh, we should try to explain why dropative and imperative. Uh, are poorly exposed, poorly covered. The database created by me and Dr. Marekhev states that class one dropative is utilized by 15 or 16 languages 
of 200, which are listed in the sample. Maybe that's the reason uh, why it's poorly covered. Grammatical meanings that uh, are grammatical, often grammaticalized are better studied. Probably, so probably that's the same reason. The conclusion is as follows. Lexical derivations and participant negation demonstrate different behavior in conlangs. It might be explained either through level of grammaticalization or through level of coverage, which is almost the same. And an additional notice is that while it is quite easy to construct an ideally convenient mode, it's almost impossible to construct an ideally inconvenient one. Every model that can come to one's mind is used at least in one natural language, uh, I think. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Roman. Um, I had the um, fortunate ability to actually read these papers prior to your presentation, <laughs> so I know a little bit more <laughs> of the background. Um, and once again, I, I do encourage you to pop over to the YouTube chat after a couple of questions. There's there's a lot of talk going on about how this has been used in some personal conlangs. Um, I saw Christoph said he had accidentally added one of the features to his conlang without realizing it was a feature. And I think tropative has uh, consciously just been added to Kilta. Um, which um, I believe has been being worked on for quite a long time at this point. Uh, I do have one okay, question. Okay, I will look into this. Yeah, I do have one question yeah. from the YouTube from Grayson, um, who would like your thoughts on, would the tropative be a kind of evidentiality? I think uh, it might be a kind of evidentiality, and in some natural languages, uh, it actually is. I think Aymara uses uh, this feature. Is, if I'm not mistaken. Is there a meaningful difference between, when I think of evidentiality, I always think of, of Salish languages that have a grammatical marker to say, this is how I know what I'm about to say is true, or this is why I'm doubtful of what I'm about to say, things like that. Is Do you think tropative is a category within that, or evidentiality is a category with, within tropativity? I believe that uh, tropativity is a subcategory of uh, evidentiality, maybe. Because okay. evidentiality can be knowledge, it can be some uh, how to uh, so apparative can also be a subcategory of it. Okay, um, I'm seeing lots of of thank yous and clapping in the YouTube chat. Uh, so perhaps if anyone on the Zoom has a question, you're you're welcome to unmute and ask that. And in the meantime, um, I don't uh, think so, you so mentioned. Sorry. Yes. Uh, Sai uh, has posted a question here in the Zoom chat. Uh, shall I answer it or you have? Oh, yeah, by questions? all means. Uh, so, oh, can tropatives have the perceiver not as a subject of the sentence? Or is that, uh, sorry? Or is that uh, an imperative, is an extra place to use the term from Lodgeban? Lodgeban. Well, perceiver, uh, I believe that's an X. So, so in the, uh, I consider him to be intelligent, perceiver is I. It uh, must not, be, it doesn't have to be the subject. And there are examples like this. I think from uh, Tokipona. Like in my opinion, he is smart. That's, uh, that also works in English, I think. That uh, might work as a part, it's tropative, why not? Um, one of the things that impressed me with your work is, um, especially while working in your, your bachelor's degree, is the wide number of conlangs you were able to examine. 
I don't think you mentioned this in your talk, correct me if I'm wrong, but how did you select what conlangs you were going to look at to, to come up with your, your principles and uh, figure out what was going on in a typological framework? Well, that was a convenient sample. I uh, examined uh, languages uh, due, to, due to, how to say it, uh, I selected languages which I could manage to explore through Facebook, through VK, if I found uh, an informant. When I found an informant, I added language to my sample. Nothing special. <laughs> uh, yeah, convenient sample is obviously convenient, but you did still have a, a large number, which was impressive. And well, you worked with... Large? <laughs> I, large for the, the level you were at when you began the project. Uh, how how did you work with Ithcule? Because that is a notoriously difficult language to work with. Well, I had uh, cooperative informants which uh, who succeeded uh, to help me find out the correct answers uh, to understand uh, how the scenes work in Ithquil. Uh, well, it, it's uh, really difficult, but uh, nothing is impossible if informants are cooperative. The same works for natural languages, actually. I'm grateful to all informants that helped me with my projects, that uh, go on helping me in my current project dedicated to posigraphies. Uh, Graphic conlangs. And of course, what's next? Because you've you've finished your your two projects. Are are you continuing and looking at a different grammatical feature or series of features? Uh, during my MA thesis, I look into tropative, apparative, causative, and hortative uh, in posigraphies. In graphical lines, like bliss symbols, like media glyphs, Arineo. Looking forward to seeing that as well. Um, so once again, I'll, I'll encourage you to hop over to the YouTube chat, uh, say hi to everyone, take a look at the sure. comments that have been coming in. Um, yeah, you might certainly find some interesting things in Kilta, or I'm not going to try and pronounce uh, Christoph's Conlang name because I will absolutely butcher it, but he mentioned that he had accidentally added a couple of these features as well. Um, so yeah, please okay. hop over there and I'm sure the, the conversation will chat for a moment or continue for a few moments. Uh, once again, I'm going to give a quick pause for Sai to be able to bookmark. Okay. And now I'm going to invite uh, Michael Gossler. Uh, so, Michael, uh, Roman, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Perfect. Um, Michael, welcome. Uh, thank you for presenting. Uh, I am not going to try and read the title of your talk. Uh, I will leave that to you. So this is going to be one of our lightning talks. Uh, so please take it away. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Perfect, perfect. Uh, okay, hi everyone. As, as you should be able to read on my slides. My name is Michael. I'm in the last year of my undergrad at Edinburgh University. And I will be talking about a recent conlang of mine that was in part influenced, inspired by my dissertation research. Uh, you can also read on the slides what comes out is the very title that Joey did not want to read out. Um, Bostaratla, 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 which is in fact a sentence in this language, what it means and how we derive it. I'll get to that by the end of this talk. 
So I'm, I'm going to start at the very egg, which is the conlang itself. I will be talking about common acrine, which uh, is a conlang I created as part of a, a job from the LCS Jobs Board. And uh, I was fortunate enough that my client allowed me to both use it as a sandbox for my dissertation research and talk about exactly that today. It is a basic conlang. For those of you not familiar with the LCS Jobs Board tiers, that means it's got a phonology, uh, a fairly thorough grammar and small vocabulary. And we created it as, as the basis for the Acarine language family slash dialect continuum. So this language itself probably is not going to be used anywhere, but it's, it's the basis for several conlangs that will be. And um, my client asked to remain anonymous, but um, I'm allowed to, to plug their upcoming novel, The Cave in the Sun. Uh, yeah, that's the language. The second part of the background is the research, my undergrad dissertation, um, which in a nutshell uh, is about the question of whether we can reduce morphous syntax to just semantic scope communicated in a rational way. I can't really talk about much that's going on in there because it is, as of now, still being graded. Fortunately, that is not a problem because uh, much, most of that actually did not make it into the language and much of what I'm using in the language did not make it into my dissertation. The important part is that for the past nine months, 10 months, uh, I was thinking a lot about uh, reductionist syntax, reductionist semantics, trying to get my representations as simple as possible. Uh, and what I ended up thinking about was um, as a basic relationship for semantics, complementation or predication. So one of one of my trains of thought was is can we reduce every word class to a type of predicate and i think the answer is yes and for some that's very straightforward so we can say an intransitive verb very classically is a one place predicate again for those who are not familiar with predicate logic that just means it takes one argument and that's a subject we can say a transitive verb is a two place predicate it takes a subject and an object Okay, that's that's fairly standard so far. How do we do that with other word classes? So an obvious next choice is adjective, because we know some languages have um, attributive adjectives who work like verbs. Uh, also, some analysis just use adjectives a lot like verbs. We can just say they take also one, one argument, and that's just a noun. And the same with adverbs, they take a verb as their argument. And actually, we can do the same with determiners. We'll just take nouns or adjectives taking nouns as their complement, as their complement. Uh, and also things like tense or aspect or mood, which then take verbs or verb phrases as their argument. How does that work with prepositions or postpositions or appositions? Um, I would argue they are two-place predicates, because essentially what they do is they, they, um, they relate between two nouns or two, two DPs I've written here. And again, we can say the same with conjunctions. They relate between two, two clauses. OK, now what about nouns? I've been talking about them a lot. They don't really take any, any arguments in any way. So what we say that nouns and pronouns are zero place predicates. That's not usually what we use the term for. It's usually reserved for weather words like it rains, which also doesn't take any arguments. I think in, in this kind of breakdown, actually it works because they really are just kind of there and don't take, take any relations in that sense. Um, so I, I stuck with this, saying we have two place predicates, one place predicates, and then anything that has no arguments is a noun or pronoun. And we could argue there are three place predicates, but I didn't go all the way. Now, what does that look like in practice? If we have a sentence like, the healer built a hidden city under the sky, that's 100% a sentence I regularly use in my daily life and not one I constructed just so I could translate it into acarine with the vocabulary I have. If you want to analyze this with these predicates, uh, we can essentially start anywhere. I'd say let's start with the, the subject healer. That's a noun. Zero place predicate does not take any arguments. We can add a determiner that takes one argument is the healer. Then we can add the verb takes a subject argument, the healer, and as a so far open object argument, it's going to be a hidden city under the sky. So we start with city. Again, no arguments. Hidden city takes one argument. A takes hidden city as its argument. Then we get the preposition under, which takes a hidden city as one argument, and then the sky as its other argument. Uh, and in the end, we get this 
absolutely not confusing representation that is somewhat um, somewhat a mix uh, of, of phrase structure and, and dependency relations. How do we put this into a conlang? Um, that gets us to Ackering grammar, which is essentially a, a type of categorial grammar if we work in this way. I, I mixed it up a bit. I didn't want to make it too mechanical, get a bit of language messiness. So uh, the resulting grammar is uh, has no word classes. Uh, the function of every word just depends on context. If if it does have doesn't have any any arguments, it's a noun or a pronoun. If it takes one argument, which is a noun, then it's probably an adjective or a determiner, uh, and so forth. And there is some morphology. There's a single paradigm that applies to every word, since there are word classes, which very randomly um, assigns voice, aspect, gender. And there's also a number which I've excluded here. But in turn, every, every item, every lexeme has a fixed number of arguments. That is given semantically. So some items might have might be ditransitive semantically, some might be monotransitive, some might be intransitive, etc. Not all of these slots have to be filled importantly. So we can say we have a transitive verb, which usually would have two arguments, subject and object, but neither of them are filled. So it appears as a zero place, um, zero place predicate. That could, for example, be an agent noun. As we said, nouns have zero, uh, zero slots. Um, but if we start discharging these slots, that occurs along an argument hierarchy. So anyone familiar with lambda calculus or combinatory categorical grammar will be vaguely familiar with that. So if we say we have, again, a transitive verb, it has a subject and object argument, but we only fill one slot that is always going to be the object. We can't have subject verb and no object. We always have verb in the object and possibly no subject. So we can't get things like anti-causatives or something. And that gives us, um, or based on that, we have the basic word order template, which is we have the predicate. It is followed by the first argument and preceded by the second argument. So that's if you want a basic VP uh, X bar phrase, if you want something like that. Um, in turn, that means that the noun extension always precedes the noun. As we said, that adjectives and determiners are all predicates who take the noun as their argument. So we have things like avalioka, golden fire, where we have gold and fire. And we have prepositions that follow their host, since they take their complement as the first argument, the host is the second argument. So we have like hisge or face mas, where face is the preposition in, in sky is the complement and cloud, he's here, cloud in sky, a cloud in the sky. For clausal argument structure, I wanted to mix it up a bit. So both SVO and SOV are permitted. Uh, generally, SOV is preferred in matrix clauses just for pragmatic reasons, since everything going on within the clause follows this sort of SVO structure. I thought it makes sense if the clause itself contrasts with that and is SOV. In turn, embedded clauses are SVO. Okay. Let's take this back to the example from before. That just means uh, the healer built a hidden city under the sky. Healer, hidden city, under sky built. Again, we can, we can analyze it using the, the predicates, starting with the subject, healer, aridatla. Um, then we get the verb, takes two, two arguments, subject and object. Uh, the object is going to be the city, Vizdarezi. Then hisio takes pistereza as its argument, hidden city. Then we have the preposition, takes hisio pistereza as its second argument. We're missing a first argument. That's going to be mas the sky. That's how we can, can derive the sentence. And importantly, all of these words are classless. They, any word can take any position in the sentence. So for example, aridatla really just means he is healing. It can be a verb, it can be a, um, can be a noun, it can be a participle or an adjective, it can be anything. So theoretically, we can just get, use one single word and build an entire sentence out of it. And that is how we get back to my title slide, because we can take a word like uh, which literally means he is preaching, or literally he, he's granting insight, something like that. And we can just take that and throw a couple of those into one sentence, and we still have a grammatical sentence. So if you just have it once, most likely we're going to interpret it as a verb, means he preaches or he is preaching. So there we have we have no arguments. We're just going to say we have pro drop for subject and object. If we add one of them, 
uh, we have to discharge the object argument first. So the second one is going to be interpreted as the object, bosdaratla, bosdaratla, he preaches to the preacher. We can add another one. Now it already depends sort of on passing, but I'd say it makes most sense to say that one is the object, one's the subject. So we get the preacher preaches to the preacher, bosdaratla, bosdaratla, bosdaratla. We get another one. Uh, again, depends on passing where we put it. I say let's put it as an adjective to the object. The preacher preaches to the preaching preacher. Bostaratla, 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 bostaratla. And we get one more, then we have an adjective for the subject as well. The preaching preacher preaches to the preaching preacher. Bostaratla, 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 bostaratla. And that brings us back to the very sentence from the title slide, and that brings me to the um, end of the talk. Unfortunately, there currently aren't any materials on Acarine since it is very much an ongoing project, but if you want to know more about what I do generally, these are my contacts, socials, and I hope there is time for questions. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Um, there are lots of puns and um, with some humor veiled threats happening in the uh, YouTube chat. Uh, I'm imagining a shaking fist along with the sentence, if I see a lambda, <laughs> Um, and some some questions as to how many personal conlangs are we going to see where bozdaratla uh, now means buffalo, so we can get buffalo, <laughs> buffalo, 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 buffalo. Uh, I had a question, and forgive me if my chameleon brain trying to monitor the YouTube chat and what you're saying missed something, uh, but when you were setting out your uh, preliminary background you said that nouns don't take any arguments was that just uh, an in general thing or or you made that assumption um, and I, I guess I can say where I'm coming from with this question I would suggest that uh, in the predicate uh, the city's destruction by the air force destruction does have two arguments uh, yeah, so that, that was more a uh, generalizing assumption. Of course, uh, especially nominalized verbs do, do tend to have objects. And in that case, I, as I said, it's just a basic online. I've, I've not thought that far ahead. Okay. But And of course, yeah, that, I, I would assume that would work for this conlang as everything doesn't have a grammatical category and you can assign two arguments to to any word, is that correct? Yeah, uh, theoretically, we could also argue that if if we have a, uh, a verb and one of its argument slots is discharged by an object, then it becomes sort of zero place because it doesn't ask for any more arguments. And then we have a noun again, um, which was the, was the thought behind this, just by discharging one slot after the other. But yeah, that should absolutely work in okay, theory and it will try and work. I mean, I think uh, you are are generally co correct in probably ninety percent of cases. Nouns don't take an argument. Ninety might be a little high because I would suggest genitives have an argument, but that's me going deep into syntax. Yeah, I would then argue that genitives sort of are determinants, but that's oh okay. I, I can argue understand. about that all day. I think. Let's no, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, in in my syntactic theory that I subscribe to, they they would be an argument that moves into, I would say, the specifier of the DP. But they do have a determiner like quality. I agree with you. Um, I'm seeing lots of clapping on the stream. There there is a delay, and I. I believe it is more than 60 seconds, but um, okay. There is one question from the YouTube uh, from Jacob Stewart. Could you just use a two place predicate for adjectives with uh, the lexeme by? By as in to buy the, something or uh, the preposition by. by. Preposition by. I'm um, not quite sure I understand the question. Um, let me uh, copy and paste it into the chat, just in case seeing it helps. Um, uh, 
adjectives with by. Um, I, I, I might just be stuck there as a non-native speaker of English. Adjectives with by. Uh, I I don't think they're providing something that would be an actual translation in English, but oh. using the formulation in your conlang. Um, could you use a two-place predicate for adjectives through using what wouldn't be a preposition in your conlang, uh, a two-place predicate with by? Um, I mean, theoretically, uh, yeah, it, I, I would generally say the semantics rules there. So if if in any way it takes two, two arguments semantically, it can be a two-place predicate. Um, yeah, and generally, yeah, um, that, that's honestly, no that's not something I've thought of very much, but um, I, I wouldn't see a problem with it in that sense. Yeah. Um, I think I might be missing something, but another question here, well, I guess not a question, but a comment. Kinship terms and inalienably possessed items have semantic arguments. So I guess in that um, zero argument noun thing, there are necessary mm -hmm. arguments for things that are inalienably possessed, like kinship. Um, how how would you handle kinship terms, I guess, is a good question. Um, so yeah, kinship terms, first inalienable, inalienable possession, I would... Um, I would deal with like genitives, so I'd say the in in this determinate-ish area with kinship terms. Um, that really boils down to lexical semantics, I'd say. If if it's um, so, if if we're just saying my grandmother or something like that, that also I would I would treat in the determinate-ish area. Um, if we say the kinship term in um, intrinsically has has an argument in it um that i i would be willing also to treat as a zero place predicate if if it doesn't if it does not in the structure take an argument so to say awesome um jimin has just reminded me that there is another question which uh, eluded oh. my notice uh, and i'm strolling through trying to find gill's question I don't see, oh, from Logan. Uh, Jamin, if, if you have the question there, could you ask it perhaps? I could ask it. Yes. This is Matt. Please do. Um, so the, the question from the chat is uh, whether you've had a look at David Gill's work on uh, monocategorial grammar and natural languages. Um, I have, in fact, not. I'm going to write the name down. Um, so it's David uh, G-I-L. Um, he, he works, uh, I, I, I know him a little bit because he works on Austronesian languages and he's, he's written specifically about a dialect of Indonesian called Riau Indonesian, which is spoken um, in the Riau archipelago kind of off the coast of Sumatra. And he's argued that Riau Indonesian is a natural language that has no lexical classes. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard of that language. I'm not familiar with the work. Thank you. I'm going to look into that. Sounds very interesting. All right. Uh, well, once again, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. Um, highly right. recommend you pop over to the YouTube chat. There'll probably be some more conversation ongoing. Um, Sai has asked me to give a five second pause for bookmarks. So I'm going to do that. Uh, that should give them the chance to separate out the recordings. We're going to go into a 10-minute break. If anyone needs a, a bio break, refill coffee cups, whatever you need, um, please take the next 10 minutes to do so. And then we'll be back with the second session, starting with Andrew Higgins. So we'll see everybody in 10 minutes.
All right, we're we're not quite back from the break, but I I thought I might add something based on I'm seeing emails come in and whatnot. Um, so it looks like we're still having a conlang chatter day. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, um, Tony Harris usually Tony's not around today, uh, so it'll be Gray Richardson um, hosts a conlang chat on Zoom. Um, Mirabai, if if you can caption this, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, so we we are having our Conlang Chatter Day, uh, Chat Saturday today. Um, the information I believe went out through email. Tony sent that out uh, not too long ago. <clears throat> um, Tony also usually posts the information in the. LCS members Slack channel. So if uh, if anybody is looking for a social event after the, the conference, you can absolutely hop on to that Zoom that went out to the members email list and should be in the, the Slack channel as well. Um, during Roman's talk, Roman was talking about AUI, um, which is a uh, uh, conlang that is based on and certain semantic primitives, if I remember correctly. And I just got this book in the mail uh, yesterday. Uh, Andrea uh, Welgart, I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, is the daughter of the person who created AUI. And uh, she wrote, <clears throat> excuse me, she wrote a novel that uses AUI in the backdrop. And um, Christoph, uh, former LCS president, and myself, and uh, one other person were able to read a preprint copy and comment on it. And I, I have to read the, the back cover, uh, Christoph's quote, a thought-provoking tale about language and how it can be used both to control us or to liberate us. In a frighteningly realistic near future setting, a teenage girl is fighting oppression and the weapon is language, a page turner from beginning to end. Um, that is a poetic quote, Christoph. I love it. Um, it is a, a children's story. It's geared to a younger audience. I believe it's available on Amazon now. I'm not entirely sure, but the Airsats Academy, great book featuring uh, a legacy Conlang work. Uh, okay, so it uh, it looks like it's time to jump back into the conference. Andrew, are you there? I am here. Excellent. Um, welcome back to session number two. Uh, we are going to start this session with Andrew Higgins' talk, uh, Linguistic Poachers of the Star Trek and Star Wars Star Story Worlds. Uh, so please feel free to share your screen, Andrew. Here we go. And... and if you can go to full screen. I just got all this weird stuff that just came up. Sorry. Oh, I might stop sharing again and do that again, just because I had a, the chat thing came up again. There we go. There we go. All right, great. Wonderful. Take it away, Andrew. Thank you, Joseph. Um, it's great to be here. It is amazing to be here. Hello from Brighton, UK. Um, I'm Dr. Andrew Higgins. And um, the talk so far have been fantastic. And it's actually making me want to get out my own conlang called Bortonic, which I've been working on on and off for the last couple of years and do some work on it. So you're all very much inspiring me. But today I'm here to talk to you about some conlangs of the past, um, some art langs actually. I recently completed um, some chapters for two new books that will be coming out from Vernon Press this year, exploring the history and development of the invented languages of the Star Trek and Star Wars worlds. These volumes have been conceived by Dr. Amy Sturgis and Dr. Emily Strand, and they're sure to add some interesting discourse um, into these two very exciting and constantly growing story worlds. This is the cover for the Star Trek one, and the Star Wars one will be coming out later this year. My interest in these languages stem from the two online courses I took at Signum University with Dr. Sturgis, 
and also my continuing exploration of the invented languages of J.R.R. Tolkien. In 2016, I co-edited with Dr. Dimitri Fimi, a supervised Tolkien on language invention, which was published by HarperCollins. And this is the paperback edition, or as I like to call it, the Sith edition uh, of the work. But what I'm here to talk to you today about is one area that I kind of I kind of did some research on while I was writing these chapters, and that is the juxtaposition between invented languages and fan engagement. Um, in his 1992 book, Textual Poaches, Television Fans and Participatory, Participatory Culture, Henry Jenkins explored the important and powerful element of narrative world building with one of the earliest groups to show the power of fandom in world building. And what I wanna look at today is how fans engaged with both the Star Trek and Star, Star Wars worlds through language invention. It is clear from the evidence that we have from the first early fanzines or fan magazines and later through online websites that one of the first acts of creativity and reception that both Star Trek and Star Wars fans used to engage with this world was the act of created language invention. So let's start with the Star Trek story world, which had its birth in 1966 with the original television series. Even while the original show was in the first run, early fans attempted to add to the narratives of the now foundational TV episodes and early novelizations through the highly complex and intricate examples of their own secret vice. These works exist if one looks for them in early fanzines and later on now abandoned websites. And they are great examples, not only of narrative world building, but of fans actually using language invention to interact and become part of these worlds. And in the early days, probably the most language invention was focused around the Vulcan language because of the interest in the character, Mr. Spock. So this attempted fan invented Vulcan language appeared in the first major fanzine which underscoring again the interest in Spock was called Spockanalia. And it was conceived, edited and published by Star Trek fan Devra Langsam in five issues between 1960 and 1970. The first issue seen here contained 90 pages. And for this first issue, writer and fellow fan Dorothy Jones composed a poem called The Territory of Rigel, which was called, quote, a Nivar to be performed by two Vulcan voices and a Vulcan harp. In the commentary, Jones said that this poem was written by Mr. Spock himself years ago when he observed the contrast between the dark of the ship's bridge he was on and the life from the planet Rigel, which of course appeared in the Star Trek pilot, The Cage. And the contrast of light and dark appealed to the duality of Spock being half Vulcan and half human. And he attempted to express this in a Vulcan phrase called Nivar. Jones goes on to explain that Nivar is a Vulcan term that means literally two forms and is basically a composed piece comparing and contrasting two different things, ideas or aspects. In the third issue of the fanzine, published in September 1968, Jones offered the proposed structural sketch of the Vulcan language a document written within the context of the Star Trek world by Lieutenant Dorothy Conway, PhD, Federation Starfleet. This is a highly detailed linguistic outline of a Vulcan language, which starts by stating the nature and history of the version of the Vulcan language. And as you can see, in her description of the transition from old Vulcan to modern Vulcan, Jones reflects the idea introduced in the Star Trek original series narratives that in the past, the Vulcans had moved from being a violent emotional race to one based on logic, as exemplified by Mr. Spock and also his father, Sarek, who was introduced in Journey to Babel, written by Star Trek show writer DC Fontana. One of the linguistic changes that Jones cites is the, quote, widespread change in vocabulary, primary the wholesale deletion of emotional, poetic, and inexact vocabulary. In this respect, Jones' invention is using the linguistic relativity theories of Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Worf, popular with writers and language inventors like George Orwell in 1984 and Jack Vance in The Languages of Pal, who posited that the semantic structure of a language shapes or limits the ways in which a speaker forms conceptions of the world. 
In this case, the absence of words of emotion and non-logical ideas means that these thoughts can no longer be thought of because there's no way to express these ideas through language. The Spock and earlier fanzine is also an interesting and important example how Star Trek storytellers making the original series both supported and actively engaged with growing Star Trek fan base, which as we shall see, was quite different from how George Lucas and Lucasfilm engaged with the early Star Wars fan base. For example, each issue of Spock and Alia included letters from the Star Trek actors, including the Leonard Nimoy as Mr. Spock, as you can see here, writing as both themselves and in their characters, and commenting, commenting on articles encouraging the fans to explore further. In one case, in the second issue, Star Trek writer DC Fontana offered fans more background on Mr. Spock, including what his name actually meant. And as you can see here, his name is actually a series of very unpronounceable consonants. I won't pronounce it because you can't pronounce it. As an interesting aside in the Star Trek episode, This Side of Paradise, which DC Fontana co-wrote, the scientist Leela asks Mr. Spock if he has another name and Spock replies, you cannot pronounce it. When the original series went off the air, fan interest did not wane and another version of a fan invented Vulcan language emerged from the development of an alternative Star Trek story world by a group of fans to tell new stories about the Vulcans. This alternative universe was developed by writers like Jacqueline Lichtenberg on this slide, and in, uh, who came up with the name Kraith, an invented Vulcan word for goblet or chalice that's used in the performance of rituals that appear in several of the stories. The Kraith collection is a series of stories and articles exploring Vulcan culture and its interaction with the human dom dominated United Federation of Planets. In several of these stories, Lichtenberg described the Vulcaner language, which like Jones had as, as its linguistic makeup, the concept of a language that communicated logical thought. Lichtenberg outlined her version of the Vulcan language in an article found in the Crate Creators Manager, Manual, published in April 1975, as a guide for fans who were developing focused narratives. Lichtenberg's introduction includes a nod to a very well-known language inventor. She writes, quote, the contents of this zine are a hodgepodge of articles and letters designed to elucidate some of the more elusive background ideas of the Kraith series. Like Tolkien, I can say the Kraith has grown in the telling. Lichtenberg, Lichtenberg's article is also a very highly complex treatment of a new version of the Vulcan language, which emphasizes that Vulcan reforms to the logical thinking and the need to forge a tool of communication equal to the task. As like Jones, Lichtenberg builds linguistic, linguistic depth to her Vulcan by stating that there are different historic forms of Vulcan and that the modern Vulcan language has been developed to express logical thought. To convey the logical sense of her version of the Vulcan language, Lichtenberg went further than Jones in using elements of the sapir whorf hypothesis and modeled a form of an attempt at invented or engineers languages that were popular in the Enlightenment, which brought a new focus on philosophy, science, and especially mathematics, and a desire for a language that would express the new scientific truths in clearly and perfect mathematical notation. In other words, that through its structure, it would communicate the type of logic that the Vulcan language attempted to do. In his essay towards a real character in a philosophical language, English clergyman and natural philosopher John Wilkins attempted to create a universal artificial language based on an innovative classification of knowledge by which scholars and philosophers as well as diplomats, scholars and merchants could communicate. These types of philosophic languages are called a priori languages as they do not reflect any overt elements of real world language. To achieve this, a vast network of categories had to be invented to classify the different aspects and nature of a person or object that would be signified by a specific letter. The attempts ultimately failed to be used because of the sheer number of categories that had to be developed. And I'm sure most of you have read Erika Orkrin's brilliant exploration of how one word would have worked in this categorizing language and how it doesn't really work in the land of invented languages. 
An analysis of Lichtenberg's Vulcan language shows she is clearly using a similar framework for her language invention. For exa example, Lichtenberg posits, contrary to DC Fontana's thoughts, that the name Spock is made up of the following elements and the letters that signify them. Lichtenberg summarizes that Spock is a male who communicates a blended tradition. He's half Vulcan and half human. The name also carries the connotation of a founder of dynasties, which is somewhat ironic given the work that Admiral Spock later does to rebuild and bring different peoples back together, especially the Vulcans and the Romulans. Lichten's work, Lichtenberg's work is also another example of the ways fans engage with theories of language and language invention to develop their own versions of language for the Star Trek world rooted in the theories and experiences of past language invention. Lichtenberg also incorporated some of the words Dorothy Jones had invented, including a term we explored earlier, Nivar, which was categorized as something grouped to form a pattern, things which are excluded from the pattern, so that idea of duality. Lichtenberg's Vulcan language therefore represents a serious piece of fan-invented language work that uses the patterns of other philosophic attempts to create a language based on logical, rational categorization, and by at the same time added great to the narrative world building of the Star Trek story world. Now, before we turn to Star Wars, one more interesting element of the fan invented Star Trek languages is the trajectory of Jones's term Nivar from the territory of Rigel Bone. If, if this term sounds familiar, it may be because it has gone on from being a fan invented term to becoming part of the franchise of Star Trek storytelling. Nivar was the title in a short story of the same name written by Claire Gabriel, published by Bantam Books in 1976, called Star Trek The New Voyages. But most recently in Star Trek Discovery season three, in episode seven, Unification Three, the crew of the Discovery, now time warped to the 32nd century, learned that the planet that used to be Vulcan is now called by a new name to reflect that is now inhabited by two races, the Vulcans and the Romulans. The writer of this episode, Kirsten Beyer, said in an interview that she came across a reference to a Vulcan art form, Nivar, and its idea of seeing things from two different perspectives in the original Spockanalia fanzine. As Beyer said, I just thought it was beautiful and captured perfectly what would be happening on Vulcan should they truly attempt reunification with the Romulans. Now, when we turn to the Star Wars story world and fan engagement with language invention, we see a slightly different uh, playing field. Whereas early Star Trek fandom were given only snippets and hints of the languages of the Vulcans, the Romulans, and the Klingons, offering many gaps for creative development, viewers of the first six Star Wars films were given a great deal of canonical invented languages, the product of the work of Lucasfilm sound engineer Ben Burt, who constructed his languages from the appropriation, and in some cases misappropriation, of elements of sound, from the recorded growls of bears and walruses for Chewbacca, to the synthesized beeps combined with baby whimpers for the astromech R2-D2, echoed now, of course, by the very cute gurgles of Din Grogu. Therefore, in a universe already populated with, as C-3PO says, over 6 million forms of communication, the space for fans to invent versions of these languages was not as wide. Like Star Trek, once the three films came out, starting in 1977, fans launched Star Wars fanzines and conferences. In one early fanzine, Against the Sith, there is a Star Wars lexicon that brings together some of the names and phrases from the first movie. However, as I mentioned, the relationship between George Lucas and early Star Wars fans was quite different from the one with Gene Roddenberry and early Star Trek fans. Lucas did not encourage fan development of his stories. They were his stories. And in some cases, some of the early fanzines were forced to stop printing. And the Lucasfilm controlled fanzine launched in 1978 as first the official Star Wars fan club magazine and later renamed Bantha Tracks, became the one that reported official Lucasfilm information and mainly contained interview with the cast and production teams and no fan engagement. 
In 2001, Bert compiled all the dialogue from the first six films together and published the Star Wars Galactic Phrase and Travel Guide that in part, in part employed a framework that harkens back to one of the earliest narrative structures authors have used to introduce invented language into fictional works, The Traveler's Tale. In The Traveler's Tale, of course, an explorer travels to a foreign land and encounters new people possessing different culture and languages. And the guide was developed just like that. You're traveling to Tatooine and you want to talk to the Jawas. Here's the phrase book to do it. The publishing of this phrase book and the codification of the elements of the language heard in the canon movies gave fans vocabulary, grammar, and syntax that they could study and build upon. A good example of fan engagement with the languages is the website, The Complete Wormo's Guide to Hatties and Other Star Wars Languages, which was launched in 2001 and engages with many of the Star Wars languages developed in the Galactic Guide, especially the language of the Huts, Jabba the Huts language, and the Ewoks. While there is some evidence of language invention by filling in the gaps on the site, Wermo seems more interesting in compiling the canonical information that can be gleaned from the movies and other canon sources, and where there are examples of her own language invention to fill in the gaps, it is clearly indicated on the site. Another good example of fan language invention filling in a gap in Star Wars storytelling can be seen in one of the most recent Star Wars characters and narratives, the Mandalorians. The militaristic commandos first introduced by, do the original film characters of Boba Fett, first introduced in the infamous Star Wars holiday special, and then in Empire and Return, and his father Jango Fett, who first appeared in Attack of the Clones, and then developed through the narratives of the Tales of the Jedi comic series, the Clone Wars, Rebels, and of course, in the current Disney era, the Book of Boba Fett and the Mandalorian. The language that came to be known as Mandoa was initially developed by composer Jesse Harlan to be used in the soundtrack he created for the 2005 video game Republican Commando. Harlan wanted a tragically heroic main theme for the game to be sung by a male choir, and he created a fledgling ancient Mandalorian language for it to be recorded in. While work on the game already was well underway, Star Wars Extended Universe Karen Travis was hired to write a series of tie-in novels expanding on the game's world. This is one of them right here. Travis picked Harlan's work on the Mandoa language and took it from simply a few songs worth of vocabulary to a fully functioning construction language developed across her many books focusing on the Mandalorian culture. The second novel, Republican Commando Triple Zero, included a Mandoa glossary. Eventually available on our website was a complete guide to the language with a dictionary of over 1200 words and phrases. Travis departed from the franchise in 2009 when the Clone Wars series revealed its own interpretation of Mandalorian culture that differed heavily from her own. On her original website, which has all of her invented language work on it, Travis posted this message to fans starting with a phrase in Mandoa, which means you've come to the right place to learn Mandoa, and then explaining to fans what happened, but most interestingly, kind of leaving as a legacy what she had done for fans to further invent on. Therefore, from some just brief mentions in the original Canyon movies, Mandalorian culture and language have become a major part of Star Wars storytelling, and the language that Travis invented has become a part of this story world with more development to come as the key narrative of the Mandalorians is developed. In a recent article on Nerdist, Eric Diaz compared the development of the Mandalorians with that of Star Trek's Klingons as fan favorites. And it will be interesting to see how, like Klingon, fan engagement through language develop, deve engagement develops through further stories and exploration of the Mandalorians. So the act of language invention is a key component of myth-making and world-building. As Tolkien said in his seminal talk on fairy stories, mythology is language and language is mythology. What this exploration has shown is by wanting to engage and become parts of both the Star Trek and Star Wars story worlds, fans, or as I call them, linguistic poachers, became part of this process of invention by using their skill and knowledge to find the gaps 
and fill it with examples of highly complex and thought out examples of language invention that added to the texture and richness of these ever growing and expanding story worlds where a fan invented word like Nevar can now become the name of a major planet in the canon story world itself. And a people first seen as just a skulking voiceless character behind the evil Darth Vader can have a culture and a voice all their own. And the linguistic adventure continues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, if you want to stop sharing so we can see us yep. having a conversation. Um, there's some talk in the YouTube chat, um, definitely more fans in there, uh, you know, talking about their experiences and um, watching the the Ewok holiday special where Yub Nub was said a lot, things like yep, that. Yep. Yep, yep. <laughs> yes. um, one of the comments that uh, Grayson mentioned in the YouTube chat earlier is um, the Vulcan in Star Trek Enterprise and Discovery was definitely not isolating it. It had case endings. And this brought up a, um, a question that I had because I, I know relatively little about the Vulcan language despite being a huge Trekkie. I know Mark Okrand uh, worked on Vulcan for the Star Trek movies. Do you know if he was aware of some of this early Vulcan canon that that you were citing? And and do you know if he incorporated any of that or yeah. or if any of the fan canon survived into the, the present day Vulcan? Yeah, I actually cover a bit of that in the chapter I wrote on this. So I, this is all just about fan, but the chapters I've written for these two Vernon Press books, look at all the canonical language invention as well. And yes, Mark, Mark Orkin actually was originally hired before he even started Klingon to work on the dialogue. Do you remember in Star Trek, um, The Wrath of Khan, the elevator conversation between Spock and Sarek, which was in Vulcan. And what he had to do is he had to make sure it, they had filmed it in English already. So he had to make sure that the Vulcan matched the sound patterns basically and everything. And he used for that those some of the early uh, what Dorothy Jones had done, yeah, definitely. So there's also another version of Vulcan called Goliac Vulcan, which is the Vulcan that I think has been used in the later series, basically. So the Vulcan I'm looking at in this paper are just these two early versions, but there's another developed version of Vulcan um, that was used in, I think, Discovery as well. Yeah, it's called Goliac Vulcan, and there's a website about it actually. So that was specifically designed as another dialect, perhaps, if am yeah, I understanding? Well, just, I mean, the thing about, uh, I mean, the interest, what, one of the things I find fascinating about this is what gets kept and what is kind of, you know, just falls away, basically. And that's why I love this whole story about Nevar, because literally what, I mean, that has gone through the whole trajectory into the Star Trek world and everything. And words like Califar and Califi, which we use, there was another version of Vulcan, actually, which I cover in the book, which Theodore Sturgeon had created for the episode A Mock Time, which of course was the first time we saw the Vulcan homeworld. And um, Theodore Sturgeon worked with this other guy, which I talk about to create this language. And then Gene L. Kuhn, who was the showrunner, wrote this memo to Theodore Sturgeon and said, oh, Theodore, please, let's not put all this invented language in. No one gets invented languages and actors can't sell it which I would love to know what David Peterson would think of that right now. I could give you some comments, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so that was another time, basically. So yeah, there, there's, there's this interesting trajectory of how some of the fan-invented languages kind of moves into the canonical ones as well, yeah. Awesome. Um, there's a question in the chat that you, you didn't cover in this, but... Um... So I, I guess I'll, I'll unmask here. I was one of your reviewers for the Star Wars chapter. Sorry for all of the uh, extra you vision. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but there, there was a. Your oh, you're, I mean, I'm glad. I'm glad it strengthened the the chapter overall. But there was a question: if uh, you could discuss a little bit of the the sign language that appears in the Mandalorian, which I know you covered in that chapter. Yeah. So that's right. That, that's fascinating. So there was a. Uh, a uh, an act they it started in the book of Boba Fett actually and they wanted to create for the Tusken Raiders who again are an interesting character group in Star Wars because they started out being these villains you know the ones that attacked Luke with the the gaffing stick and everything in New Hope 
And now they be kind of almost become these kind of sympathetic characters, basically, in Book of Boba Fett. And they wanted to create a way for them to communicate. And they decided to use a sign language, basically. And they worked with a, a, a you know, someone, a hearing impaired person around how they would develop that sign language. And then that actor whose name is escaping me, but he won an Oscar actually, actually played one of the Tuscan Raiders in Book of Boba Fett. And it started this whole thing. And now there are websites about this language and people have written, you know, written and said that, you know, I, I can finally understand Star Wars now because I'm hearing impaired as well and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was a it was a really and I can't remember the name of the actor now. It's escaping me. But yeah. And then that was then kind of brought into the Mandalorian as well. Thank you so and much, I Andrew. See, I think we're going to see a bit of it in Ashoka. There's okay. been there's been rumors that there are going to be Tuscan Raiders in one of the episodes of Ashoka, and that they're going to be using that language basically. Uh, from reading your work, which I, I assume everybody will be able to do in the near future, it, it sounds like Star Wars really stepped up its conlang game, which is fantastic. Yep. But um, I'm going to once again encourage you to hop over to the YouTube chat. You can see Jamin just posted uh, one of the other questions asking you to go a little more in depth with the uh, territory of Regal and the, the Dorothy Jones stuff, but I'll, I'll let you answer that in the, the YouTube chat. Um, so thank you very much. Once again, I'm going to take a pause here so we can bookmark the talk and I believe Sai is going to start a backup recording. So we might have a little audio interference for just a second. So I'll, I'll give a moment for that to happen. Okay, I don't think there was any audio interference there. Uh, another, so we'll now have two backup recordings, which is fantastic, and of course the YouTube live stream. Um, <laughs> okay, um, sorry, just reading text messages from Sai. Um, our next presenter, Gabriel, thank you for joining us. If you'd like to uh, share your screen and, and make it full size. All right, welcome. So um, I think a lot of people really love hearing about tonology. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's a very common natural language feature. And of course, uh, conlangers seem to love it as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hand it over to Gabriel Swy to talk about grammatical tonology for conlangers. Thank you, Gabriel. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel Swy, and this is grammatical tonology for conlangers. Um, so Firstly, an introduction. So um, as you said before, grammatical tone is very common uh, across the world. But just from a personal perspective, I've noticed um, just like comparatively the ratio of like constructed languages to natural languages that have grammatical tone. I noticed sort of like a lack of uh, really in-depth grammatical tone languages. And I hope to see more um, like uh, really creative and in-depth grammatical tone languages in the future just in the community. Um, so I'm giving this presentation both as a way to expand um, the somewhat limited uh, current resources for um, grammatical tone uh, information for helping conlangers create grammatical tone languages specifically, and also um, as a way to just show like how fascinating they can be. Um, but with that being said, um, an important question to be answered first is what exactly is tone? So tone can be defined as a pitch element or register added to a syllable to, to convey grammatical information. Um, so uh, keep in mind though, that this is not um, an exact frequency. So a language would never require a speaker, for example, to utter a tone at exactly 155 Hertz. Instead, um, what's more important is the relative distance between the pitches. So um, for example, a language may require a speaker to utter a high tone, roughly X amount higher than a low tone. Um, so what's more important is the distance between the pitches as opposed to their exact heights. Um, so grammatical tone specifically can be defined as pitch level, which marks uh, contrast in grammatical features. And so as an example of this, um, these two words from uh, Rendile, a Cushitic language from Kenya, uh, demonstrate this pretty well. Um, so in Rendile, different cases are marked by different patterns of tone. So uh, for example, the word boy in the object case takes the pattern of high tone on the first vowel and low tone on the second vowel, whereas in the subject case, um, it takes low tone on both vowels. Um, so these are pronounced enam and enam respectively. 
Um, and uh, so now that we understand like what tone is or how it's defined and grammatical tone also, we can look more into tonal inventories. So tonal inventories are to tonology what phonological inventories are to phonology. So a tonal inventory is the total uh, con the set of total contrastive tones in a tone language. Um, so a question you may be having now is how many levels of tone can a tone language distinguish between or a grammatical tone language specifically? And the answer to this is anywhere between two to six levels of tone. Um, however, this may be a little bit misleading because um, uh, in general, languages that distinguish between fewer levels of tone tend to be more common. So um, distinguishing between two levels of tone is the most common by far. A majority of grammatical tone languages distinguish between two levels of tone. Um, three levels of tone is not rare, but it's a distinct minority. Um, and anything more than that tends to be rarer. Um, for example, six levels of tone is very rare and is only known to occur in one language, the Kyoli language of Nigeria. Um, so just keep that in mind if you are wanting to add um, grammatical tone to naturalistic conlangs. Um, however, level tones aren't the only tones that grammatical conlangs may have. They may also have contour tones. So for contour tones specifically, um, what's more important is, uh, it's what's less important is the um, relative pitches, uh, the, re the relative distance between the pitches of the tones. What's more important is the shape of the tone. Um, so for uh, this presentation and a lot of areas of grammatical tonology specifically, um, these contour tones can be thought of as clusters of level tones on the same syllable. So for example, a rising tone can be thought of as a low tone followed by a high tone um, on the same syllable. Uh, a falling tone can be thought of as a high tone followed by a low tone on the same syllable. And this is also true for more complex contour tones such as rising, falling, and falling, rising. Um, but in languages that distinguish between more levels of tone than just two um, levels of tone, there can be even more intricate contour tones. Um, so for example, the Mazatecan Soil Tepec language of Mexico um, has four levels of tone, one being the highest and four being the lowest. Um, and shown here are two contour tones that it has. Uh, these are both rising tones, but notice that they both start on a different um, tone. So the first example starts on a four or the fourth tone, and the uh, second example starts on the third tone. Um, so while they're both rising tone, they're both uh, pronounced slightly differently, ch and nku, respectively. Um, and so an important thing for conlangers specifically to keep in mind is this hierarchy here. So according to this hierarchy, um, if a language has one of the tones shown here, then it will also have um, the rest of the tones to the right of its greater than sign. So for example, um, if a language has a rising tone, then it will almost certainly also have a falling tone, a high tone, and a low tone. However, if a language has a falling tone, it won't necessarily have a rising tone. Uh, for example, Hausa doesn't have a rising tone, but it does have a falling tone. Um, but so now that we uh, have looked into uh, like, you know, the tonal inventories and what grammatical tone actually is, we can look into um, a really interesting theory, in my opinion, and uh, it's also very important for understanding um, the more complex side of grammatical tone languages, and that is autosegmental phonology. Um, so autosegmental phonology differs from the traditional view of phonology in that it poses that phonology can be separated into different tiers, um, as opposed to, you know, just like one tier of, you know, a string of segments all in a row. Um, so as an example of this, we can look back at that example from Rendile before. Um, so here's the word boy in Rendile in the object case. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's separated into two tiers, the segmental tier and the tonal tier. In the segmental tier, you have your segments, which are, you know, uh, consonants and vowels. Um, and on the tonal tier, you have tones. Um, and so different uh, different items on different tiers can be associated to each other, which is, shown, which is shown by what's called an association line, which is on that solid uninterrupted line there. And so um, that shows that a high tone, for example, in this example, is associated with the first vowel of the word. Um, and uh, keep in mind though, that these items don't need to be uh, associated uh, on a, uh, at a one-to-one -one rate. So they can also be, uh, they can also correspond to larger areas. So for example, this low tone associates with both the first vowel and the second vowel here. So there doesn't need to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. And this is also true of the vowels. So multiple vowels can have multiple tones. And this is how we get contour tones from before. Um, now that we understand auto segmental phonology, we can look into some uh, interesting parts of grammatical tone languages in my opinion. In my opinion. Uh, one of them being tone melodies. So tone melodies are the part of a grammatical or part of a morpheme in a grammatical tone language, um, or I think actually in tone languages in general, that is on the uh, tonal tier specifically. Um, so what's interesting about uh, tone melodies, uh, the part of the morpheme that's on the tonal tier, um, is that they can be restricted differently in different languages. So um, for example, um, in the conlang I'm creating currently, 
Um, it's still a work in progress, but uh, I'm assuming in, uh, in the final version, I'm going to have affixes take a different tone melody than um, roots. So there will be like certain restrictions on the, the patterns of tone that affixes can take versus the patterns of tone that a root can take. Um, so as an example of this in a natural language, um, the Mande Mende language of Sierra Leone um, allows four different tone melodies on nouns specifically, uh, or sorry, five different tone melodies on nouns. Um, there's, um, so I'm going to just scroll through them because, uh, you know, just so you can see what it looks like in an autosegmental view for each tone melody. And so I've shown here um, a monosyllabic uh, noun, a disyllabic noun, or a bisyllabic noun, and a trisyllabic noun. So you can see how uh, this one, these each of these tone melodies, they're the same tone melody underlyingly. So on the tonal tier, it all looks the same. However, because of the way that the uh, because of the way that the syllables are set up, because of the amount of syllables, the way that it surfaces on the surface uh, or on the segmental tier um, uh, is different for each um, each word depending on the number of syllables it has. Which basically shows that tonalities don't really care about the number of syllables that a word has. Instead, it applies the same to all syllables, which creates different uh, forms on the surface. Um, but an interesting thing to notice here is that um, in Mende, for example, it doesn't allow a tone melody of high, low, high. Um, this is just a restriction that Mende uh, uh, puts on its noun, so it just it just does not allow this tone melody. Uh, this isn't a cross linguistic thing or anything, and this just shows that uh, if uh, you know conlangers want to create a naturalistic grammatical tone language, they can put restrictions on um, the different tone melodies that uh, different uh, morphemes have. Um, Another really interesting part of grammatical tone languages is floating tones. Um, so I think the best way to describe this is by showing an example. So uh, these are two verbs from San Miguel Mixtec, which is a Mixtecan language from Mexico. So in isolation, these two verbs are pronounced the exact same. Que, both with a mid-tone on both of the vowels. Um, and so while they're pronounced the same in isolation, as you can uh, see here from the autosegmental representation, um, they differ in the tones that they have on their tonal tier. So the word eat, has a floating high tone uh, following it. So um, what this means is that um, when, when in isolation, uh, these two words may be pronounced the same. However, when adjacent to other words, they can have um, a, they can have differing effects on the morphemes that surround them. So for example, if you take the word suchi, which means child, uh, and we put the word go away in front of it, we get um, nothing super interesting. It's just how both morphemes are pronounced in um, when they're in isolation which gives us the form ke suchi. Um, however, if we instead replace the word go away with the word eat, which remember go away and eat in um, San Miguel Mixtec are both pronounced the same in isolation, uh, we get this form, ke suchi. And so as you can see here, the um, low tone that was originally on the word suchi uh, was uh, replaced or uh, disassociated from the first vowel. And instead that floating tone from ke was uh, replaced that first vowel. Um, so while these floating tones might not necessarily have an effect on the morphemes that they actually are a part of, they uh, have differing effects on their adjacent uh, neighboring morphemes. And so uh, the next section, tone rules, this is, uh, in my opinion, the most interesting part of grammatical tone languages um, because it's just so complex because at a surface uh, level, a lot of you know grammatical tone languages only have two uh, level tones. So it seems like they're you know kind of simple from an outside view, but once you look into the tone rules, it just it gets it gets very complex and it's just very fascinating in my opinion. Um, but tone rules are basically just a, a set of rules in a specific order that dictate how tones on the tonal tier um, associate and change associations with segments on the segmental tier. Um, so uh, the, a really important tone rule to first talk about is uh, at least for conlangers is the initial association rule. So this is uh, as the name implies the initial rule that associates tones with segments. Um, and so the ways that um, languages uh, first associate tones and segments um, as the first rule, it differs from language to language. Um, uh, a really interesting example is that of um, Kikuyu, which is a Bantu language spoken in Kenya and a small part of Northern Tanzania. Um, so uh, here is a verb in Kikuyu and here are all the segments and the tones in uh, an autosemental um, uh, view. Um, and as you can see here, there's no associations because we haven't applied any rules yet. So if we apply uh, Kikuyu's initial association rule, which keep in mind, this is language specific. Um, as you can see here um, in, in, on this chart, any tone here represented by a T, meaning it could be a high tone, low tone, any tone, it doesn't matter, creates a new association line shown by a dashed line. So this is a new association line is created with not the vowel that's directly above it, but above it and to the right. And when I say above it, I don't mean literally above it because obviously this is a hypothetical or this is a theoretical um, 
uh, view. Uh, what I mean is, uh, and keep in mind, this rule applies left to right. What I mean is that um, uh, the farthest left tone will associate not with the farthest left vowel, but with the farthest left and to the right one vowel. So when applied to the verb we saw earlier, we get this form. So as you can see here, the uh, the first vowel on the uh, the first tone on the left is associated with the second vowel on the left, and the second tone on the left is associated with the third vowel on the left. And so it's sort of this like shifted one um, pattern, which is really interesting. And the reason I show uh, Kikuyu's initial association rules because it's just um, it just shows that there doesn't need to be that like same uh, initial association rule where it's just you know the farthest left tone associated with the farthest left vowel. You can get really creative with the ways you associate tones and vowels. Um, and I really just think that this is an area where conlangers can get really creative with the way that they with the ways that they decide to first initially associate tones and vowels. Um, but do keep in mind that uh, um, uh, do keep in mind that oh, in this example here, um, notice that the first um, vowel here is still left unassociated. So Kikuyu has a secondary rule in which any tone here defined by uh, or shown with this symbol T uh, creates a new association line here, the dashed line, with a vowel that does not have any current associations to it. Um, so this gives us the final form, um, but th this um, this uh, initial association rule is not the most common. I just showed Kikuyu's initial association rule because I thought that it was you know unique. Um, the most common tends to be that the leftmost tone associates with the leftmost vowel and this applies left to right. But as we saw from Kikuyu, um, this is far from the only tone, uh, initial association rule that's possible. And again, this is a place where I think common language can get very creative. Um, Another uh, really interesting rule, and something that's important for conlangers to know, is uh, uh, the tone rule spreading. So the reason this is uh, important for conlangers to know about is because it's very common. It's present in a lot of grammatical tone languages. Um, and so spreading is a tone rule in which a tone will spread or create new association lines across syllables, um, either left, right, or in both directions. However, uh, the most common tends to be spreading to the right. Um, and so spreading comes in two main forms. The first being bounded spreading, in which um, a tone will spread a set number of syllables. So um, it might spread one syllable, two syllables, whatever. It's just uh, a certain set number of syllables that it will spread. Um, and that's uh, opposed to the unbounded spreading, in which a tone will, um, instead of spreading a certain amount of syllables, it will spread infinitely until a certain stopping point. And so on this chart specifically, there's two new um, notations that I think are important to talk about. Um, one being uh, on the second tones association line, um, it uh, is a solid line, but with like these two lines through it. And uh, it's it differs in, on different papers that you look at. Um, it can be these two lines through it. Sometimes it's a Z, sometimes it's an X. Uh, I just chose these two lines because I feel like it's most intuitive for me at least. Um, what that means is that an association line is, is deleted during this rule. And so the dashed line means a new association line is created, whereas the uh, the barred line means that uh, the broken association line means the one is deleted. And then the dot, dot, dot means that it uh, repeats infinitely. Um, but uh, those two are far from the only tone rules. There are a lot of them. Um, for example, plateauing, in which two tones of the same type with uh, other tones in the middle will cause those other tones to sort of assimilate to that tone, to the tones on the side. Displacement, in which a tone will displace to another um, area. Um, on a word or just in a phrase in general. Um, there's reduction in which two tones of the same type, uh, if they're next to each other, one of them will be deleted and contour simplification in which and wh where a contour tone will be uh, simplified to a level tone. And these are these are just a few that I just had to mention, some common ones that I've noticed, but there are a lot of different tone rules. And honestly, the limit here for conlangers is just creativity. Um, I'd love to see a lot of really creative tone rules um, created in grammatical tone languages. Um, but yeah, it's just a way, it's just a, a specific part of grammatical tone languages uh, that I think conlangers could really uh, shine in, I guess you could say. Um, and so the last section, which um, in my opinion is the most difficult to research is evolution. So the reason why this was so difficult for me to research at least is because there's effectively, from what I've seen at least, uh, zero cross-linguistic studies on um, how an entire grammatical tone system evolves. So there's like some uh, language specific research on specific sections of grammatical tone systems. For example, um, in some Bantu languages, um, a word final schwa 
was deleted, which caught, which left the tone behind, which uh, created floating tones. Um, so some information like that can be useful. For example, if you wanted to create a, a con line with floating tones, you could, um, you know, have a word final vowel deleted and leave the tone. Um, but for as for research on like the entire system itself evolving, there's uh, not that much research from what I've seen on that specifically. Um, uh, however, there are like small pieces like that. However, there's there's one part of um, tonal language evolution that is quite well researched, and that is um, tonogenesis. So tonogenesis is uh, the way that a tone language um, creates new contrast in its tones or the way that a non-tonal language gains tone. Um, so this is typically done where a vowel or, um, uh, or a syllable will gain uh, a certain tone when adjacent to certain consonants typically. Um, so what will usually happen is a vowel will gain you know, a certain tone next to one type of consonant and then uh, uh, adjacent to another type of consonant, it'll gain a different tone. Um, and so, and then eventually the contrast in those consonants is lost through some merger or deletion or something like that, uh, which eventually creates contrastive tone. Um, and so some examples of consonants that can create this include glottalized versus plain consonants, unvoiced versus voiced consonants, unaspirated versus aspirated con consonants, um, and geminates versus simple. However, these are far from the only. Um, there are a lot of different ways that languages do these. These are just a few of the more common ones, but again, Colonies can get very creative with the ways that they decide uh, tonogenesis to occur. Um, there are some examples of tonogen tonogenesis occurring in um, the vowels specifically, like the vowel qualities determining the tone that a, um, that a, uh, a vowel gains. Uh, however, typically it's done through the consonants that are adjacent. But um, with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Here are uh, my references. If anyone's interested in looking deeper into grammatical tone, I would highly recommend John A. Goldsmith's um, book, Auto Segmental and Metrical Phonology. Um, it, it really does a, a good job at explaining some of like the deeper um, or more intricate uh, uh, and more intricate explanation into some of the concepts I covered. Um, but with that, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. My email is on screen. If anyone's interested in uh, you know, giving feedback, comments, questions, anything like that, um, I'll be sure to respond, but thank you. Awesome, Gabriel. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, if you want to come back to just the the normal view, your your talk is generating a, a lot of conversation in the YouTube. So definitely encourage you to pop over there and be part of the conversation uh, after the question period. I haven't seen any questions come through the YouTube chat yet. More, there's a lot of people um, wondering if floating tone is the best analysis versus maybe some OT constraint or rule that would say, okay, you can't have M plus H within one rule, so it shifts to another one or you know, possible different analyses mm -hmm. that you probably can't make based on a single word or a, a single sentence. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, some really bad conlang ideas where uh, all grammatical information is the phonemes, uh, I guess, segmental phonemes, and all of the um, content semantic information is carried by tone. <laughs> I can't imagine who would do that. Um, Sydney just asked a question in the, the chat. Sydney, if you want to unmute and ask your question, you're welcome to. No, we, we can't uh, hear you. Your microphone's not picking up. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering about... Um practical sort of applications of these systems and where to start making these because I mean as an English speaker I'm not great at pronouncing tones but um just sort of what rules might be good to implement to make a tone system that feels fairly um coherent I guess um so I um what I so what I did um when I was starting to add grammatical tone to my conlang is I um looked at just like some like specific languages and like their entire grammatical tone systems as a whole. I looked at Mijikenda, which is um, a Bantu language spoken in Kenya, I believe. Um, and I basically looked at like the whole system as a whole. And like, I would probably start with first um, thinking about whether or not you want to evolve tone like through tonogenesis or if you want to have it uh, right. present in the parent language. Um, if you want to have it present in the parent language, that's what I did with my conlang, just because I feel like because then you can add like all of the complexities in the parent language and like just evolve it from there and keep it complex. Whereas like it's a lot harder to do that and like uh, with um, evolving it, given that it's probably only going to be a few thousand years. Um, 
or like a few hundred years, something like that. Um, however, what I would do is if you're starting with like a complex uh, grammatical tone uh, parent language, um, I would first start with um, uh, I would first start with the tonal inventory. So thinking, what are the level tones you're going to have? Are you going to allow right. contour tones? Restrictions on that. Um, then from there, I would think, okay, um, you know, do you want to have things like floating tones? What are the restrictions on tone melodies? Um, do you want to have like, do you want to have I don't know, certain uh, morphemes take one tone melody, a certain morphemes take another? Uh, and then from there, start implementing the tone rules after that. So um, I, uh, I've seen like uh, spreading is incredibly common. I definitely talk, think about how you're going to implement your initial association rule. Spreading very common. Um, and then just uh, what I did is I looked into um, a bunch of different like grammatical tone systems and the tone rules they use as sort of inspiration. Um, and then I came and then I was able to come up with some like creative ideas from there. Like, for example, um, uh, I saw like in some Bantu languages, I believe um, there's like what are called depressor consonants. So like um, these like some usually voiced um, obstruents, I believe. Um, don't call me on that, but um, they like tend to like lower the tones around them. So like maybe like mm. a tone, like a high tone will become a low tone next to them. So I sort of thought of the opposite idea where like an unvoiced plosive will cause um, a, a a low tone to become a high tone when uh, adjacent to it, stuff like that. So just like getting okay. inspiration from natural languages. I had built a um, a system and this was for a language that I, I did not develop it very much, but it was a tonal language in which tones would kind of spread um, to adjacent syllables if the sound between the syllables was voiced and if mm. it was not voiced um it would not be able to the tone would not be able to spread um but yeah i think that makes a lot of sense that's mm -hmm. thank you yeah uh, gabriel uh from the youtube chat aiden asked the question can you point us to an example of tonogenesis from vowel quality and i i believe they're actually mm. talking about uh creaky versus uh, breathy voice or things like that um so off the top of my mind, I believe, um, I think in some dialects of Japanese, there is interaction between like the actual height of the vowel, um, whereas like high vowels um, would gain a high tone um, in certain conditions. I have not looked super into that. That was a, that was a while ago when I saw that. But I do know in um, Cheyenne, I believe, um, an indigenous language. I'm not sure what language family it's from. Um, long vowels gained a certain tone and short vowels gain another. Um, if you want to look into um, stuff like creaky tone and like breathy voice and stuff like that and its effects on tone, um, I would highly recommend the one of the sources I provide. Um, I think it's just called Tonogenesis from the Oxford um, Research uh, or like Linguistics. Uh, oh, I forget the name of it, but uh, the title is Tonogenesis. Um, it's in my um, bibliography. I'd highly recommend that source. Um, it goes into a detail a lot about um, the different ways that tone genesis occurs. Awesome. Uh, another question from YouTube from Samuel. Is there a possibility for a language to develop a tonal syntactic quality as in tones define syntax or, or perhaps grammatical features? Um, that's a really good question. Um, in terms of syntactic features, I'm not sure, but I could see that happening. Um, I don't, I'm not sure of any specific examples, but um, some things, uh, oh, actually, maybe. Um, I think um, in some languages, like questions, like polar questions are marked by the use of different um, tonal patterns. I think so. But that honestly, you might be able to analyze some of that stuff as like a morpheme that exists only on the tonal tier, because there's some stuff like that um, where you could have like maybe like a question marker that exists in the tonal tier, because you can have also um, I didn't include this in my presentation for time. You can have like what are called privative languages where um, you have like uh, a sort of a zero tone morpheme. So the distinction underlyingly is between like a high vowel or maybe a low vowel and like um, a, a zero tone sort of. Um, which doesn't apply in the tone rules, but it can have applications like you might have like, for example, in the calling I'm creating, uh, you can have like a root, like a root noun doesn't take um, a specific tone. It, it doesn't have a tone melody inherent to the word. Instead, depending on its noun class, it takes a different tone melody. So you can have stuff like that, like the, the morpheme of the noun class sort of is exists um, on the tonal tier also for that morpheme. But um, that's a really good question. Um. 
another one that I, I see there's there's lots of questions coming in unfortunately we won't be able to get to all of them but uh Chakamau, if i'm pronouncing that correctly asked is tonogenesis in bantu languages understood i heard the consonant dependent split of tones or high tones due to lost consonants etc was characteristic of asian or even north american languages so the issue with bantu language tonogenesis is that um when, when you do like comparative reconstruction um on uh when you, when you do uh when you uh, try to reconstruct proto-bantu uh you hit a point where proto-bantu has tone also so we just kind of don't know where tone uh has come from i think in that source again that i, I mentioned tonogenesis um in that source they talk about how like uh we're not sure we're not sure exactly when um tonogenesis could have occurred in bantu languages but it was probably roughly before five thousand um years ago so um a very long time ago um so we're not really sure exactly where it comes from although there are some things like i believe i saw this one source that like um like from proto bantu low tone and proto bantu became high tone in some uh languages whereas uh high tone became low tone so there's some information on like the ways these tones have changed over time but um specifically where bantu language uh wh what happened with bantu language initial tonogenesis we're not really sure at the current moment Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate your 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 taking the time to address all this. Um, hop over to the YouTube comments because mm -hmm. uh, there are more questions coming in and and lots of discussion and probably some bad conline ideas. <laughs> all right, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is going to be Jack Kausch. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Jack looks good. Um, I'll invite you to share your, your screen and put it up to full size. Awesome. Uh, so this is going to be one of our lightning talks presented by uh, Jack Kausch, a prototype for the Art Combinatoria. Take it away. All right, so I'm going to be talking today about taking a 17th century philosophical language and implementing it uh, with modern technologies from artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, I'm working in the field of information science, so this might be a little bit different from some of the other talks that we're having here today. But I first want to talk about the source text, which is Leibniz's doctoral dissertation from 1666. Uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz is famous as being also the inventor of calculus with uh, Isaac Newton, but for his doctoral thesis, which he published when he was 20, he laid out uh, a vision for an ideal philosophical language similar to uh, the uh, works of other people in the Enlightenment, drawing on a pansophical tradition which goes back to Raymond Lull and passes through other thinkers like Bacon, Comenius, and John Wilkins, who I believe Dr. Andrew Higgins also mentioned in his talk. In Leibniz's dissertation, he describes an ideal language of pictograms, which uh, sit on a series of revolving wheels, which can be combined to create logical expressions that could be translated into any language or also represent scientific and mathematical concepts unambiguously. And if you look here in the frontispiece, you see the only diagram he really made of this language with the four uh, Aristotelian elements and the combinations of those four elements uh, represented as pictograms with some rules for which ones are contrary, which ones can be combined, and which ones can't. And so this lays out a very basic ontology that although he discusses the theory behind this language, he never actually invents it, although later in his life he would uh, claim that he had done so. Now, uh, this system consisted of two things in his mind. One was the set of pictograms, which represented universal concepts as a characteristic of universalis. Today, we would call this an information ontology, uh, but represented with glyphs. And then a device for combining ideas, a calculus ratiocinator, which is based on uh, the vavels of Raymond Lull, wheels that spin, uh, that were a user interface that existed in the history of the book. Um, now, the meaning of an expression is in his system, he describes it uh, as being based on geometry. And this is what's most important about what he was creating and what I want to convey to you today is this was an intersection of logic and geometry. So the meaning of an expression was determined based on where it was positioned relative to the center of the circle and also relative to every other glyph that existed. 
And he also describes a power series of glyphs that exist as the hierarchy evolves that increase by the powers of two. Now, uh, I basically went and took this and interpreted it. I might've made some misinterpretations of what he meant by situs and what he meant by the power series, but I created a user interface based on all of these uh, traditions that could be used in this way to represent information. So we have an ontology of hieroglyphs. These are Unicode Egyptian hieroglyphs that have been aligned with DBpedia URIs. These are uh, special uh, uh, unique identifiers based on Wikipedia articles that represent concepts that are important for the semantic web, which I will talk about later. And then you have a series of wheels that you can spin to create combinations of glyphs. And these combinations here create an expression, fire, sun, heart, pavilion. And then that's what that's the glyphs that are aligned currently right here. You can see fire, sun, and then harp and pavilion are also close by. And these have meanings that are provided by the system. These are meanings derived from the entirety of Wikipedia. Um, and as you can see, much of this uh, initial system that I created was highly, highly incoherent. And then there are also connotations based on the geometry of where the glyphs are located on the circle. Now, uh, what's actually going on behind the scene is that uh, hyperdimensional embeddings of information have been created using statistical semantic methods. So these are the methods behind chat GPT, which are very different from the formal systems that linguists use to, uh, you know, as we all know, uh, represent semantics. Uh, they're based purely on statistical occurrence of words. These are a series of embeddings I created of an ontology, um, which uh, uh, an ontology of images uh, but, okay, well, I can't actually link to these, but you can see how these are related geometrically. And the idea of the embedding is that the images that are semantically similar are located close to each other. So I took this data set and implemented it in a redesign of this uh, prototype that I showed you here to try to make the system easier to understand. So this system has fewer views and also has the op uh, fewer wheels and also has the option to allow you to select which glyphs are actually relevant and which ones should generate a meaning. And in this case, the meanings are represented by images. And I created my own font to represent these pictograms. So you can see here air, fire, earth, and water, which are also, if you remember, what was on the frontispiece to Leibniz's system. You can spin these wheels, and as you spin them, different expressions will manifest and you'll wind up retrieving different images from the data set that are supposed to be semantically linked to these uh, glyphs. And that's because there's an ontology mediating them. There also is a phonological mapping from this font, so you can type with it. It's not uh, truly phonological. I experimented with more truly phonological mappings, but I have pro this is a, a Swadesh list that I tried to map to emoji uh, and use data from about 2,000 different languages to find the most frequent occurrence of characters. But there were methodological problems, obviously, with that actually representing a real phonology of uh, lots and lots of biases in that. So what I'm working on now is also coming up with a phonological mapping between concept and uh, letters in the Latin alphabet, a pseudo phonological mapping that's easy for users to uh, type with. That's uh, ultimately the purpose of all of this. So uh, I have just a little bit longer here. So I'm just going to discuss some of the other technologies that are used here in the semantic web. Uh, the semantic web represents uh, information in knowledge graphs using the resource descriptive framework and the OWL uh, ontology web language. And the goal of this system is to use neurosymbolic computation so that logical structures and logical axioms can provide structure to the geometry that's generated by embedding spaces, which uh, are often called latent spaces, that are the kinds of spaces that are explored through uh, chat GPT. The goal of this is to give more structure and rigor to the ways in which artificial intelligences create information, but also create a new user interface for people to interact with that information and actually be able to make meaningful mappings. And that's what I'm going to be working on in the future, uh, trying to find a formalism which can unite logic and geometry. Right now I'm looking at a homotopy type theory. There are already methods that you can use to create embeddings that use fuzzy logic operators and the operators that users would have access to would be the three Boolean operators and or and not, and also the existential and the universal quantifier. And those would be the operators in the language. And then you would slot in these predicates into these operators. 
um, uh, or subjects. Uh, and then interaction, you spin the wheels uh, to create strings of information, to create expressions, and the goal is to create a grammar of interaction, which can mediate with the logical grammar. And then the final way in which people should be able to interact with this is by typing in a dedicated font. Um, so I think I went through that quicker than I expected there. That was a really, really a lightning run. Um, and I hope that that was all entirely coherent. So I'm going to pause now and stop sharing. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Um, I, I think all of us are just kind of gobstruck at the amount of work that very clearly went into that. Um, it it It's impressive. I, I, I don't know what other words to use. Um, is, is this a passion project for you or is this part of uh, like a... a academic project or? Yeah, this is uh, my PhD thesis is uh, working with a human computer interaction lab uh, here at Western University of Ontario to construct this system and then test how people interact with it. Uh, that, that's incredible. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, you know, some of the things that I would love to hear people's thoughts on are really grammar, because as I was designing this, I went into less and less of a grammatical approach and thinking more and more about semantics and logic and a little bit about phonology, but I haven't really thought as much about grammar. Um, and that's that's something that, uh, you know, lots of people here uh, were talking about, uh, I think uh, the speaker we had today on the classless grammar, uh, that was absolutely fascinating to me. Um, so things like that are things that I'm currently exploring and looking for uh, ways to represent that. That's really cool. Uh, it's going to take a minute for that to get to the YouTube to see if anything comes out of it. But I, I don't know when you were showing the images that this pulls up related to the semantic fields. This this also seemed like a telepathic language to me, which might not have a a linear grammatical string, but but broadcast images from one speaker to a, another. If I don't know if this is supposed to be a human language or an extraterrestrial language or or what that case is. But um, yeah, uh, Sai and Alex are both here today who I would consider experts in nonlinear conlangs. Uh, maybe they have ideas for grammar for you. I love the idea of a, of a telepathic language and something that's nonlinear. I, I, I love that idea. The goal of, that Leibniz originally had was that there should be uh, a you know, this should be readable by people cross-linguistically and that anyone should just be able to look at the glyphs and instantly be able to interpret them. And I mean, this is, I mean, Dr. Higgins mentioned uh, Wilkins, this is a common theme in the Enlightenment, um, uh, the, this is what they were all searching for. And one of the things I've been looking at is the ways that um, uh, people uh, in that era misinterpreted the history of writing and had uh, mistaken ideas about Egyptian and Chinese writing that led to an idea of these perfect ideograms, even though in, in reality with the Rebus principle, these writing systems also have a phonological content. So I, I, I'm sort of playing in that space of trying to see, can you create something that maybe is more telepathic and non-sequential that allows people to make those associations? Is that is that actually real or is it based on the just this complete linguistic misinterpretation of, of, of everything, basically? Um, yeah, uh, and okay, I guess we still have a, a little bit, a little bit more time. Yeah. So, uh, there was one person, uh, the Coco podcast, uh, would like to have your email, uh, in the YouTube chat, cause they would love to connect and talk about this. And there's a lot of comments about this is the best use of AI I've ever seen for a conlang, which I'll back up. I mentioned earlier how terrible AI is at conlang, but this is this is fantastic. Um, and Arika Okrent talks about uh, ideograms in her book, um, which I'm blanking on the title of, In the Land of Invented Languages, I believe. Um, I'm not seeing other questions. Uh, Alex, if if you're there, Sai is, is very busy, but if if you have any ideas for nonlinear grammar, I'd, I'd invite you to jump on.
I recognize that this is this is outside of the domain of what is usually considered conlanging. So I have come in with something that is, you know, there are some linguistic ideas in here, but like I said, I'm working in information science. So I, you know, I, I appreciate if this is uh, if this is a little bit out of left field. Um, but here I am, um, and I, I have been very inspired though by everything everyone said today because um, a lot of the a lot of the questions about grammar. Um, are things that I've been definitely struggling with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, looks like Alex is busy or, or doesn't have a, a thought at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's it's all positive reactions, even though I, I think a lot of us are just gobstruck because it's it's something that's really cool. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry that we don't have uh, a lot of concrete no. feedback for you. No, um, no. Alex might have some stuff in the the chat for you, but definitely encourage you to hop over to the YouTube as well. Okay. Oh, I saw uh, Mirabai said something really interesting. Kircher influenced Leibniz, was influenced by Lull, and totally perpetuated these ideas about Egyptian. And yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's that, as far as I know, that's accurate. Athanasius Kircher, the Jesuit, had all of these Egyptianizing uh, ideas about, about hieroglyphs that, uh, yeah. All right. Well, that's me, I guess. Um, Thank you so much, Jack. And um, because we're coming up on that season, I guess it's still a little ways away. You're a PhD thesis a student. You're you're working on conlang related material. We do have the Language Creation Society's President's Scholarship. So I think, if I remember correctly, the deadline is is December first. Um, it's you know five hundred dollars US, which you know that's like seven hundred and fifty Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. I'll fine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, yeah, Grayson is, is asking if you've checked out Bliss Symbolics, but uh, we can get back to that. Um, oh, Jack, yeah, you're there if you want to answer about Bliss Symbolics. Yeah, I've, I've looked at Bliss Symbolics, and I think what's most interesting about them is that um, I sort of, it, and Dr. Higgins mentioned this as well uh, in his talk when he was talking about uh, Wilkins, is that the problem when you have this assumption on uh, this mistaken idea of uh, ideographic writing, which uh, uh, was just mentioned uh, by Mirabai as coming from Kircher and all of these various historical vectors of influences, you think that you have to make an image for everything that exists in the world. And so you wind up with thousands of ideograms. And this is just completely impractical because there's, there's no way anyone can actually read or use that system. So I think what's interesting with Bliss Symbolics is it was an attempt on a similar line that wound up creating many, many ideograms. And while it wasn't successful for, uh, you know, as an interlingua, it's been very, very successful for people who have issues with communication and who have uh, various uh, uh, blocks or problems or have, have, have speech, uh, speech difficulties. So I think that um, that is a, is a beautiful thing. And I think that's a, another great example of how when people attempt to make these uh, these big ideal languages that are pictographic, that often what comes out of it is not necessarily what the creator originally had in mind. They wind up creating something that will be of service in a different area. So that's uh, that's been something that's inspired me thinking about this project and thinking about even failure can lead to something that's uh, that's of use to people. So, yeah, I I think I just caught something out of the side of my eye. Somebody mentioned UI and that made me think of of AUI. We were talking about that earlier with the, the Airsats Academy novel that I just uh, showed. Um, AUI does have a grammar, but it is this idea, ideographic writing system and each glyph has a, a meaning behind it. Um, it. Maybe you might want to look into that to see what kind of grammar they've used over the, the past decades. Thanks, I will. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Okay, so we're uh, about to go into another break, but I, I did wanna touch on this and uh, I know Grayson is watching, uh, he's in the YouTube chat. Grayson's gonna be the host of our Conlang Chatter Day today. Um, I know we have a lot of people joining the chat because we open this up to everyone um but the the conlang chatter day is typically advertised via the lcs members email list and on the member slack channel so of course if you want to take part in that um 
members usually get a discount to the LCC. But of course, since we're digital this year, it is a, a free conference. But if you become a member, you will also get the links for the Conlang Chatter Day that happens every Saturday afternoon uh, for me here in Calgary. That is uh, 3 p.m. You can do the time zone math on your own. And um, then you'll be able to, to engage with, with other conlangers basically every Saturday afternoon. It's just a free chat. It's a lot of fun, really cool ideas. Uh, Grayson, I hope you're listening because according to the email that I saw from Tony earlier, the Conlang Chatter Day will be taking place at the regular scheduled time, which I believe overlaps with our last two talks of the conference today. Um, perhaps you can comment on that in the YouTube or flag one of us, and uh, we'll be able to advertise that in the stream as well. So we're going to take another 10 minute break for anyone who needs it. And uh, for the speakers that are are present and coming up. Uh, I know we have our panel coming up. Uh, Mirabai had asked earlier, but maybe you weren't here. Um, please try to moderate your speaking rate. Um, she mentioned that, of course, when we start talking about something that we're really excited about, we can start talking about it really fast and get really into it. Uh, and that's, of course, very difficult for a stenographer to capture. Um, so please please try to speak with a, a, a moderated speech rate to make it a little easier for our captions. And uh, I agree, mad skills, yo. All right, so we'll take our 10 minute break and then we'll see everyone again then.
Well, welcome back, everyone. We're going to get started here in just a moment. Uh, I want to make sure our next speaker, Sydney Welsh, is here. Sydney, excellent. Hi. And we can hear you. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, so if you want to share your screen and, and make it full screen. Yes. Um, uh, where did it go? Here it is. Okay. Um, all right. Um, can you see the the screen? Yes, and it looks like all your characters are there. Um, so once again, as we're coming back, um, I just want to remind you and uh, I guess my co-presenters for the the next section. Let's try and speak with a nice steady straight because uh, mirror by night our closed capture is doing a phenomenal job uh, and as she pointed out not only doing the captioning for what we're all saying but also like taking part in the the chat and stuff which is incredible i guess she has two separate computers and keyboards going which is really cool it's pretty amazing <laughs> uh, so our next presenter, we have a, a lightning talk before our panel, Sydney Welsh. Uh, I'm going to butcher the name of your, your language here, Kolivur, uh, a study of interactions between language and culture. So I'll let you correct my pronunciation and take it away. All right. Um, probably the best pronunciation of my language's name that I've heard um, from someone who doesn't know how to pronounce it. Um, I'm going to present my language Hollywood, um, and broader concepts of conlanging and culture in the context of the language. Um, so in the first part, I want to talk specifically about my language and its phonology, grammar, and related things. Um, Hollywood is a a priori naturalistic yet artistic conlang. It's got interesting, I think, sounds and pronunciation um, and pretty roundabout chaotic phrasing. Um, had final grammar and an ideographic writing system as well as not enough words. Um, I need to coin more words. Yeah. In the next few slides, um, I'm going to describe holy grammar. Um, and then I'll talk in, uh, more, more about concepts of conlanging, specifically with irregularity um, and other systems about classifying languages. Um, the phonology um, is strange yet concise, I think. Um, it's mostly internally consistent and arguably normal compared with some of our languages. Um, some of the notable strange features are um, distinction between various types of rounding, um, protruded compressive and unrounded vowels and some back vowels. So you can see the close back vowel here has the unrounded form U, the rounded form U, and the compressed rounded form U, um, which I use a superscript Latin beta for, um, as well as the letter O also has this distinction. Um, vowels also distinguish between long and short vowels, which I indicate with the macron. Um, Weird consonant clusters, such as in this word, um, the dental approximate, r, equivalent to r, and pretty much every diphthong possible with a given vowel inventory. Um, it's got pretty complicated vowel systems, which I haven't fully described in this talk, but uh, I might be able to put some materials for them on my website. Um, this is its consonant chart. Things to note are the dental approximate that I mentioned earlier. Actually, this is I've titled this column alveolar because it has the fricatives, but um, the dental approximate as well as these lateral affricates, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, it's got some velar sounds, which are very prominent in the language, um, as well as these bilabial fricatives and postalveolar fricatives. Um, and does not have a normal, I would say, lateral, but it does have this dark L sound, which is very common in it and other related languages. Um, as for the pronunciation of those lateral affricates, they're not phonemically different, but are just incidental. 
um, slightly fricativized pre-stopped laterals. Um, loan words are a good example here. Um, the word gerud combined with the word laj creates the word gerud laj, and you can hear that that dl is pronounced um, The reason it's velarized is simply because it um, is closer to the dark l in the word laj. Um, so that's just one thing to note. I guess it's not that important. Um, as for its grammar, um, it's complex like any language, but it relies on a few systems that it implements in many constructions, like how English uses the genitive apostrophe s as a suffix. Um, it grammaticalizes few complex features and leaves them to lexical or contextual distinction. You just kind of glue words together and it works. Um, it's not really isolating, but it does not have a ton of word changes for grammatical reasons. Um, it's pretty strongly head final with mostly SOV word order and nominate accusative non-productive alignment. Non-productive just meaning that the word doesn't change because of that, but other related words might change in similar contexts. Um, the low level ins and outs are not super important, but there's a few to note. Nan nouns um, distinguish their animacy. So for some verb agreements and the word and, um, the system here is fairly simple. You just have humans and animals animate and everything else being inanimate. Um, you can have compound words, which are very common, noun, verb, noun, noun, or even verb, verb, compounds. Um, verb, verb, compounds, by the way, um, actually result in nouns as their product, um, sort of meaning the noun, the one who, verb, and also verb. Um, adjectives also have quite complicated structure. Um, they can even have things like tense and aspect and have embedded sort of um, existential clauses within them. Um, and plurals are formed from palatalization of the final consonant, um, the same way as Romanian forms plurals. Um, relative clauses and related information comes after other details, even though it's head final in other constructions. Um, and the old and middle Holy language had sort of a obsolete feature in which an adjective describing our an argument of a verb would come after the rest of the sentence. But more complicated constructions like meaning river of the gods are valid and can be used in a sentence like this below where you see which I've probably butchered the pronunciation of. Um, the word river here um, has a, the relative clause that relates to it coming after the verb um, and this is, I don't know, I thought it's interesting, um, but more complicated sentence information about various things like, um, sorry, the, um, so using various different cases and structures in one sentence is syntactically easy just because of the way that Holy constructs these forms. It leads to what English speakers would think of as run-on sentences that are kind of overcomplicated. Although most of the structure here is lexical, you don't need complicated grammatical forms of every word. The style is used predominantly in holy advertisements. Um, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about more general ideas of conlanging, though still relating it to my language. Um, and so first, I would like to talk about irregularity. Um, it's got all sorts of irregular features. The way it evolved most recently um, amid a great war sort of led to strange ways of speaking and distinction. Its dialects are diverse and only slightly intelligible to speakers of other dialects. Um, transition of features such as contractions from written to spoken language occurred in its evolution. So one of the words for this in the Ghanal, in the Ghanosh dialect comes from the word for box because a square shape was used in writing to act as a pronoun referring to an object. Um, this little box, its pronunciation would have changed depending on the context, um, like the actual word used there, but the word for box actually kind of became the pronunciation of that word in that dialect. Um, and irregularity should be in any conlang, but more important than why they're there is 
how or how they occur is why they're there. So like considering how something sounds, why does a conlang develop a given feature? Tie it to historical developments. Maybe you can make metaphors on something, right? If you phrase something in a way that's not normal, maybe that's ironic or something like that. Um, if the grammar restricts a certain structure, interesting workarounds might appear. Maybe if a specific structure implies something that's not really what you're trying to communicate, then you'll phrase it in a different way, maybe in a way that's almost sarcastic or something like that. Um, adding these sort of things will make the language feel a lot more interesting, in my opinion, and I've tried to emulate that in Hollywood. Um, this is one example of some interesting evolution. Um, you have this, these, this pre-existing word "steichnu," which has two meanings, meaning out of nothing or to quickly assemble, and these are the um, orthographic forms for it. Um, and these were in the language for a long time. And then this unrelated loan word "steichmu" showed up. And it's a loan word from the word "skachmu," um, and it, its meaning is literally the name of a type of bird. Um, and what happened during Holiv's evolution is that this word evolved to be more similar to this pre-existing word. Um, so its pronunciation changed just a little bit, and its glyph got a new form that was more similar to this. Um, glyph for Steichnu over on the left. So two homonyms caused one unrelated loan word to become more similar. Um, it's kind of back evolution or back morphology sort of things being coming similar over time um maybe having an isolated word that's unrelated to other words is detrimental to that word survival on the languages speak in general and having the word for the bird as a metaphor is perhaps useful in learning it and helps with memorizing the glyph having words become related is maybe a interesting uh, process that happened there um, and this brings me to writing systems. As you can see, Holiv has a ideographic writing system, which I um, used in the title slide for this presentation. Um, often I sort of make writing systems for every language that are kind of unrelated to one another and are completely independent. And while it's super fun to do this and make fancy looking fonts and everything, um, having not every language have its own writing system is an important thing to do, I guess. Um, I usually make phonetic writing systems with the main complication being sounds having multiple glyphs and or several distinct sounds being merged into one glyph, but adding spelling irregularities is important too. Holy itself uses an audiographic writing system called Hond Tsunshinge, um, which is comprised about of about 300,000 characters. Of course, I don't know them all, but I've sort of made estimates based on how many characters it takes to say specific things. Um, and they're comprised of about 460 radicals combined in many different ways. They're not just stacked on top of each other, but really integrated in a more interesting way, I think. Um, and I think it interacts with pronunciation and grammatical irregularities. Um, and putting irregularity in writing is a really interesting thing, in my opinion, to do. Um, that was basically all, I guess. That was a pretty fast talk, maybe. Um, but I think that irregularity has a lot deeper meaning than most language creators really think it does. It's a complex concept um, that relates language to culture and makes making it a feature rather than a bug will make your reference grammar so much more fun to skim through, make translated passages feel much more real. Um, I, I certainly know that having rigid grammatical rules doesn't make a language feel real. So if you're going for a naturalistic approach, it would be it's really interesting to put irregularity in there. Um, but have irregularity be part of a system, not just this word happens to have this is its form instead of what it should be. Right. Not just complicated, broken plural forms or whatever, but really having a reason for that. Maybe irregularity inside regularity. Um, and so for Hollywood, I tried to step into the minds of the speakers, emulate a system of language that's more than just naturalistic or realistic, but it should feel immersive as well. And that I think is the most important thing to understand about making a good language, um, making it immersive.
And I think that's basically it. Thanks so much, Sydney. That was really cool. There's uh, there's some praise on the YouTube chat, although I think um, there was a, a little bit of a delay. Some people had to refresh, so they might not have seen your talk the first time around. But like we said earlier, everything's being recorded so that people can come back to it and, and engage a little bit. So I will encourage you to hop over there uh, a after this and, and engage in the YouTube chat. But one question I had, I, I don't think you said this, um, Clearly, you you did a deep dive on the language. You have um, barely mutually intelligible dialects already coming out of this. You've built in this irregularity, which is awesome. Um, there's some comments that we love how the the language sounds. But what was your inspiration, or or how did you figure out who was going to be speaking this language, and and where did that come from? That's a that's a great question. I think that it evolved a lot from the culture. Um, because what I was doing was essentially I had been making a lot of various different like designs and things that would require to have like a writing system, for example. And so I slowly sort of built it up. I think that it was inspired a lot off of various um, European languages. I could go more in depth about specifically what its phonological inventory was inspired by. But um, I was just trying to play with various systems that I, I didn't think had been done very much in earth languages and making a a language that felt real enough but it was definitely interesting in terms of some of the things that it did um and i think that a lot of it just arose out of the the culture i guess behind the language um great various great big empires and large cities and things i i made um a few sort of pigeons or similar dialects of um of Holiv that merged with other languages um, and changed the pronunciation. Um, but yeah, I think it was mostly just out of the developing the culture, a language sort of arose. And it wasn't my first language, but it was sort of one that slowly was built over time and keeps changing. Um, but I think it was a lot of things, mostly just wanting to be able to have a more solid groundwork for creative stuff having to do with the language and the culture. Awesome. Uh, a related question from Jan van Stiebenbergen. Uh, I'm curious about the place where this language is spoken in your imagination. Could you please elaborate on you know, where it's spoken? Yeah, so um, the Kholiv language is sort of the official or main language of the new Kholiv Empire, which is a large empire spanning the continent of Lakunjol. Um, and it is a the the language spreads through the the um the region it's like a it's sort of sort of a main language um although it's not very present in other places um very quickly as you go into uh less i guess d out of cities and things you um a lot of other languages start to appear and that leads to various different dialects the um the area of the continent itself has a lot of mountain ranges, um, forests, um, and things, but also very large um, cities, um, and a lot of trade um, interaction with related and warfare um, and interactions with other groups. I wish that I had a um, a map of this that I could, I the map I'm making is downstairs. I'll put um, this link here to the page where I was gonna post about my presentation. I'll put various resources about the world and stuff there and notes for questions that are hard for me to answer without visuals. But um, yeah, um, no, that's, that's a large great. empire um, with a lot of different dialects of the language being formed through trade and warfare and various other things. Um, and the writing system is almost used as a symbol um, in the like a lot of flags or designs have the writing system on them, as well as artwork and posters and stuff. The writing system sort of because it looks a lot like, in my opinion, things. I mean, um, you can see from this slide here, the glyphor person looks like a person almost. Um, it is used sort of as a symbol of the language or of some concept depending on the glyph but it's also got phonetic elements 
Awesome. Uh, thank you so much once again, Sydney. Um, there was an additional question about uh, your vowel rounding distinctions and things like that. So I do encourage you to hop over to the YouTube and continue yeah, the I'll chat see, now. I'll see what I can do there. Um, I think, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen. Yeah. But thank you for hearing my presentation. Also nice shirt. Oh. <laughs> my other language is a con line. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Jamin and Margaret to unmute and start their cameras. Margaret, Jamin, good to see you. Margaret, I know it's early for you. Oh, not too early. It's only 9.30. Oh, okay. Yeah. The conference started very early for you. I know. I was going to try to wake up at 5.30 and then it didn't happen, so... <laughs> well, as Sai has been uh, broadcasting on the YouTube channel, all the talks are being recorded and segmented out. So if there's something that catches your interest, you can go back to it. I will. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview for the the YouTube audience and I guess the, the Zoom audience. Um, our panel today is getting jobs from the hashtag jobs member Slack channel. And of course, shameless plug, if you want access to the members only hashtag jobs channel, you have to become a member of the LCS. Uh, a few years ago, and I, I want to say uh, four or five years ago now, uh, we decided to make jobs a almost privative member perk of being a member of the LCS. And so what we do now is when we receive a job request, um, we post it directly to a members only forum for a period of 10 days. If after the end of the 10 days, a conlanger hasn't been found for that particular job, then we'll post it to a public forum. And since we've started doing that, we have never posted a job to a public forum because 100% uh, of those jobs have gone to various members. So the people on the panel today, uh, I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit more, but I'll, I'll talk about why I asked them to join me. Um, I myself, as president of the LCS, I get all of the job requests. I negotiate with the posters uh, to talk about what our minimum prices are, um, what they can reasonably expect. I was speaking about this earlier. If, if they want a $10 conlang, they're going to get a $10 conlang, which will be completely unusable. Um, and if they want a multi-thousand dollar conlang, they're going to get um, a very good product, uh, if I do say so myself. Uh, prior to becoming president, uh, I received a few of the jobs from the conlang board, so I know a little bit of what that process is. I've, I've done a number of professional conlangs for various fantasy works or tabletop games. Uh, Jamin and Margaret are also professional conlangers, and uh, without going into details unless they want to go into it themselves, they have been very successful at getting jobs from the, the conlang board, so they, they know something that they're going to share with all of y'all um, and therefore make less profit themselves because they're going to give away their secrets. <laughs> um, Margaret, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, yeah, so my name is Margaret Ransdell Green, as you can probably see in the Zoom window. Um, I am a, a linguist by day. Uh, I got my PhD from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And uh, yeah, so my background is in linguistics, and I've been doing professional conlanging on the side for, oh, uh, since I want to say 28 teen so not a super long time but you know long enough now that I've done several jobs for people of all types and most of them though not all have come from the jobs board of uh, LCS so I've done languages you know my own conlings are um, of a certain nature they're a priori um, fictional languages um, meant to sort of go in tandem with world building. But for my clients, I've built 
you know, a wide variety of other languages of all different types. So that's basically where I'm coming from here. Thank you. Uh, I am going to take one question that I saw here from Miles. How immediate is the turnover to get access to Slack and the members only content? Uh, I guess now's as good a time to any to say, we are currently transitioning between membership managers and Jamin, who is joining us, will be our uh, former and current uh, membership manager, probably by the end of this weekend. So Jamin, what's what's your normal timeline after you get the membership email and Grayson confirms that the, the fee has been paid? Uh, it's, uh, is this on, here we go. Um, Usually it's it's pretty quick. I uh, generally I well I, I haven't got my process down yet again, but uh, if, if if I end up doing it the same way I have done, um, usually about two or three times a week I'll just go through and process all the requests. So it's it's usually max a couple of days, but um, when I uh, if, if if I see it coming in and I have the right page open, it takes a few seconds. So. Yeah. Um, so I guess I, before I ask you to introduce yourself, uh, I, I will say there are no current jobs open, so you, you don't have to rush from that standpoint. And uh, we do ask any job posters to leave their ad live for at least three days to give people a chance to respond. Um, so membership aside, Jamin, if you want to introduce yourself and why you're here. Uh, sure. Hi, I'm Jamin Johnson. I am the once and future membership manager, <laughs> and uh, I've been I've been conlanging for close to th well, pro probably about thirty years altogether, but um, doing it in a, a, a in a more professional capacity since about um, in in two thousand fourteen, I took over a conlang that had already been created uh, called Brooding for the Riddles Brood Touring Theater Company. And that was through the LCS Jobs Board. And uh, we worked together to continue to expand on that language. And since then I've uh, I've done, I've worked for about 10 other um, authors and graphic novelists and, uh, and other people needing conlangs for the various things you need conlangs for. Um, and uh, I'd say about pr probably about three quarters of those have come from the jobs board also. Um, uh, let's just, sorry, I had a whole thing in my mind and then I got it got off track on membership and now I don't remember who I am or what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but my, my background is also in um, in linguistics. Uh, my my personal conlangs, I, I tend to do, some uh, a fair number of a priori conlangs, but I also do a few a posteriori conlangs, which are not really something that show up on in in jobs very often because people want you know fictional settings, obviously. Although uh, last year I did have a chance to do an a posteriori lang uh, uh, language for a fictional romance language spoken by vampires. That was kind of exciting too. So. Um, yeah, and so, so altogether, I've done about uh, I want to say about seventeen conlangs uh, over the course of the last ten years. Um, awesome. Um, so we have a couple of uh, pre-prompted questions that we'll try to work through while the the YouTube catches up because there is it's a little asynchronous um, and. Hopefully people will ask some of their own questions as well. Uh, kind of to start, our first question was, what are posters on the hashtag jobs channel looking for? And so I'll, I'll give a little bit of statistics from an institutional point of view. Um, the first job I posted, because I keep track of, of these things during my tenure as president was uh, February 6, 2019, uh, shortly after I took over uh, from Christoph. Um, and since that time, we have posted 40 jobs uh, to the jobs board. Uh, we're only we're not even halfway through 2023 yet, so that's greater than 10 per year. 
We did notice there was a spike in 2020, 2021, um, corresponding with the, the pandemic when people were probably doing more fictional writing and trying to stay sane. And we have seen a little bit of a, a decline since then. But these jobs are all over the board. Um, so just looking at a couple of things here, there was um, actually there's a lot that say full con lang for a novel series. Um, there's relax and translation for a short film, um, sketch lang for a novel, three con langs for a novel series and orthographies, uh, and abjad digitization. Uh, we've had a couple of people posting for con lang mentors, um, complete an existing con lang, adaptation for an English poem, a uh, few naming languages in here. But our People that come to the LCS for, for conlang work, um, with the exception of when HBO approached us in, I want to say that was 2008, and David Peterson got the, the job to do Dothraki, our posters tend to be independent artists, and I use the capital A artists, so novelists, game designers, things like that. Um, tend to be lower budget, although we have worked with HBO, we have placed people for Amazon Prime Studios. Um, I wanna say there was another studio that contacted me last year, but um, frequently when a studio contacts me, they they have someone specific in mind that they wanna be put in touch with, or they, they ask me for specific recommendations because they're not willing to go through the full hiring process a lot of the times, but um, Margaret, from your experience, um, especially the the jobs you've been successful with, what what are posters looking for? What what makes them choose you? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think some of the reason is that I have a lot of I have have a way to display what I've done in the past pretty easily, so clients can see that I have a fully. Um, fully populated website um, of iNeath.com where I have all of my personal conlang work as well as world building work. And a lot of times what clients are looking for, especially when they're looking for like a fictional language for a novel or something like that, or even graphic novel, whatever it is they're making, they're looking for a language, yes, but also something that um, is representative or indicative of a particular cultural vibe that they're going for. And so having that world building experience is really helpful because I can come to them and say, look, I know exactly what you need. I have constructed a lot of artificial cultures in the past as well as languages. And there are, you know, um, things that clients are looking for when it comes to individual languages like they want some particular type of aesthetic. And sometimes they don't necessarily know what that is, but they will give me a few adjectives and it's kind of my job to look at what they're saying and make an educated guess about what they probably want and then give them an example and say, is this what you meant? And then they'll either say yes or no. And so I think the world building background as well as the sort of having a very like easy to navigate portfolio in the form of the website has been helpful for me um, in showing people um, you know, what I'm capable of. Um, so that's at least one thing is having your portfolio easily navigable and easily like visually accessible to people, um, I think is one thing that really helps out a lot. And I, you know, created that website years and years ago before I ever started doing this professionally. So it was just kind of right there as an obvious tool for that. I, I agree. I do the same thing. I, I send them a link to my website, which does not have a fraction of what my conlang stuff is uh, and we'll get to a question yeah. of ndas and copyrights later but a lot of my work is still under nda yeah, uh, jimin anything you wanted to add to that um yeah i i pretty much do the same thing um i also i have a sort of ever-evolving portfolio of samples that uh that i add to and one of the things that once I kind of learned a little bit more about contracts and things like that, I work into all my contracts that I, even if I don't release anything publicly about your language, I can use a sample of it in my portfolio as a sample. So I have that sort of evolving document that I can send, um, especially for uh, for scripts. Um, I, I think scripts 
even more than language tend to be a little bit more ephemeral in terms of what authors think they're looking for and they don't really know but they'll know it if they see it and so if there's a good range of scripts in there they'll see something and say oh wait that's that's what i want there do something like that um whereas a, a lot of times i think um i think they tend not to be looking for anything specific in the applications that they get they're just kind of looking for something that rings that bell of whatever it is they have in the back of their minds because they don't really know what question to ask so the the, the more you can present them with the more they can uh the more they can relate to uh, before we go to our first question, Margaret, you brought something up that that makes me think of something I I do in that that very first client meeting every time they they give us a couple of adjectives like, I want my my language to be melodic or I don't want my language to be harsh or I want it to be harsh and guttural and of course we were talking about Arabic as a quote unquote scary language for many English speakers you know based on sounds and things like that, but the the one of the very first things I find is. Um, a client who who probably doesn't have a linguistics or a, or a language background, that's why they're coming to us, will say, I don't want any of those harsh <sighs> sounds. Uh, I want it to be very melodic. And I say, okay, this is one of my favorite poems. You tell me if this is the melody you're going for. Um, which is an Irish poem. And if I remember correctly, there's 26 velar fricatives uh, in that poem. And they're like, oh yeah, that's beautifully melodic. It, you know, it doesn't have any of those harsh sounds. I'm like, eh, actually it has a lot of them. So <laughs> um, yeah. Logan was asking, it's the presentation, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's how you wrap it together. Yeah. It's also um, cultural associations with different languages. So <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Uh, Logan was asking, uh, what materials do you specifically put in your portfolios? And maybe I'll, I'll give Jamin the chance to answer first on this one. Uh, sure. Um, I, like I said, I have sort of a running portfolio document and I try to pick a short text that can really highlight the, the script. If there is one, there's not always a script. Um, and also some of the, the major phonological themes. And I'll usually also uh, make like a, a little YouTube video or, or Vocaroo recording of that script so that they can hear that in real time um, alongside the, uh, the text. Um, that's, that's the main thing. I, I, I think the main thing is to try to keep as, as wide a diversity of different um, different languages available as possible so that, you know, maybe one of them is going to strike the right chord. Um, I've been, it, it's, it's an ongoing process trying to uh, find the right balance between too much information and not enough information, because I think, um, you know, as interesting as it might be, uh, no potential employer wants to read your grammar, <laughs> but you still have to give a little bit so that they know that you at least have one. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's getting to a, a good point now where I have a balance of that. After 30 years or so of working on it, right? Yeah. yeah. Margaret, is there anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah. So in terms of what I send in my portfolio, I, I have a resume that's specifically tailored toward conlangs and linguistics. Um, I guess you could say it's more specifically um, tailored toward conlanging, but with my linguistics is, is in there too. Um, and so I send that. I send links to all the things I've done. I've also sent links to examples of the music I've written because that seems to interest people a lot. Um, when they, I've had some clients say that they're looking for something that is usable in poetry or music. And I've done a lot of that. So I usually send links to that. And then I also just show them um, the website and I kind of guide them to different pages that might be more helpful for them to read. Like maybe not the nitty gritty of the morphosyntax if they don't really want to look at that. But uh, like Jimin, I have like a document where I have for languages that are not under NDA, I have like examples of them and what I did for the person, for the former client, 
what um, what were the outcomes of that and what sort of an example of that looks like and what the purposes were, like were they using it for books or things like that. But yeah, most of my stuff is still under NDA. So I can always, um, I didn't think of adding that to the contract is that you can reserve a sample size to show people. That's a really good idea. I think I might add that to my contract. Oh, and then, yeah, I have a contract that I use that I give clients because you never know. And it's always better to be in a contract than just willy nilly, not getting paid any kind of BS like that. So I think that you in these situations need to protect yourself as much as possible. And you don't have to assume the worst out of people, but you just have to have, it's a really good idea to have that contract ready. Even if they have a contract too, you can have yours. So if they sign it, you're safe. (laughs) And thinking about what to put in the contract, um, I think is really important. Um, So that's kind of another issue um, is contract building, which is a broader skill, I think, but I've used it in other kind of side gig stuff I've done. So it's always served me really well and kept me from ever not getting what I went into wanting, (laughs) essentially. Yeah, definitely recommend that. And we can, we can certainly talk about contracts. Um, I think my approach, approach has been a, a little different. And I think one of the the key, very essential things I communicate to a potential employer when I when I first talk to them, um, especially like if it is a posting on the the jobs board that people are attuning to, I always find something in that post that I can personally relate to, whether that's, you know, I want a, a Celtic lilt to this. Uh, I'm an Irish speaker. I'll I'll bring that up. I'll I'll make that connection. Um, I had one job where somebody wanted me to make uh, an Elvish language, and then combine that with Middle High German to make a a common tongue to be spoken as a as a daughter language. And I said, you know, my my German is absolutely terrible, but I do have a lot of books on on Middle High German, and I've done I've done some research in historical linguistics, and you know, I really appreciate this challenge. It's something I'm I'm personally motivated in, and I I think it's a really cool idea to blend languages like that. So I'll I'll put that in sort of that welcome letter. Um, on my website that I, I send people for my portfolio, um, I have an example. I tell them I always make essentially two grammars. I make a backend grammar that's just for me. It's super jargon. It's super linguistics. It's got my tree diagrams and stuff like that. And then I'll make a more user's guide one. Um, so I think um, Tejos is my language that has the the super jargony um, one. And I also have Dala, which I've used in a couple of the conlang relays. And the entire reason I invented that language, even though I'm using it in Dungeons and Dragons now, was I wanted to have a public facing grammar that I could show potential employers. And it is the full grammar, like Jimin was saying, maybe people don't want to read that, but it, it has, this is what a noun class is. This is what person is. This is how you use these things in a sentence um, and things like that. I have a couple of clips, um, one audio video clip from a language that I'm pretty mortified to have out there because it was a kitchen sink first con line terrible. Um, and another one that I think is me doing the the intro to Star Trek The Next Generation in um, Lani Kitsarai, uh, I think probably my second con line, uh, and a couple of pictures of, of an orthography and some con line artifacts and things like that. Um, and another, I, absolutely, Jimmy, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and I, I, I would say, you know, most authors don't want to read your grammar, but they should have the option if, if if it's available so that they can open it up and say, oh, never mind. <laughs> or they can read it if they want. Yeah. Um, Miles asked the question, how often will a client require the language to be spoken versus written versus both? Uh, Margaret, what's your, your experience? Mm. Most of the time, people are looking for a language that is going to be used in a written medium, like a book or something. Um, I have gotten, um, I've worked with clients who were using spoken language, but they never didn't want it to be written down. So they wanted it to be written down like, um, well, probably because we were mostly communicating by writing anyway. Um, it would be weird if I just only sent recordings for them. Um, 
I've never had somebody who wanted it to be spoken and not written at all. So, yeah. I think that was very similar to the to David's experience with Dothraki. Dothraki isn't a written language, but it had to be written in order to be able to communicate it to the actors, to the producers. So the, yeah. that component needed to be there, even though the Dothraki people didn't have a, a writing system. Uh, Jamin, you have a, a different experience because you've worked with theater. Uh, what do you think on that question? Um, I, th I think most of the languages that I've worked with, uh, same thing. It just uh, it's just written and not very much spoken. But the the language that I did with the theater, brooding, um, yeah, it, it, it's uh, it, it's a whole range from written in a style that can be like set decoration that you don't know it's actually writing. Um, up to uh I, I at one point i was driving out to the theater and and teaching uh these little kids dressed as elves how to sing in an alien language which was uh which is always a lot of fun um so yeah that that language in particular really runs the gamut of uh um the the scripts and the sounds and uh spoken written everything in between um for the most part, though, it, it's uh, it it tends to be written, and especially for the more visual media like uh, graphic novels and comics, it's also uh, has a lot to do with the script. Um, the the uh, the glow comic from Mythopoeia that I work on, actually, it's MythWorks now as of yesterday. Um, uh, they they use the script from uh, the glow language Nimarin as like you'd see in anime, you'd see uh, uh, Japanese characters for sound effects or something that might not necessarily be translated. They use the the Nimarin for that instead, which is kind of fun. So it's it, it's got to be a much more visual, uh, impactful. Oh. So like for the idiophones, essentially, that um, appear like when it's something meant to indicate some kind of nonverbal state or situation. And so right, they're like, using them like yeah, that. Like That's glam really cool. or yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, shing or something. Yeah. Or even things that don't naturally have sound in, in real life, like staring, mm -hmm. like the sound of stare. Anyway, that's very uh, cool. Yeah. William Annis has been making a, a couple of comments in the YouTube chat. Of course, he's he's worked on a video game con Lang and says uh, studios often want the grammar, not because they're interested in it or will use it, but because they paid for it. So they want it. Um, and also um, having full documentation is useful if you are perhaps not able to continue your work for some reason and it needs to be expanded in the future, which I, I think was the case of brooding, wasn't it, Jamin? It was um, for brooding and Nimarin. I, I basically assumed their uh, parenting <laughs> of the languages at a certain point. And uh, yeah, it, it was it was very helpful to have uh, grammar. Uh, available for that i i tend for most um it, it depends on the contract but for, for most languages i tend to create uh like you said a formal grammar more for myself than anything and then i do more of a sort of primer style for the authors so that it you know it can go through and explain this is what an object is this is what a genitive is in, in a in a more approachable way than uh than you're going to see from my ugly glosses and stuff in my <laughs> yep. my formal grammar uh Chukamau asked uh what types of things do people want to see and i think we're kind of touching on this already uh phonologies phoneme charts grammars sound samples only text and sand samples no grammars um i i include everything i make everything available um people might know from my previous LCC talks, I, I do um, something called the contrast of hierarchy and phonology behind the scenes. I don't necessarily share that, but I will share like a phoneme to orthography chart, a phoneme chart. Um, I, I use a templatic morphology slash syntax so they can just kind of plug and play with words and things like that. But I find frequently authors that I work with will want me to record a couple of the words or sentences and send them the recording because as much as I can tell them this corresponds to this and here's a link to the, the spoken IPA chart where you can click on each of these individual sounds, 
they want to hear at least my pronunciation of these words, especially if I'm naming characters for them. Um, and they want to go, yeah, that sounds like the character I had in mind or uh, no, you're not quite there. Um, do either of you include, not include those things or, or have other services that are just kind of helpful for your clients? Whoever wants to answer first. Uh, sure. I, um, I, I think I tend to do the, the same. I, I uh, include a, a range of things so that, uh, because every every client is looking for something a little bit different. Um, and usually the script is the main thing. Uh, sounds are the main thing. Um, how easy is it to type if it's going to be uh, something that's going into a novel? Do I have to create, use any special characters, things like that? Um, but uh, it, it's it's hard to tell what's going to resonate with one person versus another. So I, I like to have a, a good selection. Um, yeah, that's definitely true. Um, I think that a large part of this um, business, is, in a sense, is just getting a sense of what a person actually wants and expects and needs. And sometimes they don't even know that. And so you have to figure that out. And that I think is kind of its own, um, I guess, skill or something. Um, trying to figure out what they want or expect and giving them that in the way that is easiest as possible for them to, um, to use and to um, understand. And so, like you said, like you could send all kinds of things. I, at the end, I send them everything. Um, but like you said, I do try to tailor the grammars for people to be able to actually use them. And so I think having kind of a bit of a teaching background helps me with that because having taught languages and linguistics before, like I'm pretty good at anticipating what's going to be confusing for people or not. And especially after I meet the client a little bit, I can kind of gauge their background and their kind of, you know, uh, what would, what would mesh best with that person. Um, but it, it is pretty individualized at the end of the day. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, so we do have to get into the, the legal aspects a little bit. Um, you both already brought up contracts and we said we talk about NDA and things like that. So uh, I know Sai has already posted the link in the YouTube chat. If you're interested on the LCS's stance on our Conlang's copyrightable, short answer, no, they're not. Um, we, we do believe that Conlang's are systems which are not able to be copyrighted. Um, certainly works in Conlang's can be copyrighted. Um, so if there is something, those instances of the Conlang in the work or, or that work that is entirely in a Conlang can be copyrighted, but the, the grammar is something, it's a, it's a system that can be used and that's what allows fans to, to learn not V and go out and speak not V or, or Klingon or Dothraki or any of our Conlang's as well. Um, I find a lot of clients really do want an NDA and I've not been smart enough to build in Jamin's clause that says, oh, I can use a piece of it. But what I always build in, and it's, it's not quite as good as Jamin's idea, um, is that I can be given permission to use it. Uh, so I have a lot of conlangs, uh, that are still under NDA. Um, because the books are still being written and they're self-published or things like that, or being self-published, I should say. But for example, um, the last Lexember, this this last year, I used one of my conlangs that's still under NDA. And I, I contacted the client and said, man, I did so much work creating a syllabary for this language with, I think, like 370 glyphs or something like that. I would really love to showcase that writing system for Lexember. And it worked out because they had just asked me, hey, I need these extra, I think it was something like 40 words or something like that in the language. I'm like, well, you can get it for free, those extra 40 words, if you let me post uh, about this language in Lexember. And it was no problem. Um, I also frequently ask, you know, I'm doing this presentation or I'm doing that presentation. Can I include examples from your conlang? And they're typically really cool about letting me talk about the background linguistic work or or showing a little bit and and give credit for where that language is going to appear in the future. Um, and and like you, I always, you know, 
11th commandment, cover thine ass, use a contract. Um, I've never seek, sought legal counsel on how enforceable my conlang contract would be, but I, I think it covers the, I will deliver by this date, you will pay me this much on this date. Um, these are the expectations of both the client and the conlanger, um, signature, address, all that stuff. And knock on wood, I have yet to be stiffed. Uh, maybe Margaret, what what are your thoughts on NDAs, contracts, copyrights? Yeah, so I created my own contract um, based on some other um, services I used to provide as sort of a freelancer, and it has gone well so far. I mean, I've haven't professionally engaged a lawyer to check on it, but I've showed it to my law school buddies. I don't know if that counts. But anyway, um, yeah, I they, usually it's the client who has their own NDA, and I'll read over that and usually have no problem signing that. Um, the contract is, this, like you said, this, the simplest kind of core of it is making sure everything is super clear about what each person gets and when and how much. Um, and you can go back to that. Like if someone's not paying you on time, you can go back and look like, here's the timeline we agreed on. Where's my money? And I've done that to people before and they paid up. So I don't know if it's legally enforceable, but it sure helps me. Um, so um, I think having a contract also in a sense legitimizes you a little bit because it's, you know, something that professionals have to worry about. And so that's, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing to have at least, or to start thinking about. I, I would say uh, largely the same. I kind of developed my contract from um, I uh, just the the bare, bare minimums that I would put uh, put together. Um, and every every job that I've had since then, I've added a little bit to it and changed the wording a little bit. And it, I think it's a, a pretty solid one now. I have sort of a bare bones NDA in my contract, which is basically like. I'm not going to give away your trade secrets. If you have more to say about that, insert here. <laughs> and uh, uh, then I just, um, and and the little bit about, and I can use a little chunk for my portfolio. So um, yeah, like another that. thing that I have worked into the last few, um, which might be a little sneaky of me, I don't know, is uh, I worked in a section that if, um, that, that once the, the, book that the conlang is being provided for has been published i'm able to talk about it unless they explicitly don't want me to do that um or after a period of two years and i added that period of two years because there are a few languages that we created and then we're, we're still working on them years and years later <laughs> and i'm like but i want to talk about it it's so good so um at a, I, I added that two year uh, clause to that as well. I'm going to start but, doing that. Yeah, I've I've also never had to try to enforce one, so I I don't know how that yeah. works, but hopefully it's fine. I've I've also got some law school friends who said it seemed reasonable. So I actually based my contract the the very first conline gang I had, um, and I think this was before I got involved uh, majorly in at LCC seven. Um, the the client was a, a lawyer in, I, I believe, Florida, and he sent me a contract for the work I would do for him. And I went, oh, this is really simple. I'm just going to take this, make it my own, change things around as I need. Um, yeah. But it was, I, I, I find like, like Margaret already said, it is so much more helpful to have it in your back pocket and put it up front. Here is my contract. If you want to build in X, Y, and Z, there are spaces for that, like like Jamin was saying. Um, but don't wait for the client to give you a contract. Have one that you already are very familiar with the language and, and have that ready to go. Uh, there's a somewhat indirect question, but I'm going to morph it into what we can what we are speaking about. Uh, Sammy Seal Seven asked. I'm in high school at the moment, and I was wondering which university course and things like that I should do to get into conlanging. Um, this is one of 
the most frequent questions I get as as president and irrespective of jobs, do you need a degree in linguistics to get into conlanging? And no, you don't. That's the end of the conversation. Uh, moving on. No, um, <laughs> I do find like like Margaret, my PhD is in linguistics, and that probably helps me when I can say, you know, you have a PhD linguist working on this for you or things like that. But some of my favorite conlangs are from people with absolutely no formal training in linguistics or language or literature. They're they're just passionate conlangers and they've picked up grammars and books and learned things and you know, went from the heart. So you don't need that. But uh, Sammy, if, if you're still watching the stream, uh, Jesse Sams has a Fiat Lingua article, fiatlingua.org, uh, where she outlines, might be a little outdated now, but all of the courses that have or were being taught at universities on constructed languages. Um, and I, personal bias, I, I think a degree in linguistics is going to help you, but take that for what it's worth. You don't need it. But if you are interested in conlanging you could go that route i should also put the caveat that there has been exactly one person in history who has made their entire professional career about conlanging and i think the rest of us kind of do it off the side of our desk uh, because we're passionate about it and hey a couple extra dollars isn't gonna hurt um i'm gonna ask uh, jamin to start this one because he's not a phd linguist and also a very successful conlanger Anything you would recommend to somebody who who wanted to follow suit? Um, you know, it's it's funny. There seems to be a weird bell curve about uh, conlang quality and formal education. It, it seems like there are a lot of people who have no linguistic training, whatever whatsoever, who have a really good sense about how they want language to work, and they can create some amazing conlangs, and then. As you're getting into learning about linguistics, you start doubting everything you thought about language, and the more languages you learn, the more confused you get, and it it really drops off for a while there while you convince yourself that you don't know anything about anything, and then gradually as you learn more, it starts to go up that other side. So really, um, if you know nothing about language and you're good at it, then... <laughs> keep it up. But um, but no, really, it, it does help to uh, know at least a lot of the terminology. And, and so you can follow uh, things like the LCC and learn new tips and tricks. Um, and also, you know, you, you learn what what can't be done or what shouldn't be done, and then learn how to do it anyway. Um, so th th that would be that would be my main thing. Um, Learn, uh, learn IPA, learn phonology, um, and and then a, a lot of the rest is is more decorative and theoretical. Uh, I, th I think once once you've got phonology, morphology, then then the rest is decorative. So, Margaret, anything to? Um, no, that. Uh... That uh, makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, obviously, I'm biased by my own personal experience. So the way I got into conlanging and the way I got into linguistics were the exact same like path in life. I started conlanging, and then that actually led me into linguistics. But I was a child, so that was a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, I don't. I definitely think that you don't need formal training to be able to make cool conlang. Um, it does help to like give yourself those basic tools of terminology and like, okay, this is basically how language tends to work in reality. And then you can bend those rules as you see fit. Um, but it is a lot less confusing if you go in with at least an understanding of the basics. And you can get that nowadays, of course, from the internet. Um, but there's books and stuff you can you know, pick up intro to language or linguistics, and that's going to help you a lot more than, you know, having absolutely nothing. But yeah, but like both of you have said, I don't think it's a necessity. But I think, I guess, for me, the two are so intertwined that it's hard to separate them. Yeah, theoretical linguistics is is my backbone for doing conlangs. Like I, I go through the motions of drawing syntax trees and phoneme trees and things like that. But yeah, I, I imagine somebody with a, a keen eye or ear 
um, could do just as well without the theoretical background. Jamin, sorry, I think I cut you off. You're about to say something. Oh, no. Um, I was just going to say, I, I had a music theory teacher uh, who once told me after I had broken some egregious notation rule that I didn't know existed, um, told me that the, the rules are much more fun to break once you know what they are. Yeah, that's a good generalization. Sounds like jazz. Yeah. Uh, Jan asked, has any of you ever accepted a job and then kind of lost contact with the employer? Um, I have lost contact with the employer after completing the job, getting paid for it. And they say, okay, I'm going to let you know what translations I need for the book. It's been five years since then. <laughs> yeah. um, hope they're doing well. Hope they're using the language. Um, I know one person on the jobs board was talking about getting completely ghosted, supplied the language, never saw a dime. I don't know if they had a contract. I don't know if it's enforceable. Um, I have stepped in and I have emailed the employer out of the only contact information I had three or four times, but they also ghosted me in the process. I didn't even know somebody who had actually been hired. I kept emailing saying, hey, do you want this to go public? Have you found someone? Can I mark it as filled? And I never heard anything back. I didn't even know the position got filled until like two years later. Um, have either of you been ghosted or lost contact or? Yes and no. Um, I've uh, I've had a couple of, um, b before I was hired for a job, I, I've had a few, you know, I'll, I'll email you next week and then never heard from them again, um, which is fine. Uh, and then I've had a few, uh, like you said, after the job is complete, you kind of never hear from them again, if they're doing translations or if they're still going to publish that book one day so that I can talk about the language. Um, but fortunately I've never had a case where I've lost, uh, contact with someone in that middle stage between, you know, creating the language and getting paid. So. Uh, I think that's probably just luck at this point, though. Yeah, I haven't ever been ghosted as in they left and didn't pay me. Um, there was one person who's really dragging their feet and I had to get on them and make sure that they remember that they signed a contract. Um, but they paid, so I don't count that as a full ghost. <laughs> Maybe just a partial poltergeist <laughs> or something. <laughs> um they came back from the dead, so it was okay. But I've never been like completely like left standing, which is terrifying. But obviously, as you said, Joey, it does happen to people sometimes. But luckily, the vast majority of the situations of, with clients have been positive. Um, I haven't really dealt with like, you know, like super problematic, like crazy grumpy people so far. But maybe that's just luck. Um, uh yeah i mean obviously i have a lot of clients where i completed the job delivered my stuff and they paid me and then i never heard from them again but i don't really count that because like i don't know for the most part what i was hired to do i did so it was kind of finished <laughs> after that um there's a question here we, we kind of touched on it um sammy seal also wanted to ask uh, on the spectrum of side hustle, the full blown career, what has been your experience and, and how do you make conlanging your full blown career? Uh, David's not here to answer that question. It's the only successful conlanger uh, career person. If I had to look from the outside, looking in on what David has done, one, he pulled out all the stops. He wanted the Dothraki job and he went full bore to prove his worth for that. Um, that predates my time on the board, but I've had conversations with with him and Sai about uh, how that happened. Um, and he he left no stone unturned getting that first fairly high profile job. Probably didn't know how profile it would be at the time, but it turned out to be a lot. And David also knows his worth. Um, we were talking. I hate making lexical entries. That's that's one of the things I hate doing in conlang. I love making a phonology. I love making a syntax. I love writing a grammar. God, I hate making a dictionary. And that's one of David's favorite parts. And uh, I was telling him my my job at the time, I had to come up with a conlang with 4,000 words for the initial conlang. 
and he said, okay, so the thing you hate most, you're having more entries than my largest conlang. I wouldn't touch that for less than a hundred thousand dollars. And I'm, like, eh, I'm getting 900. <laughs> No thousands after that. I, I I can't remember what the actual price was, but it was way lower than what David would charge. Um, and I see that a lot. There's we, we try to prevent it by having minimums, and of course, me negotiating with clients before it gets posted. We don't want to race to the bottom. There are people advertising conlangs on a website that I will not name for fifteen dollars. And um, while I have high expectation of those individuals. I still think you're getting a $15 conlang. Um, conlangs take a lot of time and people should be paid something for their time that isn't fractions of a penny on the hour. Um, Margaret, any any thoughts kind of from the outside looking in what, what potentially a career in conlanging would be or how someone might do that? I mean, you'd have to be constantly, at this point for most of us, I think you'd have to be constantly hunting down clients. Because the rate at which we get jobs in the jobs board is one thing. That's not enough for anyone to live on. Um, and while not all of my jobs have come from there, it's a very, it's still a very niche thing. And the people who can afford to pay you what you're worth and who also want what you have are not just like, you can't just go and walk you know, up to somebody on the street. You have to have like a very aggressive way of like marketing your services, I think. Um, so I don't really know what it would take at this point in the world as it is to make that your full-time career. Obviously, as you said, there's only been one person who's been able to do it. I mean, it's still definitely firmly in the category of just like side gig for me, because otherwise, you know, I, yeah, I'd be living in a box, like, let's be honest. <laughs> but that said, you shouldn't devalue your work and you should demand what you know you're worth and, you know, um, most, it, it really depends on the complexity of the job for how much you should be charging. Um, but, you know, I don't really do, I will not do a full language for like less than like $700, $800 at the very, very least, um, depending on how much stuff they actually want. You know, um, sometimes people just want like a little sketch and that's different. Um, or they just want some words or they want place names or or things like that. And that's a different type of, um, you know, product than the full language with like 50 pages of morpha syntax or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we have like guidelines um, on the jobs board, but those are kind of considered minimums. And I've been able to work people up from those too. Um, so if you can kind of wheel and deal your way up, you should, uh, obviously. <laughs> but Whenever you go into a job, you have to always be looking out for yourself and trying to give yourself the best deal. And don't worry about being like, well, I don't think I'm good enough to charge, like, stop. <laughs> like, if you're conlinging in a professional capacity, you're good enough to demand what you're worth. So just, yeah. Um, and then it helps everybody in the community because it doesn't push those prices down to the floor so that we're like working for less than minimum wage you know, um, rates. So, so yeah. Jimin, anything you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, it's, um, I mean, if, if, if I figure out how to make a career out of conlanging, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know, but, um, working on it. I mean, I, I think for me, the ideal would be for some studio to be like, we need a full-time conlanger. Here you go. Here's your office, whatever, um, and and we just a have job. it like a salaried sort of thing, which which would be ideal. But I think really it's going to be, um, you know, and then then you could work on multiple conlangs or multiple series. I, th I think this is something that that studios should really consider having full time conlangers or a conlang department. Just just throwing that out there. Um, cough, cough. Dungeons and Dragons. Cough. <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> but uh, but I think. Um, one of the other things that that's, can be tricky about it is um, it's not even so much time that you put in consciously, like, you know, I've, I've spent six hours doing this lexicon and four hours doing this, whatever. But it, it's it's also, con lines take time. You, you, you need a certain amount of time just for them to sort of sit in your brain and 
you'll be walking along one day and be like, oh, I could put a suffix there. That would be so cool, you know, or whatever. Um, and and you need some extra time sort of built in to let that, to let the conlang steep in your brain that, that isn't necessarily time that you're charging for. But um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a conundrum still. So hopefully uh, as, as conlanging becomes more, uh, rises more into the public consciousness and, and uh, becomes more fundamental to particularly movies and fiction and, and things where people aren't going to put up with gibberish that uh, will hopefully be a much more common thing. Yeah. Um, we did have a studio contact us saying, hey, we want to have just a on retainer conlanger. Is that possible? And I said, yes. And I said, cool, we'll contact you in a couple of weeks when we're ready for that. I haven't heard anything yet, so I hope it's coming. Uh, one of the other problems we're fighting, this has been on the, the member Slack. Um, a lot of us saw the Dungeons and Dragons movie and uh, both David and I have appeared on the Con Langry podcast going, Dungeons and Dragons, you need to do better. You're, you're including languages in your material. Hire a Con Langer to give you some languages. Um, and I don't know if it was the Con Langer for the movie or or a voice coach for the movie, but it's this guy who says he's the creator of Dothraki, and all he did was coach the actors on how to pronounce Dothraki. And when they had a tough time with it, he started like trying to change the language and go, "Oh well, the language isn't important. Just say it however you want." Uh, he didn't last beyond the first season. Um, yeah, I, I see some faces there that are exactly what we're all thinking. Um, People are are getting to the point where they're not okay with with just gibberish. And I remember the final season of Game of Thrones. Somebody said, uh, "David, I was watching this, and it it didn't the Dothraki say the dragons ate three goats and and two lambs or something?" And Dave's like, "Ah, yeah, you're right. You're learning the language. This is awesome. That's exactly what it said." Like, okay, so why did the subtitles say twelve goats and fifteen lambs? Because somebody post production went, "That's not enough goats and lambs for a dragon to eat," and changed the subtitles. But the fans are learning the language and they notice these things. Um, one question, and um, feel free to pass on this. This is an if willing to disclose thing. Um, how much would you say you make? I don't know if you want to break that down per conlang, per year, over a conlanging career. Um, are you willing to disclose that information? I, I can point people towards the the jobs page, uh, conlang.org slash jobs, and you can see our our price spectra there, which gives a minimum and average. And uh, if your Amazon studio is contacting us, we're going to charge you the maximum um, industry standard, as we call it. Uh, are either of you willing to disclose that kind of information? I, I am to an extent, although I don't know if I have a good answer. I, I think a lot of times, a, a lot of the jobs I do are for authors I'm already working with who suddenly say, oh, I need these guys to have a language too. And uh, then I kind of charge whatever rate I've been giving. Um, I, I'll say I'm not rich by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, every few months I get some nice you know, money for some beer and some of the good cheese <laughs> beer and cheese money yeah i mean it it depends on how many jobs i get in a year and that really kind of depends it varies a lot like i said like for a full language i'm charging you like 800 dollars or so um, i hope it's more than that like depending on i mean yeah depending on the level of detail like if you want more of certain things if you want a more of a syntax document that's longer than normal, um, it's gonna be, you know, a few hundred dollars more. Um, but like, it's not like something you can survive on. Um, it's kind of just like an extra, like, um, cushion, I guess, of just like pocket money. So it's not something you should go into expecting to like fund your whole life or anything like that. Um, it's just something that if you enjoy doing it, you might as well get paid for what you're doing um, and provide something for someone else. So it's not like I'm doing it because I'm like, got to make money. It's not necessarily how I view it, but I don't like to really devalue what I do. So I'm not doing it for free. 
Um, Jamin, this, this kind of closing question, because we only have a couple minutes left, is going to frustrate you, because I know you've never liked our, our conlangs as a product that you can take off the shelf and say, oh, I'll take one basic conlang, please. Um, we, do, we do have different price guides on, on the page, and one of our viewers said that um, the concept of making only a part of a conlang is, is confusing to them. And of course, we say, yeah, a naming language is just going to be, I think it's 24 names in a phonology so they they come from the same root whatever that looks like or um, a sketch lang might have a, a very basic grammar and then a basic conlang versus an advanced conlang uh, if you had to narrow it down to a couple of sentences jimin what's what's the difference between a basic and an advanced conlang for you um i would say a basic conlang more advanced than that just more fleshed out is going to be a different category of thing and um <clears throat> usually if something if they want some sort of a feature that i think is going to be extra difficult or require a lot more research i'll charge extra for that because it's not something that's normally within the subset of what i do so like somebody wants like i want this language to you know i don't know incorporate some sort of special syllable situation or I want these sets of words to be easily rhymed in poetry. Like I want words relating to nature to be usable in poetry easily. Like that's a special, special feature. So you're going to have to pay for that because that's like extra work. And I'm probably going to do background research anyway. So you, oh, that's another thing I wanted to bring up. Never forget that anytime you spend researching for a job is part of the time that you are working on it. So if you, if they're like, yeah, I want, you know, X, Y, Z, and you look that up at all, that's part of your working for them. Um, like if it's something you want to understand better to provide for them, you still have to think about that as time working on it. Um, <laughs> yep. Um, so that's all I had to say. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we're we're kind of out of time and it looks bad if I say, hey, my own panel can go a little over time, but any any final thoughts, Margaret? Just one last thing you want to say to the the crowd? Um, I just would say that uh, work first on sort of if you're wanting to get into pro conlanging at all, um, you know, it's not necessarily a very like constant job. It's just sort of here and there. And so what I would really start out with is just kind of building your portfolio, building your resume, so to speak. You don't have to have a resume per se, but like, how do you introduce a client? How do you like say hello to them in an email? What are you showing them? What's easy for them to comprehend? Just sort of thinking about that sort of basis, I think increases your chances of getting jobs rather than just being like, hey, what's up? I'll do it. Bye. You know, because that it doesn't really give them much of an idea of who you are, or what you can provide. So it's mostly, I would say like, nine out of 10 times is like a communication thing is trying to understand what that other person wants and needs. Absolutely. Any final thoughts, Jimin? Um, pretty much the same. Just, uh, I'd say, you know, in any jobs that come across the jobs board, if it seems like you're vaguely interested in it, apply for it. You know, even if it's not, uh, if you don't think you might be the best person for it, that you you don't get a hundred percent of the jobs you don't apply for. So, um, but uh, yeah, that that and again, uh, like Margaret was saying, the the communication, tr trying to figure out not not only what the client says they want, but also figure out what they really want that they don't know that they want yet. If that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, and that sounds weird, but that's really true. <laughs> yep. Um, so I'm going to close with um, I'll. I'll Hopefully both of you can jump over to the YouTube chat. Um, I'll, I'll have a hard time monitoring that as we come back. We're going to take a probably a seven minute break, it looks like, uh, before we come back with our next session. But plugging shamelessly again, if you're a member and you want to ask these kinds of questions in the hashtag jobs channel, I know uh, Margaret, Jamin, myself, uh, Julie Munzel's another person who has had Conlang Music just come out. Uh, people should check it out on YouTube. Um, we're, we're all pretty active there and we're very happy to answer these kinds of questions in the, the members chat. So um, hopefully we will see you there. 
thank you to my panelists for, for joining me and answering some questions. Uh, I'm going to put us over to the break screen and we'll see everyone in six or seven minutes for the next panel. Thanks so much. Thank you.
All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for bearing with us. Um, just talking to our our captioner Mirabai, um, who was doing an amazing job. And Mirabai just said she she snarfed some thin mints and cheese strings uh, for a power up because you know we're not talking using simple language. And I just snarfed some beer bread and cheese. Thank you for the idea, Jimin, with your uh, cheese and beer money idea. Um, one thing I would like to say before we get going. Um, Mirabai is able to provide all of our captions because of some open source uh, software that she actually developed back in 2010. It's called Plover, which is written in Python, and all of the resources are there to use it. It's open source. Um, so it can be used with, um, she says, between $15 and $200 worth of hardware. And you can find that on opensteno.org. And we'll put that link in the YouTube chat shortly. Um, before I put that over there, which will probably make sense if I post it closer to when my voice is actually transmitted to YouTube on that topic, uh, we are back and ready to go with our next presentation. Um, Natanya, is that the, the name you prefer to go by? It's Natanya. Thank you. Natanya? Natanya. Yeah. Natanya. Sorry about that. Yes, Natanya. No worries. Um, please feel free to share your screen. All right. Wonderful. All right. Let me get these slides to. Yes, please. There we are. Wonderful. Thank you. All uh, right. So our, so our, our next presenter is Natanya Nori, uh, and I think we are all quite interested in, you know, the idea of divergent translation, and um, she will be talking about uh, rhapsodic, so please take it away, Natanya. Thank you very much. Super excited to be presenting today. Uh, my name is Natanya Nori, and I'll be presenting on my experiments with divergent translation. Uh, in this presentation, I'll go over what that concept is, how it's relevant to conlanging, what I am referring to by it. I'll give a quick overview of the core grammar and concepts behind Rhapsodaic, a conling of mine that utilizes this concept. And I'll share my experiences um, sharing this conling with other people and testing these principles out in real time. So I'm going to begin with just a summary of the conling itself. Uh, Rhapsodaic is a personal conling, a heartling of sorts. Among many that I have started and am currently working on, it is the first that I consider completed to a significant degree, and uh, as of today, the only one. It began as a cipher for writing English that I felt inspired to turn into a language proper, so that orthography and its inherent structures drove the rest of the language, and particularly comparisons between its structure and structures of systems of symbolism and correspondences that I had made separately for my own art and personal work. The, the kind of core intention for this language really pieced together once I had experimented sufficiently with how to turn this writing system into a language, but some retroactive design statements include syntactic simplicity combined with semantic fuzziness, aesthetic fantasticality, and perhaps most importantly, preservation of emotional content at the expense of material content. So when I speak, I could say is as well, symbolic content over material content. In English, for example, if I am very angry at someone, I might yell loudly at them or I might physically attack them. I, I probably won't, look at me. Um, but those are both different actions that I would do from the same emotional place. And naturally in English, we refer to them separately. Whereas in a passage talking about the full moon that speaks of it as a symbol of completion versus as a symbol of confusion and lunacy, the same phrase is used despite the different symbolic content. Um, as far as I'm aware, every natural language does this, and I imagine the majority of conlangs, and Rhapsodic is an experiment in flipping around this priority. Uh, so just a quick overview. There's some details I probably won't have time to go over in these slides. Uh, but Rhapsodic is primarily head initial, although uh, case marking allows for some flexibility in word order. There are three primary kinds of morphemes in the writing system of Rhapsodic, uh, which, by the way, is a solely written language. The core semantic morphemes are called stems, vertical lines of different heights and with different flourishes 
each of which represents a particular emotion, a cluster of emotions, or an attitude towards an emotion. Most of these fall into groups that follow, as I was saying, these systems of symbolism that follow a sort of personally devised alchemical hero's journey where each group is a stage along this journey of growth and discovery. Uh, for example, I have here the, the stems that fall in the group S3. The, the abbreviations I use for these derive from the alchemical phrase solve et coagula, you know, dissolve and reform. So S3 is at the height of this disillusion phase, and it's all about confronting core issues, facing fears, getting to the heart of the matter. So within these subdivisions, the stem at the beginning, the familiar phrase, the, entry, the familiar stem, the entry into this phase represents sort of these more mundane feelings of anxiety, insecurity, nervousness. Uh, as we get to the dangerous stem, kind of right in the middle of the phase, we get to wrongness and discomfort, horror, ill will, and the taboo. And coming out of the phase in the sort of more transcendent, wondrous stem, we get feelings of power, courage, bravery, uh, capacity, and nerve. And all of the main stems, with this exception of this group of attitude markers, like how much do you approve of the emotion you feel, how aware are you of it, um, all of them kind of fall into this hero's journey kind of structure. Words proper, always consist of at least two stems. So the emotions that a single word can refer to can get fairly specific depending on which kinds of emotions one juxtaposes. And connecting lines are used to not only demarcate these words, uh, but denote their lexical class, their case, and their tense, uh, depending on the particular shape and slope of them. Each word by default refers to an emotion, an emotional concept, or an emotional experience. And so to refer to anything that isn't that, a system of diacritics are used as, I would say a noun class system, but they apply equally as well to verbs to sort of substitute the meaning of, of a word from being an emotion to a place, an action, a person that feels this emotion, causes someone else to feel this emotion, is somehow otherwise associated with this emotion. And as you can see, there's a lot of room for uh, ambiguity, but also specificity in the system. What's proven particularly useful for me is the specific markers for the first and second person to refer to the writer and reader of a given text or addressees and speakers in quoted passages. In personal writings of mine where I use Rhapsodaic to gain different perspectives on emotions that I'm experiencing, using the first person marker on multiple different emotions has been very helpful to refer to past versus present me, one part of me versus another. To say I of intense insight love myself of deep shame is a very different sentiment from I burnt out and frustrated love myself confident and full of energy. So there's a lot of nuance that can be communicated there. Here's an example sentence just to show um, these different components, the, the vertical lines of stems, the connectors between them and the diacritics, and also this sort of aesthetic fantasticality that I aim to give to Rhapsodaic. If we were to translate this word by word, we could go very granularly, kind of breaking apart each component uh, such that each word kind of requires an entire line to translate. Eye of enthusiastic joy, who is related to a being of furious strength, act in a way that is determined but playful, like these these translations can get very wordy, uh, act in a way that evokes a sense of mischievous rebellion towards the sense of a sensation of calm and wise firmness, firmness etc. Uh, naturally, of course, this is um, the first line of the first verse of Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. And there are some interesting kind of techniques to take these particular words like a tiger or gravity or a shooting star and fit them into the framework of this language. For example, rather than rendering to be a shooting star as a verb, I incorporated the emotion that I would associate with the shooting star, this kind of enthusiastic, wonder-filled joy that's modified by like determination and desire to go after one's goals. And then in this first word, encoded it with the diacritic for the first person pronoun. So rather than I am a shooting star and I am leaping, it's shooting star me is leaping uh, through the sky like a tiger. We could, of course, take each of these words and translate them to refer to very different material things that may still keep the same emotional content. Uh, as an example sentence I took after writing this translation into Rhapsodaic, we could get, 
I, the freshman who everyone thinks looks like a bully for some reason, am giving a speech on following your dreams in the school auditorium and it's jostling everyone's sense of defensiveness and commitment to this idea that they have to respect the authority they feel their peers have over them. Uh, here the word that was once tiger has become bully, uh, shooting star became freshman and again it shares that similar connotation of joy and enthusiasm, perhaps even naivete. Uh, the phrase, the two word phrase for gravity has become uh, a need to respect the authority of one's peers rather than um, a calm and wise trust in connection. And so it's this process here where we get two very different sentences in English that is the core of what I refer to when I talk about divergent translation. For many conlangs, it is a priority to make sure that multiple readers can come to a similar translation of a given text, what I'm terming here as convergent translation. Divergent translation, on the other hand, is this process wherein, say, I write out a text in language Y, here would be Rhapsodaic, with an intended meaning in, say, English, and someone translating reads out a meaning that makes as much sense in Rhapsodaic, but is drastically different from the original English meaning, and crucially, insight on the part of both parties, me and the translator, which in this case was also me, and other parties as well, can be arrived upon by comparing those two translations. Uh, both insight in terms of the meaning of the text, what does it mean to say that the physical force of gravity and the metaphorical force of peer pressure are in a way the same, and insight into both people who've done the translating. What does it mean that I associate those concepts with each other and perhaps another person doesn't? Why do I read this emotion as referring to a particular object and someone else doesn't see that connection at all? And what do we learn about each other as we discuss that? This is something other conlangs definitely do. Uh, Tokipona and other minimalist languages like that tend to have this effect where toki toki can mean hello, hello, or linguistic discussion. But Rhapsodic is really designed to dial this process up to the nth degree. Text in Rhapsodic should produce these wildly different results in regards to the material content when different people translate into and out of it, uh, and ideally preserve the emotional content, the symbolic content to some degree. And originally I was intending for this conlang to solely be personal, but my curiosity grew as to how would this play out if I actually shared this material with other people? So in the abstract I for, for this presentation, I said I sent a number of participants the full reference grammar and a dictionary, a short story written in Rhapsodic, and a short list of English words, and I asked each person to translate the material from one language into the other. That is all true. I did do all of that. After I wrote the abstract, I created a Discord server and reached out to a number of people. Um, this was now a time crunch, there was an adventure, and um, we, we worked on all of these projects, but as the months kind of went along, we realized there was only so much time to do this kind of experimentation, and we really would have to focus down on one task in particular, which is what I will be presenting to you today. So if anyone here is familiar with the game Exquisite Corpse, uh, it's a game where each person draws part of something, usually a person, on part of a piece of folded up paper without seeing anyone else's contributions. And then the paper is unfolded and the full thing is revealed and it always looks rather silly. So I did this with one paragraph of a Joyce Carol Oates short story. The most anyone participating knew was it is a short story and the author is Joyce Carol Oates. Most participants only knew that I had not written this myself, merely translated it. We had seven sentences in this paragraph overall and six participants, including myself. I filled in for a seventh who was unable to complete the translation and I just put myself to an honor code to not look back at the original too much. Uh, all participants had some second language learning experience. Uh, three have specifically conlang learning experience in the Tokipona community. So I assigned each person, including myself, a sentence to translate and put them together into a single exquisite corpse paragraph of a story. Um, each uh, color here denotes a different person translating a different sentence. I'll see you at home, I lied. I, all sweet and strong, will hold you steady, my love. You won't feel afraid, but calm. I'll see the full of who you are, your bold and vibrant love that makes itself exist. Home is bittersweet. It makes me aware. My family is intimidating. They are horrible fam family. They make me angry. They, of intimate malice, had wrongly indulged in it, that playful, spiteful, lonely thing. 
Even they of excess malice wanted more, shameful, wonderful, wrong. Though you are consumed by obsession, knowing that you will open your heart fills my heart with joy. Is it so painful? This love fulfills all your needs. Uh, I will say my text is somewhat cut off and I don't seem to be able to click to get the my camera out of the way. So I may not read all of this correctly. I would be enough if it were up to me, though I sense this is my folly. If you love me and I loved another, would you ever love again? My friend and you, who is a toxic lover of my friend, is healing your relationship. You are embarrassed and putting something in its place. Mother is concerned, don't want, about it. There's not enough frustration. So we got a whole variety of uh, tones in which people wrote, styles in which people translated these words. You can see some people kind of leaned into this more granular translation where pronouns all get these uh, descriptors after them. And there's these parentheticals, whereas some kind of tried to do a more natural to English translation. The original text to contrast is an excerpt from Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? Again, by Joyce Carol Oates. Uh, I won't be reading this out loud, partly for time and partly because it is a bit uncomfortable. I chose this segment not just because it was a short story I was familiar with, but because I predicted I would get some fun tonal whiplash from revealing to people who had maybe construed this as having a different emotion that it is in fact this sort of story. So I'll, you know, that'll be available in the slides. Uh, if anyone wants to look later, it's the paragraph that opens with, we'll go out to a nice field and it gets much less nice from there. Uh, I don't have time again to go over all of the notable results, but a couple that stood out to me from here. Uh, a few lines or words were translated very authentically, especially words that had to do with family and familial relationships. House became family in one person's translation. Uh, Connie's people were rendered fairly accurately as her mother. Their people refers to family and close friends. Other times we got to see some significant divergence when the same word appeared in multiple lines, looking solid for one person meant being intimidating and for another person meant being enough or satisfactory. Some elements of the story that are not mentioned outright, in part because I translated the story knowing its context, showed up in people's translations. Arnold Friend, the primary antagonist, his manner of speaking was translated as lying, which in the original, it's not called lying, but it most certainly is. So in some cases, the translation would favor Arnold's POV, even in narrated sections, and other times it seems to side with the narrator and reveal things that were not said outright in the original text of the story, but because I'm translating into a language that requires this degree of symbolic specificity, ended up being included and were able to be translated back out. So what wasn't able to happen with the time that we had was to get multiple people translating the same sentence and to have this back and forth communication that is primary to my idea of divergent translation. Because my initial expectation was that most of that communication process would happen within the translations themselves. As it happened, a lot of that also occurred as part of the process of teaching the language. About a month prior to right now, I hosted a Discord call where we went through the reference grammar bit by bit. I fielded questions, had people come up with example translations of words, and noticing people's translations of emotions that I wouldn't have expected, uh, questions that I wouldn't have foreseen people having, an explanation that was throwaway for me but made the entire premise of the language click for someone else. It, it really struck me as I, I went into this project thinking like, oh yes, we're going to explore this idea that people have these wildly different perspectives and then I get smacked in the face by the fact that people have wildly different perspectives. Uh, but even with the ideal experiment unable to be finished in time, this divergent translation process uh, still got to happen kind of in tandem with the language itself. I learned things about myself as well, the way that I tend to experience emotions on a very specific and context dependent level shows up pretty necessarily in the language of semantics, but that only clicked in my head after I shared this language with other people and other perspectives. And that was huge for me as someone who was only ever going to originally keep this language to myself and felt very reluctant to share details about it with other people at first. I was struck by how how readily a whole community formed around it. That was one of my initial anxieties was like, how, how much am I going to be able to communicate this to people and how invested are people going to be in something that's so personal to me? Um, but just to take some excerpts from paragraphs when I asked people to talk about their experiences with this whole project, um, people had a lot of fun with it. 
described experiences of fitting like puzzle pieces together and you know, using the language to reconsider how they describe very basic concepts, um, wanting to wax poetic about the experience, even before the translation had begun, um, people sharing experiences that they ha didn't have the right words for in English and hoped they would in Rhapsodaic. Like it kind of blew me away to see this whole community um, build up over this language. Um, just a couple of other fun examples here where even people who weren't able to participate in the translation experiment still worked with the language, found ways to translate personal experiences that they had, wax philosophical about the language. Uh, one particular friend of mine in the server is currently hosting the reference grammar on their website with you know, SVG versions of all of the stems, connectors, and diacritics. It was a experience that I absolutely was not expecting that yeah, blew me away is the phrase I keep coming back to. And I, actually only a couple hours today did I learn that I can make a permanent um, invite link to the Discord server. So however is best to do that, I may share after this presentation if other people are interested in joining this community. So in part because this experiment went uncompleted, but maybe in part because of the things I was investigating, my conclusion is a lot more about the questions than it is the answers. Languages fundamentally are about sharing and conveying information with other people. Is there a fixed way that they have to do that? Are there these other indirect means of communication around language that get to be part of this linguistic sharing of information? What facets of language, well, what facets of experience do languages tend to prioritize or deprioritize? And as we create languages, what priorities do we want to include in them? And which priorities have we maybe not considered as clearly? Many things can be lost in translation, particularly as translations are enforced or presented without context. But when different parties are able to both communicate and participate, what knowledge gets to be gained in translation? I don't have full tied up with the bow answers to these, and I don't know that I ever will. Certainly more rigorous and more extensive experimentation into Rhapsodic and languages like it would be extremely helpful in learning more of the uses and the limits of the strategy. But even from what I've been able to do so far, I can strongly recommend divergent translation as a concept for any conlanger interested in this sort of experimentation to play around with and work with. Uh, not just as an intellectual exercise, um, but as a personal one as well. As I was writing the slides for this, I kept coming back to a quote from, it's Branson Reese's review of Star Trek Into Darkness. Maybe every franchise should collapse into a version of itself that makes shareholders smile and shake each other's hands. We, I, again, I can't see the end of that part there. We should learn to speak in a language that rich people who don't dream can't comprehend. Uh, I regret to inform you that Rhapsodaic, after all this, will not be that language, certainly not on its own. If I took my personal framework for making sense of these emotions and then just said, this is the way to do it, this would be against the entire point. Um, I will level with everyone here. I was at a loss for words as to what I wanted to say in this section. And then remember that I have a tool for when that happens. So I tried translating it into Rhapsodaic first. The general sentence I was trying to work with to get more insight into was if conlangers create languages like this, new opportunities get opened up by the things that we learn. But I had to get very specific. What kind of opportunities? What kind of things do we learn? What does languages like this mean? What is that act of creation? And what is the symbolic content behind being a conlanger? And what I was struck by was unintentionally, I formed the word for a person who makes languages and this feeling of curiosity about other people's experiences, a connection that is driven by that uncertainty using this, the same shape the same kind of phases on this hero's journey. One roughly translates as analytical self-expression and one as connection through curiosity. But the, the core shape is the same, it's the details that differ. And perhaps isn't all language divergent or convergent or otherwise about getting curious about other people's experiences and trying to bridge the gap between them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Natanya. Um, you're you're getting a lot of love in the YouTube comments, so definitely recommend you pop over and check those out uh, when Will you have do. the opportunity. Um, Absolutely. One that particularly stuck with me: um, comparisons to Ithkul, but like if Ithkul had a really good poetry teacher once in high school. <laughs> 
Yeah, I. <laughs> it definitely strikes me. Yeah, like it, um, Rhapsodic is a language that has it's it's interesting to me in that way that there is a very precise degree of specificity in this one particular domain. Uh, one example word that I've used when talking to people about it is a word for a feeling I've gotten when I like realize something about myself or a thing that I do and I didn't know why, that it's this combination of like embarrassment that I didn't realize it and a little bit of grief over the fact of what it is but still being able to feel like lighthearted and compassionate and it's something that like takes me like these multiple sentences to say properly and it's one word in this language yep it, it's awesome there were a lot of comments about the writing system that you made too and and how it kind mm. of looks like musical notes were were you influenced Your, the writing uh, does kind I of am... look like sheet music I am a very musical individual. Um, this particular, I, I looked through like my journals to find like the original uh, form of this writing system, but was more inspired by like various doodles that I had done rather than um, music proper, although I appreciate the comparison. <laughs> so this is what the, the original draft of the writing system back when it was used to write English look like. Um, I found in a later journal, um, some initial attempts to try and map meaning onto those symbols. Uh, it was originally called Levian from the Hebrew word for heart, live. Um, yeah. No, that is that is absolutely awesome. I'm not seeing questions come in on the YouTube, but just a lot of comments. Like people want to see an, an fMRI of people understanding uh, rhapsodic. Um, I did just see a, um, a comment yes. there. Um, if I can write translate something in real time, I am. Um, where is my pen that I have? There's, there's one over here. Um, I absolutely could. Awesome. Uh, were you part of the Conlang Relay? I was not part of the Conlang Relay now. Oh, okay. I, I was really um, hoping because we did have, have a, been... a conscript relay this time around too. But... Ooh. Yeah. Would have been very interesting to do. Um, let me hop over, look at the YouTube chat very quickly. I see all of the, I posted the link in. Um, in Mapona Pitogipona, uh, that Discord server. <laughs> I'm seeing some great comments from those people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I Yes, I can, what I can write out too, um, cause I wasn't, I didn't have a graphic in there that really made clear like the, the correspondence between those stems and the, um, the system of correspondences but I can write out very quickly that the pattern looks something like this here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so each of those stems representing a point along that journey, the way that I managed to hold that all in memory is kind of through using the, these are the familiar versions of the stems, kind of, I, it starts here and then loops around that way. Um, and each phase is roughly, um, there's like the initial discovery and contemplation of ideas, and then the going further with them as you realize the difference between like what is and what could be. And then there's that, you know, the S3, the confronting of the core of the matter. There's the stage of like recovery and rest and like self-compassion. There's then getting clear on what it is you want having come out of all of that and sort of venturing outwards to explore it. Um, six stages starting to take action towards pursuing those things. Seventh is where it's like kind of test your knowledge, see what you've learned so far, get solid in like the experience that you've had. And then stage eight is, you know, looking back on the whole journey with a sense of like, wow, I did that and being able to relax again. Well, you are certainly able to relax again because it was very, very well received, both uh, in apparently your your online group and also the the many people watching on YouTube mm -hmm. right now. So thank you very much for sharing that with thank us. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. If I could ask, what would be the best way to, because I had a list of links um, before I had the Discord link available, what would be the best way to share that? Uh, you could go back into that uh, document where you were adding URLs earlier if you if you had the link to do that, or you could share the URLs with Sai in the Zoom chat. Perfect. Okay. We'll Thank you it. so much. Thank you.
Okay, um, our next presenter, I see George is there. George, thank you for joining us. If if you want to share your, Hello. your screen. Uh, let me get that. Sure. Awesome. Um, so I, I have All to right. say- All right, you're seeing the presentation? Yes. I, I do have to yeah. say, so um, Margaret and I populated the, the schedule, but we weren't the abstract reviewers. And when we first asked the abstract reviewers to, to go through the many abstracts that we got, we did ask them to flag maybe one or two talks that were worthy of a, a keynote full hour. Um, in the end, our schedule was so full, we couldn't offer a, a keynote, but uh, your abstract was one of the ones that was flagged as, hey, this should be one of the keynotes. So I know a lot of people are are looking forward to learning a little bit more about the metrical grid. And as a phenologist, I love this stuff. Uh, so very excited to see where you go, George, with conlanging with the metrical grid. Feel free to take it away. Well, uh... It is it is something that probably would be easier to do with a 50 minute keynote, but I will try to fit it into uh, 20 minutes. So let's uh, get started. I'm George Corley. Uh, you know me from the Con Langry podcast. Um, and my subject today is using a metrical grid with Conlang. So a metrical grid, is generally a way to figure out a stress system. And um, right now I'm just going to work on word level stress, but you can even expand them out like all the way to utterance level. But so a metrical grid We lost your audio there, George. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good now. Hello? Uh, uh, the last thing I oh, heard okay. was... All right. I have to... Was what? Okay. Uh, uh, a metrical okay, grid let is... Okay, let me... Oh, okay. A metrical grid is basically you've lined up your syllables and you have some system to divide them into constituents. And from there, you build up until you have like the most prominent syllables, right? Um, it's useful if you're doing something relatively complex, like if you need to do secondary stress or you're doing something that's weight sensitive. I, If you're just doing a simple regular system, if you're just French and you're just always going to put French stress at the end, don't bother with it because it's, yeah, I mean... I would say it's not worth the work, but I mean, it's not even going to be that much work because you're just going to do one thing, but it can be interesting. So here is sort of an example. And you see, you start with line zero, line one, line two, you're building up here. It's a way to map out the levels of prominence within a word or a phrase. And each syllable will end up with a number of marks and that can sort of be used to assign stress can also be relevant to tone. Um, uh, so, but right now I'm going to focus on stress. Um, I am going to be introducing a version of the simplified bracketed grid. Uh, it was first proposed in 1987 um, and all by Haley and it's Sardi. Uh, it's Sardi's dissertation in 1992, I think, also covered it. The current one is based on a revision in 2009. This is just the theory that I learned the earlier an earlier version of the theory in graduate school and sort of was interested in it. It's help. It's nice because you don't necessarily have to think about the units as like named levels. Like this is the foot. This is the prosodic word. This is whatever, um, and you just are putting things together. So there's two types of rules. There are grouping rules where you decide how to group your metrical units into constituents, and then there's projection rules where once you have your group defined. You decide 
which unit gets projected to the next level. Um, so uh, the way this particular instance, um, this is from the 2009 paper, um, they define, they have these six variables. So you are asking, are you going to insert a right bracket or a left bracket? Are you going to go every two syllables or every three syllables? And we'll get to something about that. Are you starting from the right edge or the left edge of the word? So um, right edge. So since we write from left to right, left is the beginning and right is the end. Uh, that's just a metaphor most people will be familiar with in linguistics here. Um, do you apply it iteratively or non-iteratively? And do you skip or insert on the first, uh, this says on the first line, it should be on the first syllable. So we start, what we're going to start when you're doing conlanging, I would start deciding on your, whether your rule is going to be iterative or non-iterative or, and it's going to skip and insert. And next slide will cover why. The reason is if it's non-iterative, this, number here whether it's a two or a three does not matter it's you're just going to be inserting uh, a right or a left bracket on one of these um uh oh my gosh uh i am going to have to correct my slide because that is not supposed to be what it looks like um but can i I checked over these slides over and over and I still made a mistake. Okay. So um, ignore this. This this bracket should be way over here um, if you can see my mouse. But um, basically it's wherever, whatever edge you have, you're going to be putting a mark right on the edge. And I uh, can't believe I did that. Um, if you're skipping then it's going to matter. And this one, uh, I did not. So this, so you have, are going to have, you know, eight patterns for a non-iterative rule. And it's going to matter whether you have a two or a three, uh, you know, are you going every two? And this is, so this is a right bracket that's on the second syllable. It looks a little bit unusual, but, uh, I promise I didn't make a mistake on that one. Um, so that, there you have, so non-iterative, but if you want iterative, this is necessary if you're going to do secondary stress or something. Then you are basically just, you start from the, uh, uh, wherever, yeah, whatever edge, and then you keep repeating the pattern, keep repeating the pattern. Uh, and I'm going to have to go back through this and see what got messed up because I, uh, but so, and you can skip or you can be inserting. Inserting just means that the first unit is going to have a bracket whereas if you skip you skip over that however many so having just the basic ideas of this down um uh, a reality check so i gave you all these patterns for the two and a three um typologically uh having rules or patterns that involve uh, grouping three units together is typologically rare. It's not super common for a language to do that, uh, but it can be. It can be part of it, and uh, it's so it's included in the uh, theory. It's it's seems to be useful for explaining some languages, and it may be useful for constructing some systems that you would want to 
use. Um, now, so usually you're going to be going two units. Now, let's actually, um, so a second part of this, I mentioned that this is useful when you're doing weight sensitivity. Um, so there is a special kind of grouping rule where you say you place a right or a left bracket to the right or left of a heavy syllable. Um, so, and we always sort of say our bracket is, if it's a right bracket, it's placed on the right. If it's the left bracket, it's placed on the left. But anyway, it's going to be, so for example, we have this sort of word bubula and this is the two types of this kind of rule where you have uh, a right bracket on bull or a left bracket on bull. Um, this is important for different kinds of weight sensitivity you might have to handle. Um, then we have, it's not a metrical grid unless you get multiple, multiple levels, right? So we're going to use projection rules and you're going to say you can either project the rightmost or leftmost unit of a group. So the rightmost syllable or the leftmost syllable. Um, and uh, you can also project brackets. I didn't have a, um, I think I may have an example later, but so here is what it looks like for projecting the left of a group. This is for projecting the right of a group. And you can see we're starting to say, okay, well, uh, there, these two are more prominent now. So maybe these will be assigned stress in some way. Then we go to, we've got uh, a rule that can project brackets. Now you can have one of these grouping rules in to put brackets in, or you can project brackets. I have not really figured out how useful this is creatively, um, but it's a part of the, the theory. I'm sure that it can be uh, manipulated to create certain interesting stress systems. So let's actually go through an example because I think that will help understanding a little bit. So I have these three sort of theoretical conlang words. So kukulat, babamina, and kirinato. And ignore my stress because we're going to figure out what the stress is on these things. So now let's start a grouping rule. So this is R2LNS. So it is non-iterative. It skips the first syllable and it is a right bracket on the second yes on the second element from the left so starting from the left you count 1 2 and you've got where that's where your bracket goes 1 2 1 2 okay now how about heavy syllables how about we just put a right bracket on heavy syllables? And uh, this could be, you could you could go either way on this. You could go left brackets and right brackets. Uh, I think I thought it would be most interesting if I did a right bracket in this case, just as an illustration, since we have ku as a second syllable and we have uh, we it actually makes a difference rather than a left bracket wouldn't really make a difference for kukula. Okay, now, okay, we go to the next layer. Project, and I've chosen to project, oh my gosh, oh crap. Um, that's, it helps if you actually know right from left in order to do this. So I actually, I, I, I put this down as, as it project L and, uh, but, but I had written this as project R that's weird. So, because it is, this is the leftmost. Okay. 
I've noticed that with with this bracket, I I sincerely apologize for not looking at this hard enough. Right. So we have a right bracket. This is a left bracket. That's right. Okay. Oh, let's go. Let's 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 keep keep going on this. So we've got actually a left bracket on heavy syllables. We projected to left. So here we get initial stress here and here, and we've got um, we've we've got because this has become just its own unit, we end up with the first heavy syllable becoming becoming like stressed here. Now we still have two marks here. So we want to define it some way that we get just one primary stress, right? And and let me correct myself because I yeah, this is and this here that doesn't matter, right? <laughs> okay. Why is my okay. So uh so we've got now we decided I decided you put a left bracket counting from the left non-iterative insert so it's just going to be on the first one so you just end up with one here and then one here. i think we lost your mic again george can you hear me yes okay uh for some reason with the new computer I have to be much closer to the mic than usual. Okay. So, um, anyway, so here it's not mattering here, which, which way we project because we end up with just one unit here. Um, but with different rules, you would have different situations. And now we have the full stress system. We could say, okay, maybe there's a secondary stress now. So it'd be Kirinatora here versus Kukulat and Babamina, where you don't end up with any secondary stresses. Now, and lovely. Uh, so let me fix my stuff because now I understand what I was doing here. Right. So now I had project L before. Now we go to project R. And here we've have we we've got Babamina. And here we got so uh Torah. Because we actually made a unit using this left bracket. And then if we project the rightmost. Then we are going to get an X here, and then we do our rules here. We get an X here, and primary stress is Kirina Tora. And I had to check this because this is an actual thing that can happen. You can have heavy adjacent stress rather than the stress actually going on to the um, the heavy syllable itself. You can have um, it puts the stress next to it. Um, but you can see if you get used to this and, uh, I apologize for my earlier like issues with, with, uh, with, um, forgetting, forgetting what I had done. But, um, if you, you know, get used to the system and you start playing around with it, then you can see that any parameter you change in here is going to change the stress system. Now, 
I don't think necessarily you're going to use this in your grammar to describe your stress system, but it's like a, a toy to play with to figure out what the stress system is. And then you can sort of put together, oh, it's descriptively uh, for this one, it would be like, um, oh, stress is typically on the second syllable, um, uh, except there can be, um, a, we'd have to define what the rules are. We'd have to talk about like, the, there's going to be some complex interactions with heavy. I think we need more examples, but we would get like, uh, if there's a heavy syllable and then a light syllable at the end, it goes light syllable, or if it ends in a heavy syllable, we're going to end, have stress on that heavy, heavy syllable. You just have to explain it that way. Um, and so things to note, um, always stay rooted in typology. Like I said, I came up with something unexpected there and I looked it up to make sure it made sense. Uh, you will need to make some other decisions. What counts as a heavy syllable? How are you going to do secondary stress? Also, are you going to use this for stress only, or are you going to have it affect tone as well? Um, and you may need to do some other rules in addition to this. So uh, you might incorporate stress class rules. Um, there may be other phonological rules that occur within the derivation. Um, for example, um, they did one of the examples in the paper was Ho Chunk, and they had to decide like when does Dorsey's law is a vowel copying rule in Suan languages that breaks up um initial clusters and they had to decide okay this is happening before stress assignment in order to get things to work out in a conlang you can probably decide on when these kinds of other rules fit in but above all just have fun with it and um uh it's 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 interesting to play with um uh, and, uh, I think it's, I don't know, it, it can be a useful tool in your conlanging if you want to use it. Thanks so much, George. If you want to uh, exit out and we can see you again. Um, yeah, let me, uh, uh, pause share. Do I just like, there you go. That's perfect. okay. Stop sharing. There we go. Um, and I apologize for like having some mix ups. <laughs> hey, that's no problem. Uh, this is my jam. This is this is how yeah. I learned stress back in uh, 301 phonology. Uh, I absolutely love the metrical grid. Yeah. Some of the YouTube comments, people are like, this is awesome, but I need to watch this a second time to really get through it. And I was suggesting um, practice with it. It becomes super easy once you've done it a couple of times. Uh, we've had a recommendation for Bruce Hayes's book, yeah. uh, Metrical Stress Theory. I recommended understanding phonology as a as a good starter to it. Uh, any other like primers that yeah, you would immediately those... suggest? Uh, you know, I it's been such a long time since I learned this that I kind of you just do. I'm it. not sure. Like, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. It's sort of like, um. I, I had some issues like figuring this out because like I was going to use something more similar to what I had learned originally in grad school. And then I saw this more recent paper and I was like within a week writing an entirely different presentation. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I, it's it. I think it will be something that can take some practice to get used to. But um, I saw someone in the YouTube comments say, oh, it's actually fairly simple. You just define your your constituents and and build up. And yeah, the base thing is pretty simple, whether you use this particular system or you do like a foot base system or something. It's at base pretty simple. You define some kind of a constituent at the base and then you move to line one 
And then you probably have to do some constituent there in order to, to get up to there. Yeah. So, and I, uh, there's a whole lot of things I couldn't fit in to a 20 minute talk. So I have myself thought of making like a longer video about this if people are interested, but I think just having an idea and like playing with it a little bit, it may be, it may be useful if you're building a language that benefits from it. Yeah. Um, I, I love this. I'm, I'm of course an OT phenologist an optimality theory phenologist. And um, I know there are criticisms of optimality theory, but I, I quickly grabbed David's book and his section on stress. He says, you know, optimality theory is really good for stress. Uh, w would you say not as good as the metrical theory? Like, is there a reason someone might choose metrical grid versus optimality theory? I I have no idea why David says that. I'm sure he has like his own way that he has used it before. Uh, I would be cautious of using optimality theory for most things, but for 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 stress mainly because like I have seen a presentation where someone where they tried to make a, an optimality theory um, account and they what they were doing is using a computer to generate all of the possible constraint ranking rankings and building stress systems and some of them are were like wacky <laughs> some of them some of them like were counting things completely differently for for even an odd number of syllables oh phonology and can't count. so yeah and that that's 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 a big thing like you 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 working with units of 2 maybe units of 3 but yeah phonology can't count so you don't know whether the whole word is even or odd sometimes you get odd effects because of the way the constituents are constructed but it's not you you're not going to reference the like entire length of the word like no that. i agree with that um, the other question I saw was, yeah. do you have an example of how this would work together with tone? Uh, unfortunately, I don't. Um, there are some, uh, quote unquote, pitch accent systems, I think, that where like the tone is basically being assigned based on metrical units, but I didn't like fully research that my uh like of course my own like knowledge of tone comes primarily from study of chinese and in there it's like the way it interacts with the stress system is if you have an unstressed syllable the tone gets deleted so that's not really <laughs> it's not really my thing uh but it is uh i have seen people talking about metrical systems being used in tone assignment and maybe that's something i can delve into more yeah based on the comments i'm seeing on the youtube channel and of course encourage you to jump over and, and interact after where you're done here uh, people would yeah. appreciate that that separate video where you did a, a bit more of a deep dive and a few examples uh, both natural language yeah. examples and some and, and examples. hopefully Yes. And hopefully get my right and left straight. Uh, <laughs> well, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, all right. Um, I suppose that it's almost time for me to uh, jump and you to introduce the next person. But uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. The opportunity to have a talk. No. And, and thank you for introducing metrical grid because I, I think it's a very useful tool as well um, and i i think people will rewatch this yeah. and yeah and love it all right thank you so much george mm -hmm. no problem all right uh doug i see you're joining us here if you want to share your screen
Awesome. And I'm not going to embarrass myself by not remembering how to pronounce the name of your language, even though I've seen you do a couple of presentations on it now. But uh, I think we're all excited to hear the story of Tsa and how it's getting used in your language in, in I think, a unique way. So feel free to, to take over. Yes. So I just pronounce it scare as if it was a English word, but we're looking at uh, concretely at the sounds, uh, which I'll actually refer to TS for most of this talk, um, but we could refer to it as the voiceless alveolar affricate. We really want to get technical about it. We might call it the uh, voiceless anterior coronal sibilant affricate, but I think this is um, a sound of interest for many conlangers. They either include it or maybe have at least thought about including it. Um, as it originally came into scare, it was uh, a bit of a happenstance thing that it got included. Um, this is because when I first started working on scare, I created a name for myself, um, which you saw maybe on the previous slide, Sketar, and at least based on the spelling, it looks like this sound is in there. Um, now, for many years, I was quite hesitant to recognize that this sound was actually there. So uh, for maybe the first seven years I had scare, I was going around telling people that the initial T was silent and then a little bit later that it was sort of historical. Um, but as I was uh, got further along in my undergraduate I sort of reluctantly accepted that uh, TS should be a phoneme in the language. It's sort of around. I could have another phoneme that wouldn't be so bad. So I accepted it. Uh, now, fast forward many years, about 20 years later, um, I have been working with Scare for a, a while now. Uh, I was rethinking some things and it was pandemic time. And so I decided to investigate what really is going on with this sound and the languages in the world. And so this is a report on my findings. Um, so in this talk, we'll first talk about some sources of information that I use for TS uh explorations and some of these i think are excellent resources to use if you're a conlanger and interested in particular segments uh we'll talk about some very basic facts surrounding the phoneme ts and then i'll talk a little bit about uh the apparent different kinds of phonological systems you get with sibilant affricates which include ts and then I'll wrap it up by talking a little bit about what uh, my explorations led me to sort of decide about scare. Uh, so when I first started conlanging, the go-to source for looking at this sort of thing, phonological inventories across the world, was something called UPSID, which was short for the UCLA Phonological Segment Inventory Database. Uh, but in the 21st century, there are now several large online databases that you can use to explore this sort of thing from the comfort of your own home and on your own computer. Uh, so there's something called Foible, um, which also originally had an acronym attached to it. Uh, there's also something called Lapsid, uh, which also is more or less uh, an acronym. This stands for the Leon Albuquerque Phonological Systems Database. Uh, there's interestingly also a similar sort of research that is regional in its scope. So it's something that I'll call SA FON, um, and the SAs uh, stands for South American, and it just looks at the patterns in the South American languages. Now, all of these works uh, are based on phonemes and reported phonemes because they're all at least secondary sources. This means they have some problems sort of inherent to talking about 
phonemes. One is that the information they report sort of obscures uh, anything interesting about allophonic variation. It also doesn't go into maybe that much phonetic detail. And I do happen to think that this sort of thing is probably interesting and potentially relevant, uh, but I think that these online databases are sort of good enough for the purposes that I put them into here to just get a feel for what's going on. And so they're fine. You'll see that I chiefly make use of Foible and SAFON, uh, partly because I think they have, well, especially SAFON has a decent user interface. Foible is great because it has tons and tons of information. Uh, so from Foible, you can look at the uh, sort of frequency of particular different segments, and uh, they report that TS is found in 22% of the languages in the database. If you actually look more closely, you discover that Foible is actually happy to have multiple descriptions of the same language in their database, so it's really 22% of the language descriptions in their database. Uh, but this makes it the 26th most common consonantal phoneme. Um, so this means that it lags behind its component parts T and S and is even a bit behind the fricative sh. Um, it's also behind its fellow affricate uh, Civil and Africans, ch and j, but it is ahead of some things. It's ahead of the fricative j, and perhaps most intriguing, it's actually far ahead of its voice counterpart z, which actually occurs the significantly uh, smaller number of languages than, tz, and I'm not sure that anyone has a great understanding of why that is. Um, also from Foible, you can see uh, some indication of its geographical distribution and looking at the maps that Foible can generate, it's clear that TS is common in certain areas of the world, what I will call hotbeds of TS. And so some of the hotbeds include Central and West and Eastern Europe, um, Central Africa, the Coxes and the Himalayas to mountainous areas of Eurasia, uh, Southern East Asia, which is basically China just north of what is Southeast Asia. Um, the Pacific coast of North America is another hotbed, as is Mesoamerica. And finally, um, at least for this list, uh, Northwestern South America is another hotbed. So besides just looking at sort of uh, how often it appears and where it appears, I think it's also interesting to see how this behaves within phonological systems. What other phonemes accompany it? Uh, do other phonemes not accompany it? That sort of thing. And to sort of skip to the chase, it seems that there are relatively few systems of series of sibilant Africans. Um, maybe just four. Probably you could count them at least on fingers of both hands. Um, and one of the reasons why the number is low is that I'm talking about series. Uh, so essentially I'm talking about sort of the number of places that uh, there are sibilant Africans in the language. And this ignores some things like aspiration, uh, whether there's any glottalized things, that sort of thing. Um, and I'll go ahead and use the voiceless sound to exemplify any and all in this series, in large part because the voiceless sound uh, almost always is present. So it's at least sort of right there. You're mentioning one of the Africans that's in the language. Um, it's interesting co to compare sibilant affricates with sibilant fricatives. Uh, so sibilant fricatives have been an area that people have been looking at fairly closely for the last uh, 15 to 20 years or so. Um, 
that research does suggest that different sibilants kind of repel each other in perceptual or articulary space. So they don't bunch together very close in place and they're usually quite separate. And that same sort of thing seems to be going on with sibilant affricates too. What is different uh, from uh, sibilant fricatives is that sibilant affricates actually have more than one uh, single sibilant uh, series system. It seems that sibilant fricatives, if there's one, it's usually some kind of, uh, but if there's one affricate, there could be a couple of different possibilities I found. Um, so the numbers of these systems are kind of arbitrary, but what I'm calling system one has just a back sibilant affricate, usually ch, um, and uh, this is familiar because both English and Spanish have this system amongst other languages. Um, and it actually isn't something that I want to dwell on a ton in this talk because there's no TS in this system. But I felt that I should mention it because uh, it is fairly common. And just looking through SA Fawn, I found it in 34% of the languages surveyed there. And I think it likely is the most common type of sibilant affricate system in the world, though some of that's a little conjecture. There is a second uh, sibilant affricate system that has a front sibilant affricate and a back sibilant affricate, prototypically tz and ch. Um, and this is found in lots of languages. I decided to. Uh, go with Tetzal uh, as an example, and you see the affricates right there. This is a list just of the language's obstruents, and you see that there are some uh, ejective ones, but that doesn't really matter because we're looking mostly at place. Um, so I found that system two was found, uh, or occurs in 21% of the languages surveyed in SA Fawn. And I think it is uh, reasonable that this is in fact the most common system that includes TS. So probably the path of least resistance if you were really uh, just making the average language would, uh, and you want to include TS would be to uh, use system two. Um, Interestingly, there's this paper by Nikolayov and Grossman uh, that looks at Africans worldwide, and they come up with an interesting similar percentage for languages that have two places for Africans. So it's maybe possible that the percentage from SA Fawn actually is reasonably close to what the worldwide distribution is of this particular system. System three has just, uh, and this is maybe the most interesting one if you're really focused on this particular sound. Um, this is found in Cantonese. You see Cantonese's obstruents in this chart, and you see there's only affricates, though there's a difference between a plain one and an aspirated one. Uh, this occurs in 9% of the languages in the SA Fawn database. So I got the sense that this is uncommon, but not rare. Um, it occurs more than a few languages, but it's definitely not the most uh, popular uh, pattern out there. I was curious, sort of, how common might System 3 be? And uh, I don't have a complete answer, but I did sort of hunt haphazardly uh, to find other instances of this, and I found it in about 30 other languages, most of them, in fact, from the hotbed areas that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so it does seem that this is out there, but it's maybe not as common as System 1. System 4 has three different uh, sibilant affricate places, a front one, a sort of central one, and a back one. 
and this is what occurs in Polish amongst other languages out there. And in Polish, uh, the Africans come in voiceless voice pairs. Um, this doesn't occur that much in the SA FON uh, database, only in 3% of the languages uh, there. Um, it does seem that when languages sort of go all in with Africans, which in fact is the kind of language that Nikolaev and Grossman were really interested in, um, this does appear uh, in languages of that type, because in fact, a big part of their paper is looking at this particular uh, type of system. If we're doing some typology, we do want to think about implicational universals. And the only one that I found is if you have a phoneme TS, you have a phoneme T as well, though this is not particularly exciting because lots and lots of languages have the phoneme T. So maybe not the most profound uh, thing that I discovered here. Um, I did look at sort of uh, some other interrelations between the sibilant affricates and the sibilant fricatives. Uh, so there are a few languages with uh, TS, but no S phoneme. Uh, this occurs in 4% of the languages in SA FON. So I think this is an option. Um, I also was curious if there are any languages that had TS, S, and SH, but no CH, this sort of uh, asymmet or asymmetrical system. And this occurs in a few languages. It's not particularly common, but I think we can say that it exists. Uh, this also got me wondering, well, are there any languages that have TS and SH and nothing else? And it seems that there are a few languages of that, though, again, it occurs in uh, precious few, at least within SA FON. So my searches of the various databases suggest that quite a bit is possible. And uh, even if I kept TS and scare, which I really wanted to do, I could have gone with a number of different systems. And uh, so it was still kind of up to me. But what I really uh, sort of gravitated towards is, oh, I'd accidentally created this rare pattern. I'd already made scare a system three language. And realizing that this is kind of rare, I sort of wanted to double down on that. So I definitely was like, well, the one thing that this uh, gets, uh, one thing that's evident is I need to keep scare as a system three language. And the subsequent uh, and ongoing thing that I've been working on is sort of how exactly do system three languages behave, which um, I've made some headway with, but probably could learn some more things. And the following slides are just a collection of different references and uh, other sources that I've consulted in doing this research. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, that was a whirlwind tour, which is actually really interesting because we we do see a lot of languages, um, a lot of conlangs that if they want to be a little more exotic, we're looking at those rarer sounds, even though uh, 26th in the list probably isn't the, the most rare. I, I should look up myself what uh, the uvular voiceless fricative is. I'm sure it's way down there. I think it only appears in four languages or four dialects or something like that. Uh, we ate up our question time, unfortunately, but I would encourage you to hop over to the, the YouTube chat if you, if you want to have a conversation over there. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much uh, for, for sharing that with us and uh, giving us a little bit more insight into SCARE. All right. Um, so. 
while Doug hops over to the YouTube chat and we'll continue the, the conversation happening and how interesting and how fun the tsa fricative, or affricate, I should say, is, we're going to pause for another quick break. Uh, so in about 10 minutes, we'll be back with our last three talks of the day. Um, I think in about an hour, which is half an hour before the conference is scheduled to end for, for today, Grayson is going to be launching the Conlang Chatter Day. Um, if you haven't been privy to the, the member's email or the member's Slack, you can talk to Grayson to get that link if you need it. Uh, as, as he said earlier, that's where the after party will be uh, and hang out and chat with some of the conlangers and uh, some of the presenters from today and tomorrow. Uh, so we'll see everyone again in about 10 minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. Logan, I see you're here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to share the screen and launch your slides, by all means. Yep. Um, oh, my screen share button disappeared. Oh, there it is. Found it. Okay. Screen shared. Slideshow going. Awesome. We see you. Uh, so this is the the last group of talks for today's section of uh, LCC 10. Hope everyone's loving the content so far. I know most of us have been watching uh, for the entire day and learning and enjoying. Uh, so to kick off the uh, last section for today of three talks, uh, Logan is going to be talking about conlanging beyond the IPA. So I'm quite interested to hear what you say, Logan, please take it away. All right. Hi. So uh, yeah, I'm Logan. Um, I am also one third of the Theory Neutral podcast, and I irregularly blog about language and linguistics representation in media. And one thing that is horrendously underrepresented in modern media, despite the proliferation of conlangs in popular culture, is stuff that human actors can't pronounce. Um, However, I'm not going to be talking exclusively about that because there are multiple ways to create naturalistic human languages also that cannot be represented in the IPA. Um, but before we get to that, <clears throat> I wanna talk a little bit about the blank page effect. Um, so there, there's these two kind of interacting ideas, the blank page effect, the paradox of choice. If you have too many choices in front of you, like that sounds like a good thing. It's great to be able to make choices, uh, except it turns out to be really hard. Um, if you have too many choices, then most people end up just shutting down and saying, I don't know what to do. Um, and it's a lot easier to work with something that's already quote unquote on the page than to just spew out artistic greatness from nothing. Um, so even though unlimited choice sounds great, actually having constraints allows us to make better art by engaging the parts of our brain that solve problems instead of having to just generate stuff from nothing. Um, so when you're doing a quote unquote normal conlang, there's a lot of constraints that come just from you know working within the idea of making a new human language. You've got a large but still finite set of phonemes that humans can make. They're encoded in the IPA. You have a ready way, a uh, uh, ready-made way of writing them down. Um, there's all kinds of research on typology and how languages work and, and stuff that you can draw from. And if you want to step outside of that box, then, well, what do you even do? How do you even start? Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that non-human languages can vary. Um, and I will talk about those in other forums, but because I have a limited amount of time now, we're only going to look at phonology. Um, one constraint that I have is I have to work with a romanization. If I cannot figure out a way to conveniently transcribe whatever language I am working on um, in a way that I can type on a standard American keyboard, then like I just hit a brick wall and I can't do anything with it. So that may or may not apply to any of you, but that's a huge constraint that I already start with that helps cut down my choice of spaces. Um, however, note, phonology as a general term includes 
non-audio modalities. So let's look at some of those alternate possible modalities. We've got oral aural language, which is what I am using right now. There's visual sign languages. There's tactile sign languages. Um, and sign languages are like a whole thing. Again, I have limited time here. So I'm not gonna tell you about sign languages. I'm not an expert in sign languages. Uh, you can go study sign languages. Um, writing is another modality that language occurs in. Um, and uh, there are some conlangs that are purely written and cannot be spoken. Uh, whistling is another human modality. Uh, whistling is kind of like writing, in fact, in that it is not something that anybody acquires uh, as the primary modality for their first language uh, during natural language acquisition. It's more of a language technology similar to writing, except it turns out to be way more common and way easier to invent. Uh, writing has been invented independently a handful of times throughout history, but whistling has been invented all over the place. Um, even though you don't hear about it so much uh, in the modern day, uh, because the uses of whistling have largely been supplanted by modern telecommunication technology. Um, so there's a whole typology of how whistling registers interact with the normal mode languages that they are associated with. Um, but what if we just ignore all of that and think about a whistling language that existed independently. Um, say there were some aliens that had a different vocal tract than humans, or maybe birds uh, that can't pronounce regular human uh, phonemes. And so whistling is the only thing they have, and they do acquire it as uh, their primary modality. Uh, what could we do with that? Uh, well, we can still go and look at all of the wealth of research that's been done on existing whistling languages and see how do they make distinctions between phonemes with such a limited uh, phonetic repertoire? Um, it turns out you might think, well, I can whistle in a bunch of different ways, uh, but that doesn't matter. Uh, natural whistling languages totally throw out all of the different mechanisms that you can use to produce whistles as sources of distinction. Um, so that cuts down our, our decision space a ton already. Um, and we basically have two dimensions to work with. You can alter the amplitude and you can alter the pitch. So let's go ahead and select a maximally distinctive subset of amplitude and pitch patterns from the things that are attested in natural whistle languages. Um, there are natural correspondences to vowels and consonants uh, because again, like in the real world, whistle languages correspond to regular oral aural languages um, and they transpose the uh, categories that, uh, that come from the oral languages. You don't necessarily have to do that, but it's really convenient to. <clears throat> so we can think of vowels uh, and equivalent to vowels in our whistled language as steady, smooth tones with peaks in amplitude. Um, and I'll just quickly note here that uh, that kind of thing does not actually always correspond to a vowel in a uh, natural whistle language, but it's a convenient thing to, to slot into the vowel category for our purposes. Uh, and then consonants uh, are things that are patterns of alterations to vowels and represent troughs in amplitude, uh, so less loud bits of the speech signal. Um, note here that uh, consonants under this definition uh, don't have a single identifiable pattern. Uh, they are defined by the rules that you use to alter the vowels that come next to them. <clears throat> and there's a few ways you can do that. Uh, you can say that, oh, I'm going to warp the vowel so that it gets a little louder or it gets a little quieter or the amplitude changes you know, quickly or slowly or the frequency goes up or goes down or stays the same. Um, so uh, given this uh, grid of different ways that you can fiddle around with the vowel signal to indicate a particular consonant, um, I came up with this three by three grid of nine consonants, uh, which represent basically instructions for if I start with a particular vowel tone, what do I do with it 
in order to warp it at the beginning or at the end. Um, and then the vowels uh, are defined by a frequency peak that takes a certain amount of time. Uh, and we get some diphthongs from doing smooth transitions in the frequency space while in that amplitude peak. Um, additionally, we have a schwa vowel, uh, which uh, is actually a feature I stole from Turkish uh, whistling registers, uh, where the schwa vowel doesn't have a specific frequency associated with it. And you might think, oh, well, how are you going to tell it apart from the other vowels if you know there's only a single frequency band, there's not multiple formants, um, you know, it, it will necessarily overlap with the other vowels. Well, the answer is uh, it just doesn't take as much time. So all the other vowels are at least two time units. The schwa is just really short. And that's how you tell, oh, the, the specific frequency here doesn't matter. Um, so <clears throat> that's option number one, all sorts of different ways to play with whistles. <clears throat> option number two, uh, I came across a couple of very interesting uh, bits of research into canine phonology and canine understanding of human speech a while ago. Um, which, uh, which provided some very interesting restrictions to work within. Um, so dogs obviously cannot produce the same sounds as humans can, but they can produce some sounds. Um, they have a lot of shared mammalian vocal physiology. Uh, so you can kind of adapt uh, IPA symbols or Roman alphabet symbols uh, to to represent similar kinds of articulations in a canine mouth if you want, uh, but it's not actually going to be uh, the canonical IPA sounds if you actually had a dog do that articulation somehow. Um, notably, it turns out that dogs have a very small horizontally arranged vowel space. Uh, you might think, well, the canine vowel space should be huge because like their snouts are longer than human mouths, but experimentally that turns out not to be the case. Uh, additionally, their formant range is completely outside of the human vowel trapezoid. Uh, so yeah, literally cannot be represented by IPA. Um, additionally, the so this is the second interesting bit of research, uh, it turns out that uh, based on neurological studies, dogs may not be able to distinguish minimal pairs. So that, that's like a psychological neurological change in another species that has a direct impact on the phonological structure of a possible language. So how in the world do you design a language that doesn't have any minimal pairs? Well, it turns out there's an easy way to do that if you design a phonology based on syllable level features rather than segmental level features. So let's say our proposed canine language uh, has C, D, optional, coda, C, syllables. So every syllable must have at least two segments, no just plain ah. Um, then every feature that we use to define a syllable must control at least two segments. And if that is true, then by construction, there can be no minimal pairs among syllables and thus no minimal pairs among words that you build out of those syllables. <clears throat> um, so just for purposes of this talk, uh, I'm gonna give an example with features of backness, roundness, openness, stoppage, and nasality. <clears throat> um, oh, there should have been a, a minus there, plus slash minus, what, well, whatever. Um, so if we combine all of those, that, whoa, I'm scrolling on accident, didn't mean to do that. Here we go. If we combine all of those, then we get about 24 possible distinctive syllables where every one of these features alters what consonants are allowed to occur in the onset, what consonants are allowed to occur in the coda, and what vowels are allowed to occur along with those. And every alteration in a syllable level setting changes at least two of those segments. Um, now, 24 total syllables to work with doesn't sound like a lot, but it is larger than the segmental inventory of a lot of human languages. So if you just treat those as segments for building the rest of your language, you're good. Um, additionally, you don't have to stick with just these features. Um, I actually proposed a more elaborated version of this kind of system uh, to David and Jesse for the latest season of Langtime Studio, uh, and Jesse didn't like it, so they're not using it. But uh, you can 
like make this bigger and and get a larger set of uh, syllables with this kind of approach if you wanted to. <clears throat> uh, now let's go way out in left field uh, languages that cannot be articulated by humans or even mammals. Uh, Fish A is a language that I came up with when I was suddenly inspired after going to the local aquarium and watching an electric eel swim around for a while. Uh, so Fish A is imagined to be spoken by alien electric quote unquote fish because they're not actually fish because they're not from Earth uh, using electrocyte organs. And uh, the restrictions here came from looking up the signaling abilities that exist in real world electric fish. Uh, in particular, there are some pretty stark differences between how saltwater fish, uh, saltwater electric fish and freshwater electric fish work uh, because saltwater and freshwater uh, conduct electricity differently. Um, so these alien fish specifically live in fresh water uh, and that changed the types of electrocytes that they might be able to evolve in that environment. Um, so I ended up settling on having three, uh, three signal channels, uh, two of which are indistinguishable from each other because they've got two sets of electrocyte organs that produce the same kinds of waveforms, and a third one that produces a different waveform shape. Um, so when you overlay them all, uh, there's a two-part chord that sounds like it's played on a single instrument, basically, and a third uh, a third drone frequency, uh, if we try to analogize this to sound. Uh, also, it turns out that amplitude and signal frequency are related uh, for electrocyte signals because it takes time to build up larger peak charges. So when your amplitude goes up, your frequency goes down. Uh, so unlike whistling, because the amplitude and the signal frequency or the signal um, components are connected to each other, you only have one dimension to work with, uh, which is why I ended up going with a total of uh, deciding that these fish would have three electrocyte organs so we could get more, uh, more of that signaling capacity back. Uh, bandwidth, that's the word I was looking for, more of the bandwidth back. Um, additionally, electrocytes can't instantaneously transition between discrete frequencies and controlling the start time of a wave train is easier than precisely controlling the stop time. So that gives us something to work with in defining phonotactic constraints for this particular alien species. Um, and as a result of those constraints, I came up with a phonology where we have independent phones, which are things that can occur syllable initially, and you have a whole uh, a whole bunch of channels that start uh, sending out wave trains all at once, uh, and then dependent phones, which uh, involve either one or two formants and allow the wave trains to trail off, not necessarily in synchrony. Uh, and then similar to the canine language, uh, we organized the phonology in terms of syllables so that it was easier for me to transcribe uh, because all of the different ways that you can combine different uh, formant frequencies from this particular biological system uh, turns out to be super complex, but when you squish them together into syllables, uh, there's basically harmonies that show up which reduce the uh, number of contrasts you need to specify. Um, so I could work out a romanization that didn't use too many letters uh, based on this classification of the different types of syllables that exist. <clears throat> uh, finally, we're gonna look at a possible cephalopod phonology. Um, so no specific cephalopod is mined here. Uh, I just wanted to use general features of cephalopod physiology that exist in cuttlefish and squid and octopuses uh, to figure out an interesting system that maybe could be used by aliens. Um, however, there's one constraint that I did not like from nature. Uh, it turns out actual cephalopods are almost certainly colorblind. Um, so if you look up how cephalopods uh, do intra-specific signaling uh, rather than extra-specific signaling, so how they communicate with other members of their own species as opposed to like patterns that they use to hide uh, or to intimidate predators or prey or whatever, um, intra-specific signals are all monochrome. Uh, and that's super boring. So whatever, we're designing aliens. Uh, our aliens can have all of the motor capabilities of cephalopods, but they're gonna be able to see colors because that's cooler. <clears throat> so uh, cephalopod color changing uh, depends on three layers of cells. Uh, at the bottom, you've got iridophores, which produce blues and greens, 
leucophores, which uh, produce white and they can mask the iridophores and provide a background for the top layer. And then the top layer are chromatophores, which produce all of the other colors that octopuses and squids can show off. So black and red and orange and yellow. Um, and they can vary the saturation by changing how they activate the leucophore background. So you can do uh, super saturated colors or pastel colors. <laughs> Um, and it turns out um, cephalopods don't like employ their massive brain power to individually control every single uh, chromatophore in their skin. Uh, there are neurological subsystems that produce specific combinations of patterns. Um, so even though there aren't constraints, like, there aren't uh, mechanical constraints like you get with the human vocal tract where like it is a particular shape. We can only make particular sounds with that shape. Um, mechanically, they could produce any kind of image, but neurologically, we've got some more constraints on what the phonotactics and the phonology can look like. So for example, all segments come with a foreground and a background color. Um, and you can manipulate the foreground and the background independently, but you can't just like blend them into a single layer. <clears throat> Additionally, there are constraints on uh, actual mechanical constraints on which colors can be background and which colors can be foreground uh, because like they actually are physically layered on top of each other. <clears throat> Um, so if we look at solid patterns, uh, as being somewhat equivalent to vowels, kind of like, uh, in the whistling phonology, I had, uh, continuous tones being equivalent to vowels, uh, then we can, again, look at ways of messing with those static patterns, um, and introducing either spatial or temporal variation in them as ways of acquiring consonants. Um, so then I just looked up like what in the uh, oceanographic marine biology literature uh, do we have in terms of actual you know, patterns that show up on cephalopods. Um, and again, we can split these into static patterns and dynamic patterns. So we've got alterations over space and alterations over time, uh, which means this doesn't actually map really cleanly onto like the human language idea of consonants. There's two totally different categories of like temporal consonants and spatial consonants. Um, and for romanization purposes, like maybe we could do onset versus coda. Uh, the actual romanization I came up with this is uh, super complicated, so I'm not going to show it to you because that doesn't matter. Um, but the key idea is there are neurologically derived constraints um, on which static patterns can pair with which dynamic patterns, on which combinations of patterns can actually form phones, as I talked about on the last slide. Um, and it might actually be more sensible to make analogies with sign language phonology because, as I said earlier, uh, sign languages are like a whole thing that also cannot be written in IPA. <clears throat> um, I probably just talked way too fast, so I sincerely apologize <laughs> to the captioner, um, but uh, that's what happens when I am working with constrained time. And uh, yeah, now we have some time for Q&A. Thank you so much, Logan. Um, the YouTube chat is blowing up with the most puns I have ever seen. Um, <laughs> although I did particularly like William Annis's uh, note that <clears throat> uh, syllable length are measured in more. But I'm <laughs> um, uh, Yeah, I, I have long wanted to make an ant language, the little tiny insectoid um, using chemical trails and i have not thought of of how i could possibly represent that yet because like you if i can't just type it maybe that's outside of my my interest um i'm not seeing any particular questions come up although there are a lot of comments about uh, what echidnas can and can't do and things like that um <laughs> i i don't know if if you remember if anyone remembers at the last language creation conference um i did challenge people to come up a, with a language that didn't use contrastive features and so i was like oh are we on to something moving away from from minimal pairs but i i think that syllable level contrast is is still contrastive so i, I don't think yep. we've done it yet 
Um, well, if there if there aren't any uh, explicit questions yet. I'll, I'll see if I can uh, hop back on YouTube and, and scroll through the chat in case anything comes up. But uh, I did make a few notes this morning on extra things that were not in my slides uh, that I can well, tap nice. on to the end. Um, so in addition to working with the syllable level uh, featural phonology, um, this also affects diachronics. I don't usually care about diachronics too much. Um, I don't like do the historical method. So I didn't think of it when I was making the slides. Uh, but if you wanted to like think about how to evolve a canine language through time, because you're into diachronics like that, um, that like that uh, psychological limitation uh, has direct implications for how sound change can work over time. Uh, because if you change only one segment at a time, uh, it's going to cause a lot more mergers than you would think if you were, you know, working from a human point of view. Um, so all of your sound changes either have to alter two segments at a time, they have to change a syllable level feature, not a segment, um, or you just have to recognize that if you start changing individual segments, then you're going to have to do another pass of figuring out where all of the mergers are because you introduce minimal pairs which aren't audible to your target audience. Um, and then uh, another thing, actually, this is uh, kind of connected with uh, my media review work, which otherwise was not going to be part of this talk at all. Uh, I recently read Project Hail Mary, which is the latest novel by Andy Weir of the Martian fame. Um, and not to give too much of a spoiler, uh, but there is a suggestion in that book of a Conlang, which for which we should look to whale anatomy and song structure uh, for relevant design constraints. So that's something I might be looking at in the future. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about, so quite frankly, you're inspiring a lot of people in the YouTube chat. Um, any thoughts on <laughs> right. a psionic sonar language? I don't know what psionics would do to that, but a sonar language. Uh, yeah, so that's the, there's a couple of different ways that I would approach that. So one of them obviously is taking the, uh, the, the cetacean route. Um, look at how whales and dolphins uh, communicate. Um, and that would be largely constrained by the the anatomy that they use to produce sounds, uh, much like humans are, um, making it. Uh, I I'm going to guess that by psionic sonar, the idea is that like you can project images, like sonar images, directly to another person. Um, if that were possible, I don't really feel like that would be an interesting conlanging experiment because it kind of just bypasses language entirely. Um, and additionally, I, based on what I do know about cetacean biology, uh, I don't think it's actually possible to do that. They, they just don't have enough uh, fine control over the types of pulse trains that they can emit. Um, what, the, what they can emit to then interact with the environment is much less complex than what comes back after it has interacted with the environment. Um, but the other thing to look at uh, would be bats because you know bats also use sonar. Um, so you've got two completely different evolutionary lineages, uh, which uh, if you you know dig into the biological literature on, uh, would give you potentially completely different sets of constraints for how to uh, build a language that is built up around the idea of like this creature had a pre-existing sonar system now it wants to use it to encode language too <clears throat> but like you said earlier you know if something's boring on earth that's okay we're making aliens yeah exactly you know if, if you're if if cephalo uh, if cephalopods turn out to be colorblind then screw it my alien cephalopods aren't colorblind because that was a boring constraint i didn't like that one <laughs> the power we wield as conlangers indeed just don't throw out all of your constraints because then you've got a blank page and now you have to go find new ones. Yeah, and that was that was a very good point too. The the blank page effect where we've probably all made that kitchen sink language at least once. Yep. Um, although I will say people are saying for your facts here, uh, citation needed. 
<laughs> bum, bum, bum. Well, I have plenty of citations that are provided uh, along with my abstract on the web page. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, please hop over to the YouTube chat and wrangle these punny, punny people. <laughs> I, I, they, they are actually talking and like, hey, this is a really cool idea for, for something I want to try and I want to look at, but um, I'm not seeing any actual questions come out of it at the moment. All right. Well, feel free to ask me questions later if you have a, a fridge moment. <laughs> Thank you so much, Logan. Thank you. Yep. And to size comment in the chat, citation needed. That was painful. That wasn't me. That's just me reading the YouTube chat. Um, next up, uh, we're going to have Benjamin Fox. Ben, are you on? Yes, I awesome. am. Good morning. How are you? Is it, is it um, morning for you? Yeah, well, I think the sun's coming up, so hopefully. Right. You're joining us from, from New South Wales, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm in Sydney at the moment, so, but yeah. Um, oh, how is it? Oh, I've done something. Uh, we, okay. we can see your slides if you want to go full screen. Perfect. Okay. Um, Wonderful. As I, yeah. Um, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Ben, to, to talk to us uh, about some neuro-linguistics. So I think we're all pretty fascinated by this and take it away. Yeah, sure. Um, so as I said, it's morning here. So um, hopefully I'm not too incoherent and coffee drunk. Um, uh, as explained, my name is Benjamin Fox. I'm a 21-year-old uh, university student here in um, Sydney, Australia. My research specialization is neurolinguistics, which, as you will see, is the study of language in the brain. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about um, a really in interesting topic, um, which is neuroscience. Like, we're going to talk about what language does in the brain, why you might why why you might want to care about neurolinguistics and what I'm doing in an academic sense to explore the powerful impact I think conlanging can have on uh, the scientific understanding of the human brain. Um, creating a constructed language that is both effective and engaging can be a really challenging task. Um, that's where I think neurolinguistics could come in. By understanding how the brain processes language, um, we can create constructed languages that are more effective, that are more um, memorable and engaging and more naturalistic. Um, in this presentation, I really want to talk about um, topics within neurolinguistics that can inform the, uh, the that can inform the creation of constructed languages, including like language processing um, and like some effects of neurolinguistics on like our languages that we build. Um, I want us as conlangers to start thinking about what is going on inside the brains of speakers and um, what that might look like in if you're world building or um, when you're creating your language. Um, neurolinguistics is a field of study that explores the relationship between the brain and language. It examines how language is processed in the brain, how language disorders occur, and how language ac acquisition and language learning takes place. It's an interdisciplinary field that um, kind of incorporates psychology and computer science to understand the mechanisms of language processing in the brain. Though the use of advanced brain, um, through advanced brain imaging, we're starting to like really understand um, how different uh, areas of the brain are interacting because it's not a, a field that scientists fully understand yet. Um, so some of the key insights of the research um, undiscovered. That's an interesting note, no idea. Anyway, <laughs> the brain's a really complex system that um, of cortex of cortexes and subsections. Um, it was around until the 1800s that doctors kind of assumed that the whole brain performed the same function as the, any other part. 
Um, but we now know that different sections of the brain perform different functions. They um, fulfill different roles. The brain is a really complex organ that plays a crucial role in language processing and production. Understanding the structure of the brain and how it functions can be helpful for colleagues in creating realistic and functional languages. Um, and there are a few reasons why. The brain is organized in specialized regions that handle different aspects of language processing, such as phonology, syntax, semantics, pragmatics. Um, as conlangers, we want to create languages that feel natural and coherent. Um, so we might want to consider how the different brain parts working together and um, why they might be producing certain results. Um, the brain is connected through a, a series of pathways that allow for rapid and efficient transmission of information. Um, conlangers who want to create languages that are efficient and easy to learn um, might need to consider that uh, the processes and stores of linguistic information and how they can design their conlang um, to align with those processes. The structure of the brain can vary across individuals, populations, depending on factors such as age, gender, genetics, and uh, as we were just talking about, um, maybe species of fish. Um, so conlang is need to create like a diverse and inclusive um, set of needs that suit their speakers of the language in order to produce a really impactful language. So one interesting phenomenon related to language that you have all experienced yourself is called lephologica. It's a universal phenomenon, um, tip of the tongue phenomenon. So when we experience the tip of the tongue phenomenon, um, it's the inability to recall a word despite knowing what it means. We've all had moments where we know a word we want to use, but it seems just out of reach. This happens um, because the brain stores different aspects of languages in different areas. The sounds of words or phonology are likely stored in um, the left hemisphere or the Broca's area and the same area that is responsible for producing speech in contrast. Um, the meanings of words or semantics is likely stored in different temporal regions. Um, this separation of language processing means that different types of language difficulties can occur on different parts of the brains if they're affected differently. Um, for example, damage to the Broca's area can result in difficulty producing speech, while uh, damage to the temporal lobes can result in difficulty understanding the meaning of words. Um, for reasons in constructing languages, understanding the tip of the tongue phenomenon can be useful. The tip of the tongue phenomenon is um, strange and it affects everyone who uses language. Lephologica is universal. Maybe when you're constructing a language, think about what words um, your speakers might struggle with or why certain words might get mixed up with synonyms and how um, speakers of your languages react to experiencing the tip of the tongue phenomenon. The reason why we understand a lot of the neurological phenomena like tip of the tongue is through studying symptoms that occur when parts of the brain are damaged or put under different stresses. Aphasia, for example, is a language disorder that can occur as a result of damage to the brain, injury or neurological disease. Um, there are several different types of aphasia, including Broca's and Wernicke's aphasia. Um, there are different severities as well. Studying aphasia has provided insights into the organization of language in the brain. Um, so damage to the Broca's area might cause someone to lose the ability of speech or, or dampen it. They might not be able to produce the words in the right way. And then damage to other parts of the brain, such as the Wernicke's area, can um, impact the coherency of someone's language. Um, so on this page, I've mentioned the sphere wolf hypothesis, <laughs> which is a controversial aspect of neurolinguistics. Um, you could incorporate it into your conlang. Um, these days, a lot of people prefer to call it linguistic relativity because it might exist, but it's absolutely not as rigid as um, you might think. Um, linguistic relativity is the idea that language influences the way we think and perceive the world around us. Um, this theory suggests that the words and structures 
the shape of our language um, shapes our perceptions and experiences um, and that different languages may lead to different ways of thinking and conceptualizing the world. Um, lexical relativity suggests that the lexicon is closely tied to the culture, environment, and social practices of a community. And it's a neurological impact as well, because an example of the ways cultures and culture influences neurolinguistics in English in particular is the interaction between our cultural ideas of gender and what impacts that can have on our brain. There's a really famous study headed by Angela Grant in 2009 um, who compared brain activity responses in unexpected semantic pairs. In English, our social stereotypes about gender, how quickly our brain associates two pairs of words, our brain will really quickly associate characters um, categories such as apple and pear. But this study by Grant demonstrated that there are a lot of English speakers who struggle with atypical gendered pairs, such as woman police officer or male ballerina. Um, there's cultural influences that make the, a sentence such as um, the bouncer taught herself quickly how to see hidden bottles that causes a spike in the activity on our brain because the neural connection between the words bouncer and her are weaker for English speakers. Our culture has influenced the electronic behavior of our brains. By understanding the neural basis of language, conlangers can create constructed languages that are like, that impact their, their speakers. Um, additionally, knowledge of neurolinguistics can help um, Conlang as avoid pitfalls of language design. Um, it can help you impact, it can help you design characters with disorders or people who may have experienced trauma to the brain. Um, it can help make languages more natural and aesthetically pleasing. Um, but there are challenges. Um, I've briefly talked about the interaction between the relationship. Oh, that's an interesting sentence between um, culture and neurolinguistics, but there are also a lot of complex um, structures that are unique to human languages as well. Humans are really good at human language, and any of you who have studied linguistics would know about the laws of universal grammar. There is something inside the human mind that allows us to pick up human language really, really well. Babies don't put conscious thought into learning language, they just do. There is a downside, however, um, we may not be built for any other kind of language. Um, Noam Chomsky, the scientist who kind of formalized this idea said that the same structures that make it possible to learn a human language make it impossible for us to learn a language that violates the principles of universal grammar. If a Martian landed from out of space and spoke a language that violated universal grammar, we simply would not be able to learn that language the way that we would learn a human language like English or Swahili. We should have to approach the alien's language slowly and laboriously, the way that scientists study physics, where it takes a generation after generation of labor to gain a new understanding and to make significant progress. We're designed by nature for English and for Chinese, for Swahili, and every other possible human language, but we are not we are not designed to learn perfectly usable languages that violate universal grammar. These languages would simply not be within our range of abilities. So if you're writing a, a sci-fi story, or if you're writing a story where human characters interact with non-human language, you might want to consider the neurolinguistic idea that humans might not be able to learn a language that isn't human. Um, I'm a university student who is dangerously close to beginning a PhD in linguistics. I want to introduce an idea. I'm roughly fighting around people who I'm looking up to. It's an experiment that explores conlanging in the brain. So the brain consists of two types of matter. There's gray matter that holds everything together and uh, no, sorry, there's white matter that holds everything together and gray matter. Gray matter is the important part. It's cognition. You are the gray matter in your brain. So 
um, bilinguals who speak a second language have an increased density of gray matter in certain regions of the brain. But basically the only studies that have done this have only done it on natural languages. I am curious to see if people who speak constructed languages also experience the same changes to gray matter density. I think that someone who speaks a, not, a really complex built out language, maybe something like Esperanto that has a lot of resources out there that's pretty relatively easy to learn, they might experience the same changes to gray matter density as other kinds of bilinguals. You can measure this by chucking someone in an MRI machine and saying, I think you speak Esperanto. Um, and there's probably no reason for there to be a difference between someone who speaks a natural language and a conlang. And hopefully I haven't gone over time because um, that's what I had. Oh. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, yeah, I'm really resonating with your, your research hypothesis. Uh, this is selfish of me to bring up, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, I published a paper a few years ago on Klingon second language learners and posited that the, the stress system of Klingon, although quite rigid and very rule-based, is very unnatural from a human language perspective. But uh, the speakers were performing at, uh, I'm trying to remember, it was something like 83.9% accuracy with the prescribed rules indicating that they they actually did acquire the stress significantly greater than chance. Um, of course, I suggested there were still some natural language things that were going on there, but it would be very curious to see what the limit of how much naturalness from from a universal grammar perspective you would need before it became truly unlearnable. I don't know if yeah, you have any thoughts. No, that's completely true. Um, what I wanted to do was I wanted to compare like a fully fleshed out, like if I found like a super naturalistic conlang and compare that to something super artistic and abstract like Toki Pointer. I you wouldn't expect Toki Pona to have this because it, it to have the same changes. I'm but I I have no idea. Um so yeah, basically comparing like is something like something super simple going to like at what point on the spectrum between like a language that has so little and some and a language that is um or has that is closer to a natural language in what ways that might have an effect on gray matter density in the brain but yeah i guess uh, from from the klingon perspective i i certainly think that it was acquired it was acquired as a language uh, just because it was the experiment was just on recorded speech that was never meant to be experimented on um, so they were productively using Klingon and in their spontaneous production had the stress system. But at what point is it a difference between acquisition versus rote memory, which is presumably a different process? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm seeing questions come in on an administrative level, but not about the the talk yet um can i ask so your your area is really on the gray matter density yes. would you consider things like performance or are you specifically looking at the physiological uh, um yes so there is a change in gray matter density depending on how long you've spoken that language for so uh the the study I'm citing, which is basically the only study that has kind of done this kind of research already, um, a, a, an Italian English bilingual who's spoken Italian fluently for two years will have a different gray matter 
density to an Italian English bilingual who's spoken fluently for five years. And it increases the more, the, the older you get to a certain point until it degrades. How would that, um, so I'm just kind of conceptualizing with you, your, your study, does that density change if, let's say, for example, me as a almost 40 year old decided to start learning Tokipona, um, you'd be competing with my 40 years of, of native English and my 12 years of second language Irish and X years of Klingon and Blackfoot and everything else. How, how would you measure what the Conlang was doing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there is an ideal participant for this kind of study. You kind of need to be a um, <laughs> like a, a 25 year old who who doesn't um, who hasn't like who hasn't really studied languages before who wasn't raised bilingual. It is a very like rigid study. Um, it's 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 not feasible, but I won't tell you guys that. That's okay. Um, yeah um no because after after about 45 it becomes there are other factors that kind of um make it kind of impossible to measure it accurately because there's so many other things at play yeah um some of the youtube comments right now are, are talking about the child who was raised bilingually in english and klingon and rejected klingon language uh they say after three years i thought it had it was after five or so years but mm -hmm. irrespective um that was a bilingual speaker would that yeah circumstance um, work? there are different factors because um bilinguals um because bilinguals experience the bilingual advantage, they have, um, it's not increased cognition, but it's an uh, improved cognitive load. So they're better at multitasking and other factors. So what was the question? <laughs> uh, if somebody raised bilingually kind of from birth in a natural language and a conlang, um, would oh, that um... help your study? In a natural language and a conlang, um, you would have to find a conlang that the child wouldn't reject. But if let's imagine a fantasy world where this conlang, this child loves speaking a language that none of their friends will. Um, I guess so. <laughs> there's there's no reason why. I, I guess with other natural languages, um, like bilingualism is really really good for child development and brain stuff so yeah true true um yeah there's lots of comments in the youtube that i i definitely encourage you to look at but i'm not seeing specific questions once again um so what you were saying is we need to pay 20 somethings to learn x language to study this yeah yeah we just basically need a group of 50 25 year olds who are really keen to learn Esperanto or something to chuck them in an MRI machine and then um, basically never use it again. That'd be really oh. cool. <laughs> I So I have to plug tomorrow. Um, we are having a talk, if somebody can remind me of the title of the talk, where we are looking at at least part of an MIT study where they looked at fMRI feedback from Conlang speakers. Um it's the panel, a not V, a Dothraki, and a Klingon walking to a Trenkyo, which I'm probably <laughs> mispronouncing. Um, but they are going to have some of those results from the the MIT fMRI study, which should be very That'll cool. be amazing to check out. Uh, how does bilinguals and people fully fluent in their L2 differ? I guess that's a, a neurological question. Oh. How do people? How do bilinguals and people who are fully fluent in their L two? Uh, so I'm I'm going to interpret that as native bilinguals raised bilingually versus people oh. who acquire language later. That um, are fluent. I, it depends on a couple of factors. So if you if you learnt your language at an advanced age, um, it, it 
it can never hurt to learn a language. Um, interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, there are different factors, but um, I think that's the best answer I can give. There are different factors. <laughs> It's always good to learn a second language. Um, children learning languages is good. Yep. There is at least some evidence that learning a second language at absolutely any point in your life can help stave off dementia and things like that. So 100%. absolutely. Um, I'm not seeing other questions. If there are anybody in the, the Zoom who wants to ask a question, please feel free to unmute and ask away. Esperanto does have native speakers. Um, that's interesting. There are about 2 million Esperanto speakers. Um, I think the main advantages of Esperanto would be the amount of content um, because I, there are changes to gray matter density in response to media as well. So if you're, if you can find media that you enjoy in a language, it, it's going to help improve basically every aspect of you learning that language well. Sai has a question there, NeuroWise, typing it in the chat. Uh, actually, I'll talk. Oh, Hi. Perfect. Um, Hi. My background is uh, cognitive neuroscience. Uh, oh, so, no. Yes. Uh, uh, hopefully it's not a bad thing. Um, no, you're about to rip me to shreds. It's a good go. No, no, no. Uh, so one thing that is an interesting uh, phenomenon is that people with Rokos and Vertices aphasia uh, who are born deaf uh, will have impaired uh, spatial grammar, or not, uh, will have impaired linguistic grammar in uh, American Sign Language, for instance. Uh, but will have intact spatial use. Um, so like if, if you're assigning, um, there were five people around the table, here is where they were, that would be preserved under a broca Wernicke aphasia uh, for a native sign language speaker. I wonder if you can think of any uh, other kinds of curious uh, twists on the usual broca Wernicke aphasias uh, where for some someone fluent in a given conlang uh, or an unusual style of conlang would have an unusual preservation or unusual uh, deficit? Um, yeah, I think it would be more difficult to uh, experience aphasia. You can correct me if I'm wrong because I'm talking at my ass. Um, it, it would be more difficult to experience aphasia in a language that isn't natural, that isn't, hmm. Yeah, that, that isn't a natural language. Um, I, I know that with, um, Wernicke's aphasia, um, deaf, deaf people can absolutely experience the same kind of symptoms. So Wernicke's aphasia, um, deaf people will still sign, but it loses the coherency. Um, I think that someone, if you had like a, I wonder if it would be possible for a person to lose their, um, their first language, but retain a constructed language, language through aphasia, but I have no idea. I have no idea either, but that is a really cool question. Um, Jeffrey had a question from YouTube. Why not create a conlang specifically to test the hypothesis rather than picking one that exists? Um, it's it's difficult. So it would be possible to, so you could do hyper jargonization. So let's imagine we have a kitchen full of chefs and we teach them a language specifically for chefing so that they become uber efficient in cooking. I've forgotten the question again. That's okay, we'll move on. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? It's in the chat window. Um, <clears throat> oh, why not okay. make a conlang specific to the task rather than testing one that exists? Yeah, why not? Okay, yeah, I guess that's yeah, the answer. Yeah, sure. 
Um, I don't see any other questions, so I want to thank you so much for, uh, you know, waking up nice and early, uh, I guess, tomorrow morning for a lot of us and joining yes. us. Joining you from the future. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Please awesome. uh, pop thank over you. to the YouTube in case there's more questions or uh, engage in the chat over there. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, and um, Ben Norton, we were having lots of uh, too many Bens, so there was uh, anti-Ben dissimulation and um, Ben appentheses going on, which is why Jamin got rid of his. Uh, feel free to share your screen and uh, put your slides on, on full screen. Excellent, and uh, your mic is working, Ben. I know you're muted right now. Yes, good morning from Japan. <clears throat> from Japan. All right. So we have a, another uh, future visitor from the far east. The future uh, looks bright. So. <laughs> in the land of the rising sun. Indubitably. Um, so our final talk for today's half of the conference, um, or tomorrow's today, half of the conference for, th for the Bens among us, uh, is an introduction to the Nurama language, if I am presenting that correctly. Yes. And uh, Ben, I will pass it over to you to, to go ahead. All right. Um, excuse my groggy voice. It's 6 a.m. here in Japan, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm so excited to get to talk to you all today. Um, and so I'll do my best to contain my excitement. Ramade Narema uh, I will briefly talk about uh, my language, Narema. Jarlene Herjama Ben de Havokel Narema Hello, my name is Ben, and I created the Narema language. All of the information I introduced today is also included in my videos on my YouTube channel, so feel free to check that out. Some background, personal background. Um, I'm a very novice uh, conlanger. Um, I'm a humble language enthusiast, so many of the terms I use will probably not be uh, those shared among the um, community of people making languages uh, <laughs> at university level. I don't have a formal background, uh, but I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to speak to you today. So Narama is a spoken and written language I created for a graphic novel I'm working on. These are the characters in the graphic novel. The main character's name, Sahashi, and another character named Naluna. In this graphic novel, um, there is an island inhabited by the native Omadi. You can see their language on the bottom. And also uh, visitors called the Narama. Narama means new land in their language. So a lot of the content I create is comparing these two conlangs that I've created. I have a shirt in kind of proto Omadi, and then I have a hat in, uh, in Narama. So I'm a little decked out today. So some more background. When I use the same alphabet I made for Narama to write English, the alphabet is called Nordish. For example, in Nordish, hello is written as hello and pronounced as hello. Uh, but if I use the same alphabet to write my language in Narama, it becomes Jarlim, which means hello. Um, when I first created the script, I used it to write English. And then a few years back, I decided to make a language using a spoken language using this alphabet. So I kind of reverse engineered it. And I'll talk a little bit about my uh, thought process with that. Of course, using the same alphabet to write various languages is similar to how the Latin or Roman alphabet is used to write various languages. For example, English and French. I get a lot of comments about my uh, language Nurema that it looks very similar to Arabic. And I don't necessarily disagree. Uh, there are some similarities, but there's plenty of differences as well. Um, Narama is written left to right. Arabic is traditionally written right to left. Also, Arabic has a lot of circles, simply put. My language doesn't have these circles, uh, but there are some similarities. Um, over the years, uh, some people have uh, gotten tattoos in my language and friends of mine. Um, and so I try to make some Narama art and Nordish art as well. I think fellow conlangers uh, have all imagined seeing the world in their conlangs. 
So I've also created some content to imagine what it might look like in the digital world as well. Uh, just for comparison, this is handwritten Narama and cursive Narama. So a full list of consonants. Again, I'll briefly go through this since all of this information is available in other facets and websites online. But you'll see a pattern where there's beginning consonants, medial consonants, and final consonants. So the full list of vowels are these. I tried my best to write it in IPA as well. And so I'd like to start uh, describing the Narama language by talking about vowels. So Narama has five basic vowels. They are a, e, u, a, o. I'm sure a lot more advanced conlangers are rolling their eyes because the five vowel system is uh, commonly used. It's used in my second language, Japanese. So there's a bit of borrowing there. But you can see in the construction of the vowels, um, there's a similarity where there's a hook and a base, and the stem is what's dictating the vowel sound. So a, e, u, a, o. So as I alluded to earlier, there's a hook, there's a base, and a stem. And so to have some uniformity, the hook and the base are the same for the vowels, but the stem is what's dictating the vowel sound. So these are called single vowels. This is no means a linguistics term. It's just the term I used for it. But in the Narama language, you also have flowing vowels. Flowing vowels are used for words with more than one syllable. It's simply for aesthetic reasons. The pronunciation does not change. So you have a, e, u, a, and o. And lastly, you have final vowels. Final vowels are used for words that end in a vowel. A, e, u, a, o. So next we'll move on to some vocabulary, pronouns. So this verb to be is very important in the Narama language and technically pronouns are verbs. So if I put a consonant in front of a uh, verb that conjugates it, so if I put the H sound in front of a, it becomes ha and that means me or I am. If I put a T in front of it, it becomes U or you are. If I put a Z or Z in front of it, it becomes he or she is. It's gender, gender neutral. So next I'd like to talk about the diacritics, group one diacritics. So if I put a diacritic on this vowel on the bottom, A becomes R. So this line at the bottom is giving it the R sound, as in the English word star. E becomes ear, as in the word ear. U becomes er, as in the word sure. A becomes air, as in the word air. And O becomes or, as in the word or or door. Next, possessives. So ha is I am. If I put that dot on the bottom, the pronunciation becomes har. And the meaning is mine. So naturally, ta becomes tar, and that means yours. Za, meaning he or she, becomes zar, which would mean his or hers. There's another group of diacritics with a dash on the top. So a becomes a, as in the word map. E becomes i, as in the word dish. U becomes a, as in the word cup, I guess a schwa, if you will. Two dots on the bottom uh, give the vowel kind of a slight E sound. So U becomes U, as in the word should, could, would. A becomes A, as in the word day. O becomes OI, as in the word toy. And then we have this other diacritic. Um, it's somewhat of a diphthong. So I, and then our, or I'm sorry, ow, as in the word now. 
And then you can add a dash at the bottom with this diacritic. And even though it's technically not one syllable, uh, it's fire, ire as in fire, or hour as in the word hour. So verbs. Um, when I was reverse engineering this uh, language, and as you can see by the diacritic marks, I was using this alphabet to write English, um, I decided uh, to make different categories based on these diacritics. So if a word starts with one of these five verbs without any, or one of these five vowels without any diacritics, then it's a verb. So the plain form of all verbs start with a basic vowel. And each basic vowel is associated with a certain body part. So a ah is mouth, e is eyes, u is ears, a is nose, and o are hands. So then the, uh, when I create verbs based on these parameters, um, I can kind of correlate them to which body part is predominantly being used. So to speak, to taste start with ah, because it's associated with the mouth. To see um, is naturally associated with eyes, but also to move because we move our eyes a lot throughout our lives. <laughs> uh, ears are to hear and also to think because you can somewhat hear your thoughts. Um, nose is naturally to smell. And then to meet, uh, the characters in my book have a heightened sense of smell. Um, so when they meet someone, uh, they uh, recognize their, uh, I guess, personalized scent. So that's associated with meeting. And then hands are to touch and also to feel as an emotion. So as an example for verb conjugation, I'll use ella, which means to meet. So verbs are conjugated using a consonant or affix. So as I demonstrated earlier, if I put an H in front of the verb, it becomes uh, associated with myself. So I meet, Tella, you meet, Zella, he or she meets. And then Nella, if I put an N in front of it, it negates it. So this is a negative tense. Vela makes it past tense. Mela uh, makes it present progressive tense. Lela is future tense. And here's a complete list of affixes for conjugating verbs. Um, because of the limited time, I didn't go into too much detail. But um, as you can see, uh, with beginning consonants, medial consonants, and final consonants, um, final consonants also have a stem, just like vowels. And so those stems match to the preceding vowel. So this is kind of a order of operations in, in a mathematical sense uh, for verb conjugation. So you would start with the, the prefix, uh, for example, starting with myself, the pronoun, and then going level by level, going down uh, based on how you're conjugating or how many conjugations you have. So let's look at an example. So since all pronouns in Narama are technically verbs, Pronouns can also be conjugated using suffixes. So again, a, pa becomes I am. So if I wanted to make this past tense, I was, it becomes have. And as you can see, I'm using the final consonant version. If I want to say I am not, it becomes han. And if I want to say I was not, Based on this order of operations, we have uh, H first, V next, and then N. So have na. Um, in my language, there's varying degrees of politeness. This is the chart that's used for the most polite version. But uh, in the book that I'm working on, the youth kind of uh, changed this up a bit, just like you might have verlon in French, uh, where you switch consonants around or just switch syllables around. Um, or how in the English language you might have phenomenon such as ask becoming ax. Um, I believe this is called uh, metithesis, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I have this in my language as well, where the youth might switch this up. So instead of saying have not to say I was not, they might say han va. Much to the dismay of the older generation in the book. <laughs> hmm. So as you can see here, I'm highlighting where this verb conjugation is happening. So going back to the verb ella, meaning to meet, if I have more of a complex sentence here, have means I did not meet you. The word o means to have, again, it's associated with the hands possession. 
Ho means I have. Hov means I had. Hov nela tave means I have not met you before. So adjectives. In this next category, you will see that all of the adjectives have a little dash underneath. Um, uh, I'll talk about this more in detail. <laughs> Each adjective has one of these letters in its initial syllable. So the word for good in Narama is jar. As I said earlier in the presentation, jar alim means good day and equates to hello. You can also have a dash not under the vowel, but in between a consonant and a vowel. For example, the word kri means fun. So in its initial syllable, it should have one of these dashes underneath that indicate it's an adjective. The next category and last category are nouns, naturally. So the other diacritics are allocated to nouns. What's nice about this system and kind of the reverse engineering of it is if you're learning this language and you don't know a word, you can tell if the word is a verb, adjective, or noun simply based on the diacritic marks it has or doesn't have. Each noun has one of these letters in its initial syllable. For example, alim, jar alim, meaning good day. Alim means day, which is a noun. So you can also capitalize vowels. Um, this is lowercase alim. If I put this little X looking letter, that capitalizes the vowels, which you would use at the beginning of sentences or in a formal sentence, uh, setting. So Narama grammar is a generally subject verb object like English. For example, haji nim, I eat fish. Ha, aji, nim. Simple enough. So um, I use uh, some apps to make this uh, typable on my computer. Um, again, I'm a novice con langer, so uh, I don't have the most advanced technology, but I use iFont Maker on my iPad. And then I use Art Text versions three and four to kind of um, edit the text uh, and uh, even though I haven't created many fonts in it, I can kind of edit the fonts in, into various ways. Um, I'm working on uh, creating a complete dictionary. Of course, I have my own dictionary, but it's a little raw. And so I'm trying to make a presentable dictionary. So that's the most recent project that I'm working on, kind of a pocket dictionary for Narama. So this concludes uh, my presentation. I know I have about five minutes left for questions. So Tor Kakan, do you have any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben. You're getting a lot of love in the YouTube comments. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, for including like the five vowel system, which you clearly have more than a five vowel system, just I guess five yeah. vocalic roots or something like that. And yeah. um, it is the job of every generation to change the language just enough to annoy the generation before it. <laughs> uh, to which uh, someone in here said, uh, Matt Pearson said, uh, basically in Narama, metathesis encodes, okay, boomer. <laughs> I love it. That's it's brilliant. Uh, I haven't seen any specific questions, just a lot of love for your, your okay. fonts that you created, uh, a lot of love for, you know, basically everything you're doing, including the pronouns as verbs. So I'm going to latch onto that. And what was the inspiration? I, I love it too. Just like, you know, it's. Art is a unique thing. I, I view my conlanging as art. I think everybody views their own conlanging in a different way. Maybe they're trying to optimize language. Um, you know, we, we all have different reasons for conlanging. I, I, I personally view it as art. Um, and so, you know, the, the inspiration, it's hard to say where it comes from. Um, the, I guess the, the biggest, um, um, I'm sorry, it's 6 a.m., so I'm still thinking. <laughs> I guess the biggest um, success I had in, in the beginning was the, the STEM system. Um, and from that little epiphany, these smaller epiphanies just kept coming. But this is 20 years in the making. Uh, I started working on this alphabet in middle school, just doodling in class. And uh, over time, I saw some patterns with my doodles, and uh, I just kept drawing until um, you know, I was able to come up with the alphabet that I have and then reverse engineer it. So I wish I had a concrete answer. Um,
but using different modes was definitely an inspiration from, you know, of course, the the almighty J.R. Tolkien, where he uses different modes for Tenguar, where it's Quenya, Sindarin, Maigovan, and Melonin to those out there. Um, and Kapla, Nuchnak to you as well. Um, <laughs> so, Konosatatu, uh, if you will. Um, so, yeah, just various. And, and you know, uh, with Japanese being my second language and Japanese being pretty unique, as many languages are, um, I'm sure I've drawn some inspiration from the complexities of Japanese. That's awesome. And I, I think you asked answered the other question of what were your inspirations for the orthography? Obviously, you were doodling mm -hmm. and it just reverse engineered out of that. Yeah. So it's a more um, artistic uh, approach. Mm -hmm. That's that's brilliant. Um, I'm not seeing other questions yet. If anyone on the, the Zoom wants to ask a question, unmute. You're welcome to. I guess I can open up my chat here. <laughs> uh, kind of jumping ahead. Sorry about that, people. <laughs> um, if anyone's interested in Omadi as well, I have lots of videos about that. Um, it's kind of fun to compare some people like Omadi a little bit more than Narama. Um, Omadi oh is uh, pretty much Japanese grammar <laughs> repurposed um, based on some Polynesian languages. And, um, and that is the five vowel system, uh, purely no diacritics. So... <laughs> I, I think Jamin said in the, the YouTube chat when you first started that yeah. um, Jamin loves the Omadi script as well. Yes, we, he we has commented. Yeah, and, and I appreciate the love there because um, since Narama is more developed, uh, <laughs> unfairly, I kind of put Omadi as a secondary language because it's less developed. Um, but I'm, I'm still working on that as well. So I'm glad that people like that orthography as well. Yeah. Uh, so I definitely encourage you to hop over to the YouTube. You're going to get a confidence boost uh, looking oh, at all the love you. you're getting over there. And uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us so early in the future yeah. and presenting. It's an absolute honor. Ariga, thank you gozai much for those who like Japanese puns. Have a good rest <laughs> of the evening, everybody. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, that wraps up our, our first day of LCC 10. Uh, I do need to thank Mirabai, who has been incredible capturing all of our jargon and very fast speech rates and uh, keeping pace with everything that's been going on in the conference today. Um, Mirabai, I know you said when you first agreed to caption for us that you you are a nerd like us. I, I don't know if you're a conlanger like like some of us, but uh, you've, you've definitely captured everything incredibly well. Um, and of course, already had Broca and Wernicke in her dictionary, as Sai is saying. I want to thank again all of the presenters, um, no matter how early or or late they were and their local time zones. It's uh, definitely a challenge when we're doing one of these remote conferences. I absolutely hope that we are back to an in-person conference in, I guess, 2025 will probably be the next one. Um, I will do everything I can to be there in person, but if we've learned anything over the course of the pandemic, that is that we need to still offer some hybrid uh, options. Um, we've been working on what that might look like in the background at the at board level and uh, saying, well, we'll obviously prefer in-person presentations if it's an in-person conference, but we'll still have an online option because we know travel is difficult. Feeling safe is not something everyone does with respect to traveling yet or again or period perhaps. Um, so we will continue to do that in the future. Uh, I have seen a lot of comments in the YouTube that our captioning has been super helpful. So I'm really glad we have gone this route and increased our accessibility. Um, we'll probably have more conversations with Mirabai as to how things worked um, 
on her end as as well as our end and absolutely welcome feedback from the viewers and the presenters as to how that worked and if if it did increase understandability and connectivity uh, I think that's everything I have for today. I know that Grayson has already started the after party in the Conlang Chatter Day. Uh, I see that the link has been posted in a couple of places, including on the uh, presentation document. So if anybody wants to hop over there, apparently that's where all the cool kids already are. I'm not sure. Um, I have to hang out here for a little bit, probably with Sai. We have to let our um recordings compile before i think before we can join another zoom but yes i see in the youtube chat start planning for lcc 11. we we want the uh we want the proposals to be the local host of lcc 11 already so that's going to be the end uh sai you are welcome to stop the uh live stream whenever you have the chance to do that. And I'm going to stop the recording. We will see everyone tomorrow at the uh, same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you everyone for being with us and we'll see you tomorrow.